My mind has a pretty good hold right now. <laughs> okay, good. That's good to hear. We need the mind. Welcome to everyone to this class, this meeting. We're going to begin with devotions. I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of <coughs> you are justified by law, ye are fallen from grace. 
For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. For in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you, through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would, they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. We read the holy and divine scripture that far. Let's open with prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, we come to thee as the churches come together in this denomination that thou hast formed. Of the reformation that thou hast worked in our hearts, and therefore in the churches. And we thank thee, Lord, that thou hast formed this denomination, and too that we can come together at this classes. And we beseech thy grace, for we are unworthy of the least of thy blessings. Who are our children, and who is us? should be looked upon thee. Lord, give us thy grace, that in the power of that grace we may decide and deliberate today upon many weighty matters. We have many things now that trouble the churches. We know, Lord, that this division is of thee. And we submit unto it. We confess even that division must come. <clears throat> and we pray that by means of the deliberations and the decisions that peace may be restored to the churches. We pray, Lord, for the pardon of our many sins. We pray for the guidance of thy Spirit, that living in the Spirit we may walk in the Spirit. And also here at 
this class is that thy word, as it is revealed in the sacred scripture, and as it is interpreted in the reformed creeds, may be the binding rule here at this assembly, and that we may make all our decisions in harmony with those creeds and with the church order, which is the constitution of Jesus Christ for the churches. We ask, Lord, that thou Therefore, look upon us, guide and direct us, grant us thy Holy Spirit. We pray for these many things, not because we are worthy, but for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, we have the credentials that have been submitted. So we will read the credentials and go through uh, roll call. Do we have the credentials yet from... We have all of them. One more. Okay. This is Edmonton. Oh, I'm sorry, Zion. Came through the minister, the angel of Edmonton. <laughs> All right, just read the credentials to the classes of the Reformed Protestant Churches to convene September 15, 2022 at 2nd Reformed Protestant Church in Dyer, Indiana. The consistory of this is Cornerstone Reformed Protestant Church in Southwest Ontario has appointed the brother Jem Seertsma, Al Kickert, and Craig Ferguson as delegates to said represent said church at the meeting of the classes above referred to. The alternate delegate is Preston Critch. We hereby instruct and authorize them to take part in all deliberations and transactions of classes regarding all matters legally coming before the meeting and transacted in agreement with the word of God according to the conception of it embodied in the doctrinal standards Reformed Protestant churches, as well as in harmony with our church order, and signed by the president and the clerk. So do roll call Jim Seertsma? Yes. Al Kicker? Yes. Craig Ferguson? Here. Then from Zion Reformed Protestant Church in Redlands, California. Elder Nick Milker. Here. Elder Todd Ferguson. Here. Deacon Clint Milker. Here. Then from Second, the Reformed Protestant Church, Reverend Nathan Langerak. Here. Elder Andy Burkett. Here. Deacon Lee Wilcher. Here. Then from First, Protestant Reformed Church of Edmonton. Reverend Martin Vanderwall. Here. Elder Henry Ferguson. Henry is not here. Uh, he wasn't able to make it, so uh, we were going with an alternate. All right, so that'd be Fred Tolsma. Here. Then also Elder Ben Tolsma. Here. Then from First Reformed Protestant in Jenison, Michigan. Reverend Andy Lanning. Here. Elder Brian Van Baron. Here. Elder Dewey Inglesma. Here. Then from the Berean Reformed Protestant Church in Singapore, uh, Tian Long. Here. Aaron Lim. Here. And Felix Chan. Here. Then from Sovereign Reformed Protestant Church in Northwest Iowa, the brother and Jeff Andringa, Daryl DeVries, Here. and Dylan Altena. And then we have a second set of credentials from Sovereign Reformed Protestant Church. Uh, I can read that. The consistory of Sovereign, Sovereign Reformed Protestant Church of Iowa has appointed the brother Dylan Altena as a delegate to represent said church at the meeting of the classes above referred to. 
We hereby instruct and authorize him to take part in all the deliberations and transactions of classes regarding all matters legally coming before the meeting and transacted in agreement with the word of God according to the conception of it embodied in the doctrinal standards of the Reformed Protestant churches as well as in harmony with our church order. Regarding instructions on the credentials, I bring these credentials by myself because I stand alone in this decision. The consistory is divided on the matter of church order article 21 and is divided on the question of church order article 41. I seek the classes to examine Elder Jeff Andringa and Elder Daryl DeVries according to the formula of subscription with the following grounds. One, the consistory was not able to come together on the question of Article 41 of the church order because of a disagreement on Article 21 of the church order, see Supplement 1. Elder Daryl DeVries openly disagreed with Reverend Lanning's sermon on Lord's Day 38 when he told Reverend Lanning this during his handshake with Reverend Lanning after the sermon, sermon by order of the consistory, uh, Deacon Dylan Holtena. And then, is it the pleasure of the classes that I read Supplement 1? All right. Supplement 1, uh, Deacon Dylan Holtena. The consistory was not able to come together on the question of Article 41 of the Church Order because of a disagreement on Article 21 of the Church Order. My answer to Question 3 of Article 41 are the poor in the Christian schools cared for is no. There is a disagreement over Article 21 of the Church Order. Because of this disagreement, the consistory has started to lord it over the congregation and demanding that a letter asking another consistory for a lecture about the need for a school is not done in good order. Two, my answer to question four of Article 41 do you need the judgment and help of the classes for the proper government of your church is yes. The consistory has not been able to come to an agreement on the questions of Article 41. When I talked to Elder Jeff Andringa about the question, there was an argument that resulted in him telling me to do whatever I want. When I went to have a meeting with Elder Daryl DeVries, I was met with hostility about me apologizing to a church member for a meeting regarding the letter that was sent to Second Reformed Protestant Church asking for a lecture on the need for a Christian school that I took part in. I was told, quote, you better be very careful about what you say because everything you say has consequences, end quote. I told him that this is not a good place for me to be right now and left. Finally, Elder Jeff Andriga has not backed down from his position that this letter was not done in good order. Deacon Dylan Holton. So we have an issue with credentials. Uh, what is the pleasure of the classes? We cannot constitute until the matter of the credentials is settled. What is the question? Is the question which delegates to seat, or is this just a matter of? Um, can you help me understand this matter of credentials more clearly? Sure. So there's two sets: one with three delegates, and there's another set with one delegate. The one delegate is asking for a formula of subscription examination by the classes, and so. I don't, I don't know how the classes can decide on that without being constituted, but the implication of the request is that two of the delegates could not be seated. If there is a question regarding the formula of subscription, then they could not be seated as delegates. I believe that's the nature of the, the problem that we have. Daryl? So the second set of credentials that was brought by Deacon Altina 
if it was never shown to his consistory, that doesn't matter at all. Because in my mind, then, how does that work? He's not, he's coming by himself as his own consistory. All right, that's part of the discussion we're going to have, and we're not even constituted yet. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about the legality of the question, because the last paragraph of the formula subscription reads as follows. Further, if at any time the consistory, classes, or senate, upon sufficient grounds of suspicion and to preserve the uniformity and purity of doctrine, may deem it proper to require of us a further explanation of our sentiments respecting any particular article, and so on. The question doesn't belong to an individual. A consistory uh, can require, classes can require, or a synod can require. Um, we have a statement from an individual member of a consistory, but not of a consistory. I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Any further comments, Reverend Lanning? Regarding that last and legality, isn't the request that classes make the judgment so that classes would have to enter into that decision? Examine yes or no. Uh, Daryl? Is not classes a body that's supposed to give advice and not to make judgments or that judgments have to come from a consistory? I don't understand your whole thinking. Any other comments? Reverend Vanderwall? Uh, procedurally, to treat this matter, classes can be constituted with the exception of uh, what is in dispute, namely the Congregation of so or the Consistory of Sovereigns credentials. And classes can decide the matter um, to, with regard to the credentials of that particular congregation so that the rest are seen and accepted as included. Classes are probably properly constituted with a record of the um, the non participation of delegation in question. Then the matter can be um, discussed and decided upon with regard to those particular credentials. So the the suggestion is that we constitute, with the exception of sovereign, we don't see any of their delegates, and then as a classes decide the matter of their credentials. Correct. Any discussion on that? In that direction we want to head? Reverend Lanning. I'll make a motion in that direction, and we can vote and see if that's the direction we want to go. I make a motion that we receive and approve the credentials of the churches with the exception of Sovereign RPC. Supported. All right, the motion on the floor is to receive and approve all the credentials, save sovereigns. All right, if there's no further debate, I'm going to call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Oops, sorry, I got to remember that. Opposed, same sign. The motion carries. The meeting of classes is declared constituted with the exception of sovereign. Um, I take the chair by rotation. So I believe that the next matter of business is the signing of the formula of subscription by the new uh, delegates who have never attended before. How many? have to assign the formula of subscription. All right, and there's an electronic version, I believe, that was sent out. Uh, do the delegates that are streaming in have that? All right, so at this time, then, we'll have the signing of the formula of subscription. Just pass this around to those that have to sign it, please.
that's being done. Just one point of note with regard to the credentials. First Reformed Protestant Church has an item of instructions on their credentials. The Consistory of First Reformed Protestant Church requests classes advice for the Consistory to proceed to the second announcement of discipline in the case of a member. And we would be treating that uh, after the questions of Article 41. next thing we have to do is elect a clerk for this meeting. Is there any motions? We can also move to reappoint. Make that motion. All right. Is that supported? Supported. The motion is to move to reappoint Deacon Lee Wilcher as the clerk. Call for the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Daryl? I am now seated here yet. Then do you want me to leave? No, because we have to decide the question of whether you're going to be seated. But I'm not seated. No, so stay there until we decide that you so are. Stay right? seated. Yes. Okay. You just can't take you can't take part in the deliberations and you can't vote. That's all that means right now. I'm wondering if, for the sake of the members streaming in, if we should do our votes via hand, because we're not going to be able to necessarily hear each member, and if they do have a dissenting vote, then that should be recognized, so. All right, I can, I can agree to that. We, I'm going to do the voice vote here, but I would like them to vote by hand. Is that okay with the people streaming in? That makes it quick. All right, good. So I believe <coughs> the next thing that we do need to treat, even before approval of the last, the minutes of the last meeting, is the matter of sovereign credentials. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could I suggest that we grant advisory vote to anyone who needs that? And I, I would like to suggest that we grant advisory vote to sovereign's delegates too, so that they can participate in the deliberation. I think there's, since these are these are the men who are involved, we ought to hear, hear something from them. All right, so the motion would be to grant advisory vote to Sovereign's delegates and to Jared Ramirez. Is he the only one? James Jansman. Oh, James Jansman's here too. Uh, anybody else? All right, that would be the motion. Is that so moved? So moved. Supported. Right, the motion is to grant advisory vote to Sovereign's delegates and to Jared Rigmiris and to James Jansma. Call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, let's treat the matter of Sovereign's credentials. What's your pleasure, man? Just to reiterate what the issue is, we have two sets of credentials. On one set is three delegates, on another set is one delegate asking for a formula of subscription examination of the two elders. There's a supplement. One way that I suppose we can handle this is to have an open debate here. Another way would be to put it in the hands of a committee and break until that committee comes back with a recommendation. I think those are the two ways forward. Reverend Vanderwall. Is the set of credentials with the one consistory member on it 
properly before this body as credentials. All right, so I take it we're going to have an open debate then. Well, beside the, the material question of the reason why, um, has it been done in a consistory meeting? Is it by the consistory? Because it's consistories alone that send delegates. Delegates can't um, send themselves. What it complicates matters is that the one delegate's name is on both sets of credentials. So it would seem to me that it's more proper for this action to be represented as a protest to the consistory, which is the autonomous body here. And if that protest isn't resolved satisfactorily to the Protestant, then it should come to classes by way of a, an appeal. Um, the question here is, should classes take up a matter that has not yet been treated in a consistory? Though it does regard the matter of classical credentials, that does not necessarily mean that it needs to be treated by classes here. Anybody else? Alder Burkett? Is there in the instructions of classes when the credentials are received? It seems to me, and I could be wrong, but we, after the, the credentials are received, it seems that we would ask the delegates if there are matters that need to be adjudicated by the classes. Does that have to be included in their credentials, or is that a verbal? question also. It's a verbal question. Okay. So the questions of the questions of Article <clears throat> 41 are verbal. Uh, it seems to me if you answered yes to the help of gut the, the help of classes question, that you would have some sort of documents to accompany it to show what you need the help of classes with. Other degrees? I would just say in regards to what was brought against me now through the credentials, I was never contacted about personally and no one has ever come to me as a brother and said, this is the problem I have with you. Then no one has come with the brother to say, this is what I have a problem with you. Then no consistory has come to me to say, this is what I have a problem with you. I just think it's completely out of order to have an accusation like that brought up in a credentials at a classes meeting. And when I talk to the brother, which is written in the credentials on Tuesday night, I told him I am not threatening you and I'm not lording over you. You may speak. I'm not doing this to not have you speak. You may speak, but be careful on what you say because it will have consequences. Just, just a note. So when we're, when we're dealing with the formula of subscription, it's my understanding that Matthew 18 goes out the window. It regards the public office of the elder, deacon, or minister. And um, I'll just give an example. A man can say something in the meeting of the consistory before church, and the consistory can take a decision right then and there to suspend him. That, that's it, the formula of subscription is it has in it the language by that very fact. So bear that in mind in your deliberations by the very fact of someone's actions. They can be suspended. And that, I think, bears in this discussion. Daryl? You are reiterating my point. It's in a consistory room. That was my whole point. When you say right. that, I give an example. None of this was done in a consistory room. 
Any further debate? Deliberation. Robert Lanning. When it comes to a formula subscription exam, the way that that comes about is that at any time the consistory, classes, or synod, upon sufficient grounds of suspicion and to preserve the uniformity and purity of doctrine, deems it proper to require a further explanation of our sentiments. And so the question that I have is how does that come to a classist where a classist might have sufficient grounds of suspicion and might see a need to preserve the uniformity of doctrine? A former speaker proposed that the way that would come is through protest to the consistory and then appeal if the brothers aggrieved by the decision. And I can see that way, but in the grounds of the brother who brings it, he says there's a disagreement about the third and fourth questions of Article 41. That the consistory cannot answer yes, or at least cannot answer with one voice yes, so that one delegate says no, and two delegates say yes. And because those are questions of the classes that are put to the consistory, if there is a disagreement on those questions, I can see that a classis would say, wait a minute, we have suspicion. We want to know why there's division among the delegates from your own consistory. So I'd like to hear some discussion about that with regard to the questions of Article 41, if that is a proper way for it to come to classes. Daryl? That's the opinion of the one person from the Sovereign Consistory. That member of Sovereign Consistory has not come back to his consistory and asked us about Article 41. We haven't had that discussion in the consistory room. I literally, the first time I heard of this was right now on the floor, Senate, when you read it. I did try to meet with Mr. DeVries before classes again, and Mr. DeVries would not sit down with me. And Elder Andinga did sit down with me, and I showed him what I was saying. Mr. Chair, I was approached 17 minutes before this classes began, and I did not think it was a good idea to have this discussion 17 minutes before classes began. So I came in here and I prayed about it and read my Bible. The, the question on the floor is can a delegate, can a delegate, a single delegate, bring something to the classes through Questions of Article 41. Yes, uh, Reverend Andrew Wall, I believe you're on the floor. Uh, two matters are involved here. I think, first of all, is just the bare fact that these questions have not yet been asked and answered. We've been informed of uh, in advance, in advance, that this question cannot be answered by one delegate. Uh, we don't know. The second question within that is, does, do the questions and answers of Article 41 imply that each individual delegate is polled as to the answer of that question, or do the delegates answer in behalf of uh, each consistory? So that requiring a uh, no answer would, would mean that the consistory has the issue. Um, I don't have a copy of um, Article 41 with its questions. Thank you. Um, so I think number four is probably the critical one. Do you need the judgment and help of the classes for the proper government of your church? Um, it would seem that that question indicates that 
the delegate answers the question not with respect to himself, but with respect to his consistory. And so an individual sentiment that might stand in, in distinction from uh, a consensus of the consistory or, in, or a majority vote of the consistory uh, should not stand at classes. The questions are preceded by this statement. Furthermore, the president shall, among other things, put the following questions to the delegates of each church. I suppose there's different ways you could read that. Does that mean the delegates as a whole so that they represent each church or each delegate? But it's not, it's not settled to me that that's only on behalf of the church. The delegates of each church have these questions put to them. So that if there were a delegate, let's say, who stood alone in his consistory, when these questions are asked of the consistory, he could give his answer as a delegate to classes. Normally, the consistory stands together on it, so there's no need for each delegate to give his own different answer or poll each delegate. But if there is a disagreement in the consistory, I think the wording of Article 41 allows an individual delegate to answer differently. Any further discussion? Question on even if the whole consistory would disagree and answer no, what would be the recourse to like a number two or a number three? What would be the recourse of the classes? Would it to be to say they aren't legally here? Or would it be to then enter in to whatever the answer of that question would be? Those questions allow the classes uh, quite a bit of freedom. And that's, that's because of the nature of the classes. The churches come together and their calling, the calling of the classes, is to ensure the uni uniformity and purity of the doctrine. And I can even see it where an individual consistory member could bring something, not even a delegate. Uh, we need the help. Our three delegates are going to say no, but we, we do need to help. It seems like we've been stripped of our autonomy because this matter has not been addressed. This is the first that I've heard that we have some contention with Article discussion has never taken place in our consistory. Dylan has never come to us and say with regards to Article 21 where do you stand? Dylan, Dylan brought I don't know where he's coming with that we can't answer yes to number three. We're doing what we can. And my answer to number four would be not yet. I said, you better do what you want. It's because I called him and I said, I want you to make, make you aware that there are some things that have come up regarding Daryl that we need to deal with as a consistory. I said, I ask you to keep that to yourself. Upon hanging up, he called Reverend Lanning. And Reverend Lanning suggested that he build this mouth. That's not the local. That's all I ask. Dylan? Uh, to start off, though, as I wrote in the, what I wrote there the first time that Jeff had heard about it was to uh, call a meeting to talk about it, and that's where it didn't go anywhere.
also tried to talk about the questions on that article 41 and he also said that yeah can't have any other possibility and I felt that I had to leave the situation I left and then as far as, as Reverend Lanning I uh, did contact him but I uh, did so in a not in a way of asking him what I should do but in a way of asking him what I can do with options, because legality-wise, it helps with the church order and how to go about it. Lee? I believe that we as classes have been given sufficient reason to have this classical examination of a couple of officers. There is reason for suspicion after what we've been told, and I would be in favor of seating them here as delegates because no judgment yet has been made. And of course they would be able to speak to the matter when we deliberate it further. But they wouldn't get a vote. And if need be that they be removed from their seat at some point in this meeting, we could do that. Are you making that a motion? I'll make it a motion. <clears throat> Is there support? Can you read the motion, please? That the classes seat the three delegates from Sovereign. And that the classes on, on good grounds of suspicion subject Elder Jeff Andringa and Elder Daryl DeVries to a formula subscription examination regarding Article 21 of the Church Order, Lord's Day 38. Yeah, I think, does that capture yeah. the idea of it? You can write that down. You made that a motion? Yeah. Is there support for that motion? Supported. All right, the motion is on the floor. Those are one motion. One motion. We can, <coughs> if you want, we can divide the question. <coughs> but I see a yes, Reverend. How does 1 Timothy 5, verse 19 apply against an elder received not an accusation but before two or three witnesses? As far as the motion on the floor now, I'll address what was said by a previous person of the classes. Um, I was never contacted about Article 41. And then what I don't understand right now is that there's even on a motion on the floor to have this examination when you're using the grounds, the credentials, what's written in the credentials of the one member of Sovereign PRC, and in that, it talks about a sermon that I shook Reverend Lanning's hand on and then said to him, I don't agree with what you said. Then after that sermon, I talked to Reverend Lanning and I said, I will be in touch. But this has not, this is not good order at all. There's no order here. You have to give me time to protest that sermon to my consistory. That, that being brought up in here right now is just complete disorder. There's no order here. Absolutely none. I would just want to reiterate again, we're dealing with a formula subscription and the seating of a delegate. And if the delegate doesn't hold to one of the creeds, he 
cannot be sad. And that's what we're dealing with. So it's not that there's not time to protest. It's that we all have to sit down and say, we, we can adjudicate everything at this meeting without ever once referring to Scripture. We can do it on the basis of the creeds, because we all agree that they teach Scripture. Can't do that on Article Lord's Day thirty-eight or Lord's Day seven. That's the that's the question we're facing, Reverend Lanning. Again, the formula of subscriptions requirement is this: if the classes, so this does not have to originate in a consistory, if the classes, upon sufficient grounds of suspicion, the formula of subscription does not require that there's ironclad proof even that a man has departed from the purity of doctrine. The classist suspects it. And how would a classist suspect it? There could be any number of ways. One way might be the report of an office bearer in that consistory. Another way might be a public disagreement with a sermon on a confession. If there's sufficient grounds of suspicion, then the uniformity and purity of doctrine becomes very, very important. We don't have any unity as a denomination without that uniformity and purity of doctrine. And that uniformity and purity of doctrine we confess is in the creeds. We've got a proposal coming later to suspend pursuing a sister church relationship on, on the ground is suspicion that they don't hold to the creeds or at least disparage them publicly and officially. Is there sufficient grounds of suspicion? I have sufficient grounds of suspicion supported that motion, I'm ready to vote in favor of that motion. Daryl? To the former speaker, if we're going to work on suspicion, then I could have suspicion of anybody at seated at this. I could come up with a suspicion, and now are we going to go through this procedure on everyone that's sitting at this table? You have to take my word that I believe what the confessions say. I'm going to take Elder Andringa and then Reverend Lanning. I guess I, I have really deep concerns that now a sermon by Reverend Lanning can't even be questioned, can't even be talked about can't even be asked to be better explained. He said this is the definition of Lord's Day 38, therefore it is what we hold to without anybody being able to protest that sermon or discuss that sermon or question that sermon. That's where we're at. This happened Sunday night. Dylan's confrontation with Daryl he was in his car with his wife leaving for Michigan. Yeah. All we asked for was time. And I specifically said, yes, we have to work through this as a consistory. Figure out if Daryl's going to protest this sermon or if we're going to listen to it together and come to agreement with it. But I don't understand why we don't even have that right anymore. Could it be that Reverend Lanning doesn't have the proper interpretation of Lord's Day 38? Is that, that's not even a question I may ask? Finished. Reverend Lanning and then I'll pass. All right, Lee? I think we have to continue to get back to the question of sufficient grounds of suspicion and go around this table and subject everybody to that would be improper based on the fact that there are not sufficient grounds of suspicion. An office bearer of a consistory brought sufficient reason 
to have suspicion. And without even speaking to the sermon that was heard, I believe that's enough to go to to pass this motion and go forward with an examination. Could you could you reread or allow us to see what is written on that those credentials from the individual member, please? Uh, I I can make copy. You want me to make copies of it so everybody can have it before them? I just can't remember just exactly it? what was said. My notes weren't good enough. So I right. Why don't I just reread it? This is in the instruction part of the credentials. I bring these credentials by myself because I stand alone in this decision. The consistory is divided on the matter of church order, Article 21. And we are divided on the questions of church order, Article 41. I seek the classes to examine Elder Jeff Andringa and Elder Daryl DeVries according to the formula of subscription with the following grounds. One, the consistory was not able to come together on the questions of Article 41 of the Church Order because of a disagreement on Article 21 of the Church Order. See Supplement 1. And then two, Darrell openly disagreed with Reverend Lanning's sermon on Lord's Day 38 when he told Reverend Lanning this during his handshake with Reverend Lanning after the sermon. That's on the instruction part of the credentials. And the contention is that's sufficient grounds of suspicion to seat them and then move forward with an examination. They have hands everywhere. I think it's James and then Nick and then Reverend. I guess I'm wondering um, we're dealing with Article 21 how is it different Understanding collectively of Reverend Vanderwalk or Edmonton Overture, there's not a, a definite understanding that we all have of Article 21 concretely. I guess what I'm trying to say is if there's a difference in understanding, why are we not interviewing us all? Why are we not all, all the delegates going under some sort of So the the ground is not Article 21. The ground is Lord's Day 38. All right, that's the creed. Church order doesn't come into the formula subscription. The creeds do. And that disagreement about the creed then brings the formula subscription into play. And the formula subscription is very clear neither publicly nor privately may I teach, propose, or defend anything contrary to the creeds. And the former speaker was talking about sus sufficient grounds of suspension. Even privately, that, that can come up. I had more hands, I'm sorry, uh, Nick and then Reverend Vanderwolf. It seems from that the issue is that from the individual of the consistory that they could not come to an agreement on answering these articles 41 and that's why we can't come to see it all in the delegates because we can't answer in uniformity article 41. It also seems from the testimony of all of them that they didn't really discuss this matter amongst each other, Article 41 and these questions. It would almost seem that this is an insinuation from an individual that the others aren't able to make that. And do we judge off an insinuation of, a, of an individual if they haven't discussed it as a, as a consistory yet um, so that we know for certain that they cannot answer these questions. We haven't asked these questions of these delegates yet, even from Article 41. And so we're basing our suspicion off of an individual that alleges that they cannot. I don't know if it's proper to base our suspicion on that. Sorry. 
Um, in harmony with the, for, the former speaker, I'd like to call attention to two things. First of all, that these are, this information is given under credentials that have not been signed and approved by consistory. And related to that, that the questions of answer or of Article 41, the questions have not yet been asked and answered. I would think that we should, the delegates are first seated according to uh, order, then the questions are asked. In this case, we have answers given from the mouth of one delegate before the questions are asked formally. And I think there's a reason why credentials are first accepted and then the questions are asked. Um, and I don't know if the reason why we're having this difficulty is partly because um, it would seem that the answers are out of order before credentials are uh, accepted. But the official credentials that we do have um, are together in order. Can we re regard these two credentials coming from Sovereign as both having uh, their own authority when in the past I think when you've had splits that a classist might receive two credentials but each claim to have been done in consistory. Uh, divided consistory will meet each claiming to be the proper consistory and classist has to decide between them but in this case it's not a consistory that's approving the credentials, the one set of credentials. All right, just a reminder, the motion on the floor is to see them. One thing I forgot. Um, the, the question on the floor is not decided yet. There's not going to be an examination. That question hinges on whether or not this motion is approved. So it must not be thought that just because there's a motion on the floor that an examination is inevitable. Each delegate has a vote as to whether or not this is understood to be true or not. Um, and I think every, it's incumbent on each delegate to know that the burden of proof does lie on a positive answer to um, this, this motion. That is, the classes must decide whether, the, whether or not whether there is sufficient evidence. That's all. All right. Any further uh, deliberation? The motion on the floor is to seat them and to subject them to a form of a subscription examination. Member Lanning and then Lee Wilcher. Would it help the classes to divide the question? Is that is that holding anyone up that the men don't want to vote all at once? Divide seating and then the examination. Uh, I got Lee first and then. I'll, I'll pass. Right, and I think I had. You'll pass. For, for just a quick answer, it would help me to divide it in order that I know exactly where my vote is. If it's a seat, any then a question, and out of that question arises, even this article and such, it does seem that this material is somewhat illegally brought before us at this point. When we would get into the questions, then I think from Grant Wall's question of do we answer this individually or as a consistory is a valid question where if that consistory can't answer altogether the same thing. We all answer, I believe, um, and so that would speak of not just for one person answering for the consistory, but each individual one answers for themselves there. If they have differences on these questions, I think that suspicion rises in. Yeah, I, I don't know how this procedurally works, but could we ask the mover and supporter to uh, break the question up? I would like to see that. The chairman can break it up, just declare the question divided. So I will do that. The question is divided into two parts. 
Actually, let's have a motion to divide the question. That way I don't. I'll move that. All right. Work. The division of the motion will be into whether to seat and whether to conduct a formula subscription examination. Everybody have that understanding? All right, the motion, the one part of the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> All in favor of dividing the questions? Mr. Chairman. Yes. So I've got a question, though. This is to seat the three delegates from Sovereign? Yes. But we still have, isn't that done through the credentials? So we still have the matter of two separate credentials. Isn't one member asking to be seated as the proper consistory of Sovereign Reformed Protestant Church? Or am I misunderstanding that? <coughs> Daryl? I would reiterate what he said. That would be my question. What are you seating? Are you seating two credentials, one credential, and then one which one? This is the River Bank. The motion, as I understood it and as I supported it, was to seat the three delegates from Sovereign. The mover can correct me if I misunderstood what he was moving, but that was my understanding. So according to the former speaker, if we're seated as three delegates, then you're taking the one with the three and not the one with the one, and the one with the one falls away and is done with? Uh, in answer to that question, the delegates would be seated, all three, but the matter would still re remain of the question that follows about the uh, examination due to the information that's given on the, on the one, one set of credentials. So then when you're seating us, all three from the former speaker, you're taking the credentials of both. You're taking the credentials of the one of us coming together as a consistory of three, and you're taking the credentials of the one by himself as his own consistory or his own delegate, so that you can continue to deal with the second part of the question. Reverend Vanderwall and then Elder Burkett. Well, that would be correct in as much as the second motion depends on the information given and that second offered credentials. My understanding would be that we would accept the credentials from uh, the consistory. Uh, we would not accept the credentials from the individual and the three members would be seated based upon the credentials from the consistory. After seating, the questions of Article 41 would be addressed to the delegates. And if a delegate had a difference of opinion or uh, a disagreement with the other delegates, he would be free to mention that disagreement in answering that question, at which time that would be addressed by classes. The fact is we have two sets of credentials from delegates from Sovereign, and I think we need to say something about both. The motion on the floor to accept the three delegates, as I understand it, would speak to the first set of credentials that was read. It's possible that classes take a follow-up motion to instruct the deacon who brought the other credentials that uh, those concerns be addressed in the questions of Article 41. I do believe classes has to say something about two sets of credentials. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't curtail any of the things then that, and any of the concerns, but would move them to Article 41 instead of a debate about seating. Okay, the one this is all very nicely worked out. The one problem is you have a second part of a motion you've got to deal with. Now, I suppose you could table that and deal with it later. Um, and 
is simply see them, ask the questions of Article 40, table that second part, ask the questions of Article 41, then you're going to have to take that back up again. If, if you're in agreement that we can do that, then I think that's the way we ought to proceed. We see them, we table the second part, ask the questions of Article 41, <coughs> then you, you still have to take up that second part of the motion. Uh, Jeff? I want to reiterate that the basis of this whole discussion is an office there in the Reformed Protestant churches gave question to a sermon preached on Lord's Day 38 four days ago. said to Reverend Lanny, I will get back with you. And now that's the heart of the grounds for an examination. This preaching may be questioned, and it may be discussed. That's not off limits. And you can't create this scenario to enforce that you men may not be approached regarding your preaching. That's the heart of it. You guys went right to Lord's Day 38, and you're saying it's creedal, and you're saying we got to go to the form of subscription. That's never been made manifest simply by a discussion that Daryl had with Reverend Lanning. Reverend Lanning and then Dewey. That is not all that's behind this. That is absolutely not all that's behind this. The question is not whether a sermon may be challenged or questioned. There is much more that has been said that gives sufficient ground of suspicion. There has been in Sovereign struggle, great struggle. There have been a lot of things said in that great struggle. And in all that has transpired, this is not the matter of a single sermon. Now I have suspicion because of what the elder's objection is to the sermon. Because of what the elder has said in further explanation of what he believes about the demand of the covenant. I have further question and suspicion. But this must not be characterized as merely that a man said, hey, I disagree with your sermon or I want to talk more about your sermon. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with whether an elder in the church stands on the creeds, will be instructed by the creeds, will live up to those creeds, and will not undermine those creeds publicly or privately. But well, wasn't the other part of the objection or the ground that they were not of one mind on article the questions of Article 41? So if those questions are asked and one delegate states that the answer is no or the other delegates say yes, that would then cause for this body to pursue that further so that to me would be when those questions are asked then we make a judgment at that time if there is disagreement among the men among the delegates okay so the motion on the floor right now is to divide the question that's the only motion on the floor please speak only to the division of the question you're going to speak to the division of the question I'm going to speak to the former speaker no, nope, I'm only allowing debate on the subject of the division of the question. The motion on the floor is to seat the three delegates and to subject the two elders to a formula of subscription examination. The motion on the floor is to divide that question. I'm very sorry. I just yeah, come again. Are you going to speak to the division of the question? I am. Okay, go ahead. 
if I'm not seated, then I won't be able to speak anymore. So this is my final time to speak if I'm not seated. Are you so, going to speak? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm going to address vision of the question. I'm going to address the second part of it. In that no, no. you're not understanding. <clears throat> Only about the matter of do you want or don't you want to divide the question on the floor. That's the only thing we're debating right now. If there's no further debate on that division of the question, or the call for the question, all in favor of dividing the motion into its two parts, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. The question is divided. On the floor now is only the subject of seating the three delegates. Lee. I make a motion to seat the three delegates. No, nope, it's on the floor already. Oh. And I'm outside of this body, but I'm still able to talk. Yes, you are. So now I'm going to address you because if I'm not seated, then I'm not able to talk again. Correct? Yes. Are you going to speak to your being seated? I can't speak to the former speaker from two Shh. times ago. I will, I will allow that. Yes. If that brother has a problem with me, he's got to come to me. I, he can't bring it this way. This is not in good order. If he has suspicions of me personally, then he's got to come talk to me. Then he has to bring another person with him, and then he has to come to my consistory. That's how that works. If that's not the way it works, I don't know what we have. Lee? In answer to that, I don't think that Elder DeVries understands the gravity of his position as an elder. And I don't think he understands what he signed his name to in the formula of subscription. We can, as a classes, upon sufficient grounds of suspicion, examine him. And I'm now even more concerned than I was before, based on the fact that he's so vehemently opposed to this examination. Any further debate on the question of seating the three delegates from Sovereign? That behavior is not going to be tolerated in this classes. If you're going to do that, you're not going to be allowed back in. I'm going to warn everybody now. We will not tolerate that. This is an assembly of the Church of Jesus Christ. And the business will be conducted in harmony with the Word of God and the Church order. There's not going to be emotional outbursts and visible demonstrations of displeasure. I will have you removed. The motion on the floor is to seat the three delegates. Is there any other further debate? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And I believe the motion in order, according to the, the instructor, the deliberations I've heard, the motion in order is to table the second part of the motion. So moved. Is that supported? Supported. And I think you ought to attach a time to the tabling. And I believe that the time ought to be until the questions of Article 41 are answered. And we agree by common consent with that. We are in support. Move that. All right. So by common consent, the motion is to table the second part of the motion before us until the questions of Article 41 are answered. There's no deliberation on that. <coughs> Call for the question. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. That part of the question is tabled until after the questions of Article 41 are answered. The delegates of Sovereign are seated. Now we need to approve the minutes of the May 13, 2022 meeting of classes. May 13, 2022 meeting of classes. I move to approve those minutes as they were sent out. Is that supported? Support. All right. Any discussion? All in favor then say aye and approve of the minutes. Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries, the minutes stand approved. The delegates of Sovereign are voting. You are seated. Then we move to the questions of Article 41. Yes. I just want to make sure that all those uh, on video can hear and if they have any questions uh, or if, we, if they can't hear, then they should let us know. I uh, just want to reiterate that if you're on streaming in, if you cannot hear, please ask or indicate that you can't hear and we'll try to make arrangements so that you can hear. Dylan, especially, you're going to have to speak up. Yeah. All right, we have a nice little microphone right here for you. Okay. So the... Questions of Article 41. Cornerstone Zion for a second Edmonton Sovereign. Did I miss anybody, did I? It's the Berean. Berean. Okay, so the, the, the visitors can read Article 41, but Article 41 has in it, furthermore, the, the President shall, among other things, put the following questions to the delegates of each church. One, are the consistory meetings held in your church? Two, is church discipline exercised? Three, are the poor and the Christian schools cared for? Four, do you need the judgment and help of the classes for the proper government of your church? And finally, well, that's, that's later. Those four questions. So we'll put those four questions to the churches now. Number one, are the consistory meetings held in your church? Cornerstone? Yes. Zion? Yes. First, Jefferson. Yes. Edmonton just answered, so you have to specify which first. Okay. First in this meeting is going to be uh, first in Jefferson. Edmonton will be Edmonton. So first, yes. Second, yes. Edmonton, yes. Berea, yes. Sovereign? Yes. Is church discipline exercised? Cornerstone? Yes. Zion? Yes. First? Yes. Second? Yes. Edmonton? Yes. Berean? Yes. Sovereign? Yes. Are the poor and the Christian schools cared for? Cornerstone? Yes. Zion? Yes. First? Yes. Second? Yes. Edmonton? Yes. Berean? Yes. Sovereign? Yes. No. All right. I'm going to proceed to the next question, recognizing that there is a disagreement at Sovereign. 
Do you need the judgment and help of the classes for the proper government of your church? Cornerstone? No. Zion? No. First? No. Second? No. Edmonton? No. Berean? No. Sovereign? No. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So we have the disagreement with the sovereign before us. We disagree on the poor and the Christian schools. And do you need the judgment and help of classes for the proper government of your church? Reverend Lanning? With how to proceed here, we've had discussion on the floor that pertains to these two questions and to the table motion. I'm wondering if Classis is of a mind to have a committee take both of those matters and have some advice worked out. Right now we have the fact of disagreement. We have a, a motion that doesn't have grounds in it for giving a formula of subscription exam. I'm leaning in the direction of having a committee work something out for Classis so then we can concretely Judge that. What's your pleasure, then? My only concern with that would be moving forward with judging any other matters before that's rectified. My concern. So with a, in the credentials, it's asking for a form of subscription. You can't go anywhere else until that's rectified. So this does need to get handled. Um, is it, is it the pleasure of the men to have a committee to work out the details of this? Yes. I, I don't understand the answer to number three being no. If Deacon Alpina can elaborate on that. Can we just have this that question answered, do you want it? We've had debate, we've had deliberation on the substance of it. Is it your pleasure that you want a committee or are we going to handle this on the floor? How much, how much content does a committee really have to work with? Is the thing is a, it's a small credential form that came from one delegate without interacting with the other delegates and with him personally and asking those questions, can we really get to the heart of the matter of are they able to answer these questions? With, I don't know how much work a committee has to do until we can interact with them. I see a committee actually bringing the men in. Okay. That's what I would see the work, the main work of the committee would be talking to the delegate from South. So the question is, do you want a committee? Yes. What does an examination look like? So an examination would, it deals with a specific article, so it's not a general examination, broad ranging, but it, here it would be Lord's Day 38. That's the article that's mentioned. So it would be Lord's Day 38 in the light of Article 21, I guess would be the instruction. So the examination would be a series of questions from a prepared list, but also from the delegates. Any delegate can ask a question. You want me to speak to the question in favor of a committee, understanding that the committee would bring back thorough enough advice for us to uh, have a beginning of a discussion, if not even perhaps reconciliation of the question and the work of the committee. I, I, I think that you ought to appoint a committee. I think it's going to be cleaner. It's going to give us direction will have something to, to debate besides a broad-ranging question, he said, she said. 
Yes. I probably wasn't paying enough attention. But what is the committee for? Is that stated in the motion, or we don't have a motion? You, you don't have a motion yet. What we have on the floor is a disagreement and the answers of sovereign to the questions. And we have information that came from one of the delegates. And so the instruction to the committee would be uh, investigate the matter of the disagreement and the answer of the questions from the delegates of sovereign and come back with advice. It's a very broad mandate. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that classes appoint a committee to investigate the disagreement on questions three and four of article 41 expressed by sovereigns delegates and to bring advice on the tabled motion regarding a formula of subscription exam. Okay, do you have that? Form a committee to bring advice on the answers of sovereign to the questions of article 41 and to bring advice on the table of motion. Is that supported? It's supported. All right. <coughs> Discussion on that formation of the committee, Brian? Um, you may have said it a little bit differently in the first line, but uh, regarding the disagreement on, okay, just want to make sure that that's in the wording. Right, if there's no further deliberations, call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Three-man committee. That sounds about right. I'll take Nick Milker. There, you, you would assume they're meeting. Absolutely, yes. yes. Yeah, if they don't, I mean, Nick Milker, uh, Lee Wilcher, and Reverend Lamb. Yes. Um, it has been either stated or insinuated that I've had a hand in the material that came today, and the impression may be left that I've sought out giving advice, which has not been the case. I've taken phone calls and given some advice, but I'm wondering about the wisdom of me being on that committee. So I only offer that as a suggestion for consideration, but my inclination is that another man ought to be on that committee than I. I'm inclined to keep the committee as is, um, and we're going to break for a recess. Here. Yes? My question is, can you answer me, who, what are we seated as now? Our delegate, your full delegates. delegates. No, listen now a second. Are we seated under the credentials of the one that the consistory bought? Yes. Or, we seated under the credentials of the second one. Because that's the consistory. So so, the has three names. So the second one completely falls away. No. Because it's going to be addressed. It's going to be addressed. And the committee's job is to address it. All right, we're going to recess.
come back to order, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we call upon thy name to thank and praise thee for the day, for thy goodness shown to us, the deliberations of the classes thus far, for the churches that are represented here, and for thy gospel which has created these things. We worship thee through thy Son, Jesus Christ, whom we confess to be our Lord and God. We confess that we stand before thee only on the basis of his perfect righteousness, freely granted to us by faith alone without any work. And we beseech, Lord, for Christ's sake, the blessing upon the remainder of this session. Beseech thee for thy grace that we may all deliberate on the basis of the confessions of the church order. And we pray that the decisions that are made be made in harmony with the confessions of the church order. It might be for the good of the cause of the gospel and for the Reformed Protestant churches. Pardon, Lord, our many sins and our sinful human natures. We pray all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, we return to the report of the committee's <coughs> investigation regarding sovereign RPC's delegates' contradictory answers to questions 3 and 4 of Article 41 of the Church Order. Before we do that, I would like uh, a motion to grant advisory vote to Edmund Dyke from the Randolph Fellowship. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Ed, you have advisory vote. All right, will the clerk of the committee read the report? Report of the committee, the committee's investigation regarding sovereign RPC's delegates, contradictory answers to questions three and four of Article 41 of the Church Order. With regard to question three, the heart of the disagreement is whether the institution of a good Christian school is a must or a may for God's covenant people. One elder maintains it is a may, one elder declines to answer, and the deacon maintains it is a must. The committee believes the issue is not whether or not all the office bearers profess a desire for a good Christian school, or whether or not all the office bearers have done enough to promote a good Christian school. We believe the heart of the division is whether or not the institution of a good Christian school is a must. With regard to question four, there is disagreement over matters that the committee believes is not finished at the consistory level, a letter within the congregation. Because we do not believe this matter regarding the letter is finished at the local level, we don't bring any recommendation regarding it to classes. Recommendation one, that classes conduct a classical examination of Elder Jeff Andriga and Elder Daryl DeVries and adopt the following questions to be asked. Number one, do you believe that the Good Christian School Institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day 38? Number two, what are your convictions about the authority of the Reformed Confessions as binding on the life of the believer? The grounds. One, in the meeting, one elder expressed his conviction that the institution of the good Christian school is a may and not a must. This is contrary to Lord's Day 38 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Quote, what does God require in the fourth commandment? That the schools be maintained, end quote. The other elder maintained it was not orderly for this committee to ask him whether the school is a may or a must. Ground two, the question of the authority of the Heidelberg Catechism to determine the question of the requirement of good Christian schools raises the general question of the authority of the creeds. Recommendation number two, that classes declare the set of credentials from the deacon delegate to be out of order. Grounds one, the consistory did not send credentials that excluded any office bearer. And 
ground two, in this case, the proper place for the delegate to bring his material would have been during the questions of Article 41 in Christ's service to the committee. All right. Uh, can we move recommendation one? So moved. All right. Discussion on recommendation one. With its grounds. Uh, what does the committee see as the relationship between uh, Roman numerals one and two under A? That's explained in ground B, or ground two rather, in B. The question of the authority of the Heidelberg Catechism to determine the question the requirement of good Christian schools raises the general question of the authority of the creeds. To follow that up, is, is question two really under question one, or does question two going to presuppose um, a negative answer? Question one. Can you, so what you mean is question two it does not stand in its own right or it's correct. All right. So uh, hope, hopefully this helps with a bit of a big picture overview of the committee's thoughts. Uh, in the committee discussion, not only with the members of sovereigns. Council, but in our own discussion, we realize that in this recommendation we are taking a position. We are taking a position on Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day 38 and its requirement. And I agree with the position that is taken here, but the committee does recognize that that position needs to be discussed needs to be decided. The position that's taken is expressed especially in ground one under B, uh, 3B, that the Lord's Day 38 of the Heidelberg Catechism teaches the schools, which is the institution of the good Christian school, is a requirement, a demand, or a must. That second question arises, what are your convictions about the authority of the Reformed Confessions? Because what we're dealing with here is whether one will be instructed by the Reformed Confessions regarding the school question, the necessity of the school, or merely the permissibility of the school. So that at stake is more than a school question. At stake is whether we as churches will be instructed by the confessions on this question and all others, and whether we will live up to those confessions on this question and all others. In other words, the committee recognizes that recommendation one, to conduct a classical examination is going to lead the classes into a discussion about the position that's taken in Recommendation 1. Uh, could, I, could I have that last part repeated? I didn't quite hear it. Uh, I'll try to recreate that, but the 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 committee recognizes that the recommendation to conduct a classical examination on the grounds that are here will require that the classes examine the position that is here. In other words, the committee didn't take it for granted that everyone would agree with ground one and that that debate for ground one. The 
belongs to this, this recommendation. Right, the other, yes. So does that mean um, that A1 is a question for classes to settle here? and then to become part of the examination? Or is it supposed that we all do know and agree already with the proposition A1 so that it's simply a matter to be asked of the, of the to delegates in question rather than the whole classes. The understanding is that our vote does not establish a position on 3A1. I think the understanding needs to be that your vote does establish a position on 3A1. I think All that's right. what the former speaker said. In other words, we're voting for a classical examination, but in that vote for the classical examination, a position is adopted on Lord's Day 38. Yes. So then we're, debate is open on 3A1. I would say debate classes. is open on the whole okay. the whole recommendation. Grounds included. So if you don't believe that the Christian school is a must, you need to come out and say that clear that you're going to vote against this motion and try to convince us that the Christian school is not a must. If you believe that the Christian school is a must, you need to come out with that position and try to convince us that the Christian school is a must. So that this denomination, that this decision will adopt a, deci a <coughs> position on Lord's Day 38 and really then also more broadly on the question of the Christian school. I'm just going to back up a little bit because I don't really quite understand what's going on yet. When we brought our credentials, we are now seated here under the credentials of the consistory. Then my question is, if the consistory agreed to all those and then we had one consistory member that didn't, how is that him not acquiescing to the consistory? I still think this whole process is way in front of itself. Do the credentials come as a consistory, or do they come as individuals of each consistory? Okay, I just want to make a point of order. I don't like to do this, but that question has already been decided by classes, and we may not be troubled with it again. You are seated. If you don't like the way we're seated, you have the right to protest to this class. But the matter has been decided. It is settled by me. And the deliberations of classes cannot be obstructed by going back to that. On the floor is the recommendation that you have before us, and the debate must be on that recommendation. And I'm going to enforce it as the chair. Daryl? I feel like what we just had with the committee was a consistory meeting that was led by the committee. And then my other thought on it is, what is this examination coming from? I don't care if you want to examine me, but then let's not make it a part of the letter that fell away, because now that second credential paper has fallen away. Let's make sure that it's grounded off the floor on something other than that. So if it is grounded off the floor on something other, it's grounded on the answers that were given to the questions. Article 41. That's how this came to the 
knowledge of classes as far as we're concerned. <clears throat> and that's why classes has entered into it. And I, this discussion borders on obstruction, and I'm not going to take that question anymore. Debate the issue. The issue is before you, the recommendation. When we define good Christian school, because if we define it as a brick building, how big it has to be, that would say it must be. But if we find it something different, it could be a mayor a month. So the definition of school, I think, is very important. All right, let's start there. The definition of school. said in his preaching um, that they come together as the emphasis as well in that? Would that be in line with your definition? <coughs> I would say that's the idea of an institution that there's a coming together. Okay, just address the chair, please. Sorry. Alright, so what is a school? An institution where parents come together to educate their children. I would say with that, there are certain things that a school is not. A school is not, for example, a home. And that is not to, in any way, minimize or dismiss the home. The home, the covenant home, is a good gift of Jehovah. In the covenant home, there is Christian education given godly rearing of the covenant seed. The Christian home is built by Jehovah and except the Lord build the house they labor in vain that build it. A good Christian home is a wonderful, beautiful gift of God. But a good Christian home is a good Christian home. A good Christian home is not a good Christian school. And I make that comment in order to try to ward off the argument that schools in Lord's Day 38, which is the issue here, or for that matter in other places in our reformed documents like the church order, that schools means any place where Christian instruction is given. There are other places Christian instruction is given that are not schools. The catechism room is not a school. That's a good Christian catechism room. Christian instruction is given there. There's rearing of the covenant seed, but that's the good catechism room. So schools in the confessions mean something. It means this institution of banding together, the parents and the other believers laboring together for the covenant instruction of their covenant seed. Does the school proceed out of the home or out of the church? Right? Does the school proceed out of the home or church? I believe, again, going to that sermon, my conviction from that sermon is it proceeds from the covenant. That covenant is both a church gospel preaching as well as from the home. As far as the proceeding has to come in our hearts before we actually get together. Yeah. <clears throat> if me asking this is indication that I minimize the creeds, that's not my intent. But can someone show me from scripture the identification of the school, the institution? This question, I think, is significant because it's one that invariably comes up in defining the school. 
prove it from Scripture. And what we must understand about the proof of the school from Scripture is that it is like the proof for infant baptism from Scripture. I believe the Scriptures teach very clearly infant baptism. The Baptist will tell you the Scriptures don't. And the Baptist's proof is that you cannot find a single passage in the New Testament where it is explicitly demanded that an infant be baptized. You can find the Old Testament command that infants be circumcised, but you cannot find the New Testament instance explicitly now that an infant be baptized. The Reformed approach to that question is not uh, show me your chapter and verse where you see the word infant, but the Reformed approach is to see the principle of the covenant and the unity of the covenant. God's covenant established with believers and their seed. And that age is no barrier to God's covenant friendship with his people. And with that understanding, the Reformed believer comes to a passage like Acts 16, the baptism of the house of Lydia, and the baptism of the house of the Philippian jailer, and the Reformed believer says that's infant baptism. There's no infants mentioned, but that's infant baptism. That's the nature of the proof for this Christian school as well. That proof proceeds from Scripture from certain principles. And the principle is the laboring together of Israel in the instruction of the covenant seed. The two classic passages that Reformed churches have used throughout the years to demonstrate this is Deuteronomy 6 and Psalm 78. In Deuteronomy 6, God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou, Israel, thou, Israel, shall love the Lord thy God with all thine, Israel's heart, and with all thy, Israel's soul, and with all thy, Israel's might. And these words which I command thee, Israel, this day, shall be in thine, Israel's heart, and thou, Israel, shalt teach them diligently unto thy, Israel's children, and shall talk of them when thou, Israel, sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The one being addressed throughout that passage is Israel. That's the nation together. That passage also indicates that the school, or the laboring together, is not the church in its institution, because family life is described here. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, so that the school arises out of the home. The Reformed believer, understanding the covenant of God with believers and their seed, that unites us not only to Jehovah, but also to one another, when the covenant parent comes to that passage, he says, that's a school. I see a school there. And the same with Psalm 78. We will not hide them, that is, the dark sayings of old and the words of my mouth, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. In this passage, there are several generations, and I think it could be argued enough generations that at least one of those generations, generations isn't alive to know that further down generation that's being referred to and there's a reference to the children of those other than us. We will not hide them from their children. Not from my children, but their children. That includes the children of all our fathers. And again, I maintain the Reformed believer coming to Psalm 78 says, I see a school there. That's a school. The 
laboring together of the people of God in such a way that all these generations within my family and without are taught the works of the Lord and his wonderful deeds. And then, if I might add to that, the Reformed Confessions, when they mention schools, don't pull that out of thin air. The Reformed Confessions, we believe, summarize the teachings of Scripture and that all the doctrines of the Confessions are in harmony with the Word of God. So that our confession is, though I might not find the word schools, quote-unquote, in the Bible, I believe that schools are required in the Bible. And that's why I believe and confess Lord's Day 38. Thank you. I was just going to read a quote from Uxman. It comes from a September 1916 sermon. And it was reprinted in September 1, 1927 in the issue of the Standard Bearer, Bearer Volume 3. Pages 532 through 536, and this is a sermon from Herman Hoopsman, Deuteronomy 6, 7, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And for sake of time, I'm going to go to page 5 and read the middle of this. Notice in the second place that all this time the parent is held responsible for the training of his children. Moses does not at all address the congregation of the people of God in general, but emphatically he speaks in the singular. He addresses the individual parent, thou shalt teach them unto thy children, thou shalt talk of them, etc. Education is therefore the duty of the parent and of no one else. And this stands to reason in the first place that there is no one that has more right, more God-given right to a child than a parent. Education determines to a large extent what the child shall be in the future. How it shall think and act, and surely there is no one that is more right to determine that this than the parent, but especially is this so with the covenant parents. They are believers, and they are the ones that are held responsible, and that expresses the promise before God and his congregation time and again that they shall See to it that the children are educated according to the doctrine of the covenant. They, therefore, have the duty to educate their children, and no one else has that obligation as they have. The parent, according to the words of our text, must educate his children always and everywhere, in the home and outside, from morning till evening, in the commands of the Most High. And then I would just like to add one more thing. I didn't get my first question answered. And then are we comparing the school to baptism? Is that what we're saying in this Lord's Day 38? That if we don't have this, then we're going to put them, like if you weren't to baptize under discipline and charge them with sin, and ultimately put them outside the kingdom of God. All right, any other discussion? Andy, I'm sorry, Andy has the floor, then Jeff. Just to follow up, I have another quote of Huxma where he uh, specifically addresses uh, our moral obligation. This is found in Huxma, as to our moral obligation, page 7. School societies are, with respect to the instruction of our children, only a means to an end. If parents were in a position to give their children all the education they need personally and at home, there would be no need of these societies. In fact, in that case, it would be their sacred calling to provide such instruction themselves, 
apart from the church to which the ministry of the word is entrusted. They are the only responsible party before God with respect to this instruction. Or even if all could afford to employ a private tutor to educate their children, the school society might be discarded. And then he comes to the crux of his discussion and surmising about school societies. However, this is impossible. It's an impossibility. That's what Booksma says about teaching our own children or all of us hiring private tutors to educate our children. So his answer there is the school society may not be discarded. It is a necessity. It is impossible. It is a parent's responsibility to see that our children are educated. That's absolutely true. It's impossible to do this apart from schools, according to Booksma. Based on the former speaker's quote, does having the school then come out of necessity or out of demand? I'd say that based on necessity of there isn't another way, necessity that the parents see as a necessity rather than a scriptural demand. I think that's a question we need to, need to answer as well. that interpretation of Uxma on Deuteronomy 6 contrary to Reverend Laney? I have the other follow-up on that. When thou sittest down, when thou risest up, when thou walkest by the way. That's not a school. We don't all go to bed together at the school. And we don't rise up at the school. We do that in our homes. That's where that takes place. O Israel, and speaking to the, to the nation of Israel, if that's a school, then when do we rise up and sit down? And... I think that uh, I believe that the reference there to the rising up and the sitting down and the walking in the way is not a physical reference to going to bed and getting up to bed. Uh, it is a reference to the truth that we are to teach our covenant children in all their life as they are related to God. In other words, there shouldn't be one aspect of the life of our children that they do not learn how it is related to God and what their calling is in that aspect.
speak up. He doesn't have a mic. He's out. Can we get him a mic? James was pointing out or asking the question that when they started the school in Loveland, they didn't necessary, necessarily consciously do it as a demand of the covenant. And that if we use Lord's Day 38 to require the school, then I, that is that. He said, isn't there other Lord's Day, another Lord's Day, Lord's, uh, Lord's Day 21? Anybody, anybody else on the deliberations, on the question before us? Uh, Reverend Vanderwall? Uh, I'm so, I think Elder Ferguson. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I've got a little block here. Uh, go ahead, Greg. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, looking at the wording of the Lord's Day, <clears throat> uh, it says ultimately that the schools be maintained. So the keeping of the Sabbath is connected to the maintenance of the schools that already exist. Um, I'm not sure I've seen the connection as to how this would bear the weight of demanding the institution of schools, but that it would follow that where schools are, they must be maintained. Uh, I have a hard time seeing this as being about the institution. Reverend Vanderwall? Uh, similarly to the previous speaker, that if this is a formula subscription examination, that the exact wording of recommendation 1A1 and B1 and 2 ought to be changed to accurately reflect the language of Lord's Day uh, 38 itself, which simply says schools and their maintenance. I think it's important that we recognize the authority of the creeds, not merely in concept, but in the words themselves. So that my understanding is that the change should be made to uh, the schools. Now because that word maintenance, that word maintain stands in connection both with the ministry of the gospel and the schools, it can be divided so that the, it, can, it must be said that to speak exactly and correctly regarding the creeds that the question has to be changed to this. Do you believe that the maintenance of the schools is necessary according to Lord's Day 38 of the Heidelberg Catechism? And that, ought, that specific language of Lord's Day 38 ought to be clearly reflected in these recommendations, or these recommendations, this recommendation and its grounds. Discussion on the question before us. From our definition so far, from the deliberation, I do not see how catechism doesn't still fit in that definition. We have an institution with parents instruct their children not in the home to proceed from the covenant laboring together to inst instruct. How does that, how can catechism not fulfill that from our definition so far? Is there more to this than coming together? Is there a number of days we have to come together? Or something more we have to teach? If 
I understand correctly, the question is how does our definition not also include catechism instruction of the children? Catechism instruction of the children is not the parents coming together in the rearing of their seed. It is the church's official ministry of the gospel to the children. Harold? The thought of the former speaker, that's where I would say if you're going to go this route and make it a demand, you are taking something earthly, which is a school, and putting it into the covenant of God and into the church as the mindset of this is catechism. There's a separation there between the school and the church. And that separation has always been there in the Reformed thinking. That separation wasn't in the Catholics or the Lutherans, but in the Reformed thinking, that's always been separated. I would reiterate one of the comments by the one of the former speakers, too, with regard to that A1. If you're going to lay it on Lord's Day 38, it can only be that you believe that the good schools must be maintained. And now this forming of a school institution is a requirement. Just so I can make sure to understand the former speaker and his argument, is he suggesting that it speaks of maintaining the schools, but that would have nothing to say about their formation? So the schools have to simply somehow appear, and now Lord's Day 38 applies? I would say that uh, they will appear through the parents because they come out of the home. Yes, then the Lord's Day 38 applies. They may be tamed. And there can be discussion about throughout Reformed history that that was an emphasis placed on the higher education for seminary training. That's, that's not a new thing. I, I was taught that. that's incorrect. This is new, this aspect of our of Lord's Day 38. Um, that the previous speaker refers to school either being defined as or at least identified as seminary training. I think his reference was to Lord's Day 38, maybe beyond that. But that is not the idea of school exclusively in Reformed history. From the very beginning, school meant a day school, not only a seminary. Uh, schools for the instruction of the children, not only the grown men or growing men who were seminary students. Schools has a meaning. Reformed history. And schools has a meaning in Reformed confessions and in the church order for that matter. Schools does not mean the home. Schools does not mean the catechism room. Schools does not mean exclusively the seminary. It means the day school, the Christian school. I cannot uh, vo vote for this recommendation as it stands simply because it's a modification of the language of the Heidelberg Catechism itself. Um, I'm going to move that we amend A1 from 
good Christian school institution to maintenance of the schools. And similarly, in B1, from institution of the good Christian school to maintenance of the schools. Mr. Chairman, just a point of clarification before that gets too far. The, that ground one expresses what happened in a meeting. Oh. So I believe that is an accurate report of what happened in the meeting. I grant that. I don't, yeah, that really can't be changed then. But I'll, I want to move that motion to amend. One and two. One. A yeah. one. Yes, one. A mo motion is on the floor or been moved to change the good Christian school institution to the maintenance of the schools. Is that supported? Supported. All right, the amendment, just the amendment, is on the floor. change, quote, the Good Christian School Institution to, quote, the maintenance of the schools. Oh, yeah, the amendment. Yeah? Yep, go ahead. I would just reiterate the reason why you would do something like that would be to keep with the Lord's Day 38. If you want to change Lord's Day 38, there are means if you're not happy with the way Lord's Day 38 is written. Any further discussion, Captain? I have no problem with bringing the wording of A1 into line with Lord's Day 38. My interest now is what effect that has on the motion. And in my judgment, it has no effect, no substantive effect, because ground one, so B1, is still an interpretation that the institution of the good Christian school, that that's a may and not a must, is contrary to Lord's Day 38. So I only bring that up to say that what, what the implication of this change is. It's just a change of the wording to bring it in line with Article 38, but doesn't change the substance of the motion. I believe it does, because then ground one is not rooted in the must requirement of a school institution. It's the must that, that ground one would then become, must you maintain them? That helps me, because that indicates that the meaning of this change could be taken to weaken that interpretation of Lord's Day 38. The question that is formulated here is, do you believe that the good Christian school institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 38? And if a man in his examination believes that it's not, that that's an unfaithful representation of Lord's Day 38, or that uh, Lord's Day 38 means something different than what's stated here, he can state that and explain that. This is where the, the issue came down to as the committee saw it, when we were talking together with the brethren from Sovereign, and the question was put, do you believe the good Christian school is a must of the covenant or a may? 
that's when the answer was it's a May. And our contention in this recommendation is that that is contrary to Lord's Day 38. So if, if the meaning of this amendment is to weaken question one, I'm not in favor of it. I want to know what men believe about the good Christian school institution. Is that a requirement or isn't it? Darrell? I still go back to the question of by the must, are you putting it at the level of baptism that if this doesn't happen, it's a demand not? It's a demand of the church that you have to do this. And if you have to do this, we're going to put you under discipline. We're going to charge you with sin. We're going to put you out of the kingdom of God. Is that what that must be? So when he said this was answered as made by sovereign, it's obviously written that I did answer. But I want to know what you mean by that must. Where are you putting it? That's why I go back to your taking an earthly thing at school and putting it into the covenant of God. You're putting it into the church. Now you're saying the church is demanded to have these schools. So then how are you not a parochial person? How are you not a, a church and school person together? You're, you're combining two things that the Reformed people have never combined, and it hasn't been put. The school wasn't put into the covenant. I realize in an aspect that the covenant is the home. That's why I read what I did from the exegesis of Husma on Deuteronomy 6, 7. I get that, that that comes out of the home. That's why I said that school is a fruit of the home. It's not something that the church, church says you must do. If we're going to go that route, then you're not reformed. And I would say you're not taking, where is that in the confessions? I, this is, I just, I don't know where the school is combined. I don't know where the school is combined with the church in the confessions anywhere. I just, I don't know where that is, where you run those two together and then you run them to the point that you're going to discipline people over it. I think we have to, I think we have to understand what the relationship is between the church and the school. The school is not started by the church. The church does not come into the school and make decisions for the school. The relationship between the school and the church is one of oversight. Members of the school, members who have started the school, have taken a baptismal vow in which they have vowed to educate their children according to the doctrines of the Word of God and the confessions. And it is the place of the church as overseer to see to it that the parents are doing that. It is not a taking over of the school in any way. The school and the church are not enjoined in that way. But it's oversight, and it is appropriate. I agree with everything the former speaker said. that has to come out of the home, that's where I go back to, does the school come out of the home or does it come out of the church? And if you say the must, and you make it a requirement out of Lord's Day 38, you are putting it into the church. And if you put it as a must, as part of the covenant, you can't say, oh no, I'm not putting it in the church. No, when you say that, you are putting it in the church as the church's responsibility. Any further comments? The motion on the floor is to amend by replacing, quote, good Christian school institution, end quote, with, quote, maintenance of the schools, end quote. Me? It 
it's no different for an elder or the consistory to it's no different for the consistory to oversee the fact that school be started and maintained than it is for the elder to oversee that a man doesn't walk in gross unthankfulness in any other part of his life. You've spoken many times. Go ahead. That, that idea that the former speaker just brought has implications that that elder may go to that man that walks in that blatant sin and correct him or bring him the word. But we want to now as a church come in and determine for each body represented in our churches, each church, Men want to come from outside and tell us what we have to do concerning the education of our own children, which is our calling. And those schools come as a fruit out of that gospel and from those parents. And when those from outside come in and judge that we haven't met their standards with regard to what they see as a school, that's where I become confused. Answer the former before the last. That's the difference that we're exactly talking about. The school is an earthly institution. And I that's not my thinking. I got that from Kuchman. That's the difference. That's what you're now doing. If you say this is a must under 38, you're putting that school into the church, that discipline, for all those actions that are done by the parents. I'd like to relinquish the chair. For a I believe you have a chair. Correct. Dr. Langerak. I am not in favor of the amendment. The amendment guts the motion. And the amendment seeks to take a literalist view of Lord's Day 38, as though it were possible for somebody to be commanded by God to maintain a school, but not be commanded by God to make it. That makes God a fool. The schools that you have to maintain, you have to first build. And the requirement that you maintain the school is built into Lord's Day 38. Lord's Day 38 in its language is it any different from Article 21 of the Church Order where it requires that the elders see to it that the parents use the good Christian school? Not just that it's there, but they use it here. The language is maintained. And you only maintain what you already built. It's folly to suggest that the Fourth Commandment requires the maintenance of the school but it doesn't require the building of the school. Furthermore, the arguments that I've heard against this motion are not arguments that a school may be built, but under the guise of arguments that the school may be built is a latent hostility toward the demand of the school. There are arguments that anybody could use never to build a school again. In fact, if the interpretation of Deuteronomy 6 that was read to us is correct, you may not build a school. If the understanding of Article 38 that's been given to us is correct, it can't be a church matter. It can't be a demand matter. You may not build a school. 
God won't bless it. God is not indifferent to the schools. He blesses the schools. And that's been the fruit of the schools. And in Lord's Day 38, that close connection of the school to God's covenant is maintained. Lord's Day 38 is first of all about the covenant. It's about rest. God gave us and our children rest. He brought us out from the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage and gave us rest. That rest is his covenant. And that school is God telling you, let your children enter the rest. Bring them together so that they as children Enter God's rest. That's why it's there. That's not arbitrary. Lord's Day 38 itself connects the demand of the covenant and the school. And we as churches here are arguing about what I feel is to be, uh, the whole argument today is to be really about what's not even central to the issue. Central to the issue is this, is our church and denomination. Is it going to be a denomination of Christian schools? Or is it going to be a denomination where you may also homeschool? And no one may call you on that. No one, may, no one may admonish you. No one may come to you with the word of God. No one may try to teach you that the school is even necessary. That's been part of the debate, too. Well, I can see the school is necessary, but you can't make it a must. No, no, the arguments we've heard today, is you can't even say it's necessary. This motion is a crossroads. And if we fail this motion, we are becoming a denomination where you can do whatever you want with the school. No one may tell you otherwise. And the minister in the pulpit and the elders from the consistory room can only do this. Now, beloved, if you happen to have a school, you need to make sure that you maintain it. And only if you happen to have a school and you, make, and you don't maintain it, only then can we charge you to sin. I don't agree with that at all. I will never be content in a denomination where you can do whatever you want with the schools. I'll never be content with it. I want the schools. I believe the schools are a demand of the covenant, both in their formation and in their maintenance. I believe God requires it himself, and I believe if you don't do it, God doesn't bless that. He judges it. And there's historical proof for that. What? What carried the churches on their backs since the Reformation? The schools. There never would be churches if there wasn't schools. And what has been the fruit of homeschooling and doing whatever you want in schools? What's been the fruit? Not individually here and there, but across the board. Children leave easily from the church. Children don't know each other in the church. And frankly, I view the position that I hear being defended today as an attack on the covenant. It's an attack. And it will not be for the good of our churches. Thank you. All right, any further discussion? Daryl? If you have a must of something you must do, you are no longer resting in Christ. Then you brought something that you must do. We're no longer depending on Christ alone. That school is not a must. That school is a fruit. You preach the gospel, and that fruit will come out of that. There, Mr. Chairman, is the deeper issue. We have a profoundly doctrinal issue here 
The school has simply been the instrument to bring it out. He just revealed it. You, there is no must. I violently disagree with that. Lord's Day 32 stands. There is a must. There is a must with the school. And the must with the school is twofold. First of all, the must of the school is love. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 says, The whole law is fulfilled in this, love. And he says, don't use your occasion, your, your liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Your attitude can't be, I got my own, and the rest of you can profit or perish as you will. Your attitude has to be, I'm not educating my children until all the children of the church are educated. It's a demand of love. And I would charge this, somebody who opposes the school, someone who doesn't want the school, someone who obstructs the school, his sin is a blatant lack of love. And secondly, the demand of the school is thankfulness. God delivered you together. You're going to go off on your own in the raising of your children and say to the rest of them, you can do what you want. That's gross unfaithfulness. And third, the demand of the school is Philippians chapter 2. Have the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ. He did not look on his own things, but he looked on the things of others. And the arguments that I'm hearing here tonight, today, are arguments I'm looking on my own things. And I'm not going to look on the things. That is simple. That's terrible sin. Unthankfulness is terrible sin. A lack of love is terrible sin. Not having the mind of Christ is terrible sin. And we're going to argue those things under the guise of, well, we may have a school. No, there are people here who aren't going to have a Christian school. They're not, they're not happy. And if one is formed, they're not using it. They don't have to. You can't tell them to. And that's selfish. So the Church of Jesus Christ gets together, and the Church of Jesus Christ expends all of this energy and money to educate her children. Somebody says, I'm not using that, and I'm not getting involved in it. And if you call me for a donation, why are you calling me? I don't use that school. The school rests on a lot of principles. Covenant, love, thankfulness, the mind of Christ. And I regard the opposition to the school. And that's what we have here today. The opposition to the school. The opposition to the school that comes under the guise of may, may. I may have one. No, you don't want one. It's opposition. And I can say that because I experienced the opposition. I was going to give the lecture. And that was opposed. That's still being opposed. So this may, I regard as dishonest. It's not a may. It's a we're not going to. You can't tell us we have to. That's what it is. That's lawless. You mean for the girl? The school comes out of the home, and now I'm going to be told that something that comes out of the home is wrong to do in the home? I don't understand. I'm thinking no one in my history has never been against the school. We always have been for a school. We never said we don't want a school, and I still don't I said before, something earthly that you're putting in to the church comes. Anyone further?
doing? I'm opposed to the motion as well because it's, it is trying to weaken the point in the clear teaching of Lord's Day 38. And it does, this, does, this discussion does get to a deeper matter. And so whether we pass this or fail this or take Article 21 out or keep it in, and I'm in favor of keeping it in, but this, the discussion that I hear, I don't recognize the spirit behind the discussion. I hear someone saying, you're taking something earthly and putting it into the covenant of God. And I don't recognize that spirit at all. I hear school and I hear something that flows out of the covenant of God. And I suppose maybe it's weariness from our previous church where as long as we can get the right definition of something or pass the right words, then we're safe. But we know that's not the case. Either it's in your heart to form a school because you love the covenant of God and what that means, or it's not. So, to the extent that if, if I were in a city with three or four other families, I'm going to say to that, those other families, what time is church on Sunday and when is school starting? And I'm going to say it in the same breath. And it's not going to be because Lord's Day 21 is in the church order. It's not going to be because somebody explained the fourth commandment to me. It's because that is simply written there. That when God places me into his covenant, I can't wait to educate my children with you. And I believe it's disingenuous as well to say, oh, no, no, we want a school. That's not what I hear. That's not what I hear at all. I hear you arguing for a homeschool, which is a contradiction in terms. That's what I hear. And you can protest and you can disagree with that. But that's exactly what I hear. And so I'm opposed to the motion because I believe it goes in a certain direction that I simply don't recognize. Reverend Vanderwall. I think we can decide against the amendment, but should the decision be taken against the amendment, I don't believe this is any longer formula of subscription uh, examination. It is something else. What else it is, we could discuss and debate, but a formula of subscription examination has to deal with the teachings of our confessions and is the wording of the confessions. So the basic question is, is do those under examination agree with the doctrines specified in, in this case, Lord's Day 38? The present formulation is a different question. It deals with an understanding of what this Lord's Day does teach. It does not deal with the substance of the Lord's Day. That's the reason for the amendment. So if this can be, a, in my judgment, a proper formula of subscription examination. Reverend Langerak. I don't I don't understand what that what he's saying. So a formula of subscription examination can only involve the, the specific phrase of the creed? Absolutely not. When we subject the heretical minister and the Protestant Reformed Churches to a formula of subscription examination, there was a mass of questions. And it wasn't just do you believe in this 
phrase in this creed. How do you interpret that phrase in this creed? I agree. This question is an interpretation. I, I grant that. But it is squarely based, in my opinion, upon the very <coughs> wording of Lord's Day 38. That's how I preach Lord's Day 38. Start the school and then maintain it. Don't let it fall by the wayside. What's in the creeds explicitly and what's in the creeds by good and necessary consequence is in the creeds. And I maintain that Lord's Day 38 and its word maintenance and its word school has in it by good and necessary consequence. Start one too. And so I disagree that we have to change the wording in order to make this a proper form of subscription examination. No, we don't. In fact, if I had my druthers, there'd be about 45 more questions in light of some of the discussion I heard today. I would get into Lord's Day 32. I, I would get into the, the very nature of the formula of subscription itself. What does that mean? Didn't you know that word school was in the Lord's Day when you signed the formula of subscription? The word school is there. And we engage in a bunch of mental exercises to exegete what the word school is so we can include our own private interpretation. It's right there. If you didn't want a school, why did you sign the formula? It isn't like this is something we sprung on people later on. It's been in the creeds for 500 years. And then add to it, the church order, which is no mean document, has in it the school. This, this, this motion, as it stands, is proper. And don't let everybody think, and don't let anybody think otherwise. Greg. I do have a question regarding something I'm stumbling over. Uh, I have only growing up been in a church where we did not have a school. And my understanding was that there was a desire for a school and it wasn't possible. Now, at the time I was too young for a lot of that. I took that at face value that there would be circumstances where a school is not possible. Um, when I read the word requirement, what I've heard, I think, is that the way that necessity is that we need a school. Um, a requirement seems different to me, and I, I wrestle with it. What about the circumstances? Are there circumstances? It's not possible to have a school. And in those circumstances, if they exist, where we can't have a school, though we yet need one and desire one, um, what do you do with that? With the requirement, if you fail to meet the requirement, then what happens as a result of failing to meet the requirement? Whereas I do think that most, as a natural fruit of God's work in our hearts, we want a school, we desire a school. Um, but sometimes there are obstacles to that. So I just, when I read requirement, I'm not sure what to do with that in every set of circumstances. <clears throat> we went further. The amendment on the floor is to add the maintenance of the schools in place of the good Christian school institution. Reverend Langrath. I want to answer these questions because he raises good ones. We're not able to start a school. First of all, I want to say about that, that's been used as a cop-out and an excuse for years. They didn't want a school, and they said they weren't able. So I take that with a grain of salt. But let's posit the scenario where they're not able. What, is, what does that mean, they're not able? God built the school into the church in the very form of the church. First of all, the church is a body united in Christ in one truth. We 
which we all confess when we take our baptism vows, the doctrine taught not merely in the creed, but in this Christian church. They're all united in the doctrinal foundation of the school. Secondly, God constituted the church out of believers and their seed. The church isn't a bunch of individuals. It's believers and their seed gathered together for the worship of God. The school is built into that. And my response to those who say they're not able to this, if you can't have a school, you can't have a church either. Because what you're telling me, I can't have a school, is I don't have believers in their seed here. If you have believers in their seed, you, you have the foundation of the school. And if all those believers in their seed go to one church, you have the doctrinal foundation of the school. So church and school are, as it were, built into each other. And that all flows out of the home. What is the home? Believers and their seed. And that's why the Reformed faith taught a threefold core. They're so intertwined, it's in, they're inconceivable apart from each other. I cannot conceive of a church without a school. I can't conceive of homes without schools. There's, they're simply built into each other in the very, at their very foundational level, believers and their seed. But then let's say somebody says, we're not able because there's a lot of state laws against it. Disobey them. Move to a different state. I don't care what it takes. Get a school. The state may not tell you something contrary to the word of God. And if they try to stymie the school, just if they try to stymie the home or the church, Tell the state, run out. This, this is God. This is God given. And that brings me to another point. When the state tells us, you know what, you can't have school, what are you falling back on? You're going to fall back on necessity? Well, I guess if it's just necessary, we're all just going to have to do it at home. No, you're going to tell the state, God told me to do this, and we are doing it. And nothing short of that will satisfy. Because there is going to come pressure on us. You can't have a school. We're going to tell the state, yes, we can. God said so. It's not merely uh, a may. It's a must. And I'm going to do it. And then I'll also say this. All right, a church just formed, and they're working on getting a school, which I don't believe is true on, in some, on some locations. I don't believe they're working hard at getting a school. I don't believe that at all. But let's say they are. And let's say they have to overcome some obstacles. When that question comes to them, are the good Christian schools maintained? They say, yes, but we want to explain don't have one yet. We have a society going. We have so many kids enrolled. I've heard many people answer that question, and I've sat in PRC for a long time. I sat in classes west, and that question came up. Are the good Christian schools maintained? They said yes. And what they meant by that was a home school. That's disingenuous. It's not even being honest. As though the question in the church order means a homeschool. It means a school. Anyone further on the amendment? I would just say on the last speaker, if I understand him correctly, he brought the school to the same level as the church. Mr. Chairman, in the same sense as the home, these are these are institutions of God. Anyone further? Amen. The motion on the floor is to amend. So that question one would read: Do you believe that the maintenance of the schools is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 38? I believe we ought to move towards a vote on that amendment. All right, I'm going to call for the question then. 
All in favor of adopting the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say aye. 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 I have that failing. The motion on the floor then is the question as formulated that classes conduct a classical examination with two questions and two grounds. I'll give the chair back to Reverend Langer. Great. Uh, main motion as originally moved is on the floor. All right, I'm going to call for the question then. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. The motion carries. Recommendation two. I move that classes declare the set of credentials from the deacon delegate to be out of order on two grounds. Is that supported? Support. Call for the question then. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I believe then that it is in order that we move to the formula subscription examination. Um, I suppose I'm the chairman, so I have to conduct it. And the form of the examination has already been laid out. Uh, is there any anybody want to break for a second? Or okay, we're going to take uh, five five minutes.
other delegates back. The online system has crashed and burned those. Oh. Is everybody, is everybody there? It says you're all muted. Dave, do you have me muted yet? Can everybody hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. All right? Hmm. No, Cornerstone case. There's... Yeah, Cornerstone said yes. Jim, no, I thought you said oh, Jim. Yeah. Classes adopted the recommendation to conduct a classical examination of Elder Jeff Andriga and Elder Daryl DeGreese and adopt the following questions. Do you believe that a good Christian school institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism Version 38? And two, what are your convictions about the authority of the Reformed Confessions as binding on the life of the believer? I'll put those uh, two questions to each of you individually. Uh, Daryl, do you believe that the Good Christian School Institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 38? <clears throat> You'll have to bear with me a little bit, as I haven't had a whole lot of time to prepare for this, as it was just this morning that I been introduced to all this, but I can't regress. You don't want to go back there. I completely understand that, but you got to see what's going on. So to the question, do you believe that the Good Christian School institution is a requirement according to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 38? I can answer yes to that question. But you have to then define what is a good Christian school. What does that exactly look like? 
then you as a church have to establish that. Yeah, this goes back to me not having much time to prepare. Do you not see that you are now having the church rule over the school? God instituted the family, Ecclesiastes 9, 9. God instituted the church. God did not institute a school. And that in no way means that I am against a school. So my answer is yes. Jeff, or rather Daryl, what are your convictions about the authority of the Reformed Confessions as binding on the life of believers? I'm assuming that we're dealing with each one of these individually. So we're going to treat Daryl's examination first, and then we'll proceed to Jeff's examination. Um, Brother DeVries answered question one, yes. But in that answer indicated that good Christian school institution is not defined. And I would like to hear more about what he's answering yes to then. Does he not know what the good Christian school institution is? Could the brother explain why he answered yes, but challenged the meaning of a phrase in that, in that answer? I really don't have anything else prepared to answer more questions on the floor here. I guess what I wrote was, but you have to define what is a good Christian school. Then. So I can answer yes, because I believe a home school is a good Christian school. You believe a home school isn't a good Christian school. Well, then you have to do that as a church. You have to say, this home school does not fit in Lord's Day 38. You have to, as a church, start making those rules and regulations of what that school looks like. You have to, as a church, define what a good Christian school is, specifically. And yeah, it's endless of where you go with that. That's why I said it's a fruit of the gospel. It will come out. That's why I said at the end, I am not against a school. So would it be fair to summarize your yes this way? Yes. But in the definition of a good Christian school institution is a home school. No, I don't think that would be fair. I think you have to write the rest of it. That definition has to come to everything, every aspect of what that school looks like exactly. This is just, the home school is just one small piece of what this is going to look like. So is it fair then to say yes, but includes a home school? You don't understand, it's not going to stop at a home school. He was asking if that fairly summarized if you're yes. yes. No, it doesn't. So it's yes, but you have to define everything? That, that's your answer? 
Yes, but you're going to want to stop there at home school. I'm saying I don't know what that looks like. It might take many different forms of what that looks like. According to covenantal demand of the parent to have their child in a school. And that's why I wrote, do you not see that you are now having the church rule over the school? God instituted the family, Ecclesiastes 9.9, and God instituted the church. God did not institute the school. And this in no way means I am against the school. Any, you know, do we? I don't, I don't need his definition summarized because he said I believe I believe a home school is a good Christian school. That's what he's, that's what was stated. And we don't need endless definitions. It doesn't need to continue. There don't need to be many definitions because we all know what a school is. And we all know what a home is. And we all know what a home school is. And so there doesn't need to be definitions. There could be two families, three families with two children band together to educate their children together according to the demands of the covenant in which they live. That's what a school is. That's not a home school. Home school is doing it independently of the body. And so to answer yes, but what does a good Christian school institution look like and then to go on to say believes a home school is a good Christian school is to dodge the question. The question is being asked whether you believe the good Christian school institution is a requirement. And it's, it's to somehow try to misdirect when you say, yes, but a home school is included. That's the issue. That's the issue. So when I hear a yes, but the home school is included, I hear no to that question. Then 
not see that you are not now having the church rule over the school. God instituted a family, Ecclesiastes 9.9. God instituted a church. God did not institute a school. And that is in no way means that I am against the school. That's my whole point. You want to take it and say he's just against the homeschool. I'm saying. I, what I'm saying is yes, but then you have to define what a good Christian school is. It's not a yes. It's not a yes. question is extremely simple. We've debated now for like three hours about the school, what the school is. The definition has been in the debate. And frankly, I believe that yes, but is disingenuous. You should say no. Um, I understand that this formula subscription exam will have two parts so that there will be the questions put, follow-up, sought with those who are answering, and then the second part will be that the, the class is judges. That's correct. And we'll judge on the basis of the clarifications and the answers. So I'll pass for now, but then I'd like to ask a follow-up question for some clarification. Yeah. My but to the other part of that is you're saying nowhere well, where? That's my question. You're saying you have to send your kids to a good Christian school, that it's a requirement. I'm saying, what is that? You're saying you're, it's a good Christian school. I'm not even saying that alone. I'm saying if there's a parent that wants to send his kids to the PR school, then you have to put that in there. And then the church has to start saying, this is the list of schools that don't. Or you have to define what a good Christian school is from the church's perspective. Reverend Lanning, you wanted to answer, ask a follow-up question? Yes, um, not to follow up on that previous line of discussion, but with regard to the word requirement, do you believe that the good Christian school institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 38? Does the brother have any any objection to the word requirement? And I ask that uh, because there was a statement that if you make the good Christian school institution to be something, whatever that is now, then don't you see you would have the church ruling over the school? So it seems to me that's really taking issue with the word requirement, and I'd like to hear what Elder DeVries has to say about that. I would say that's my exact point in case, that if you're going to say it's a requirement and not tell me what the requirement is, then I can answer yes, because you don't have it defined what a good Christian school is. You are saying this is a requirement. Okay, for me, it's a homeschool. But now, I'm going to be told that a homeschool isn't a good Christian school? That was my whole point. So, if trying to work with that understanding, let's just say, and I, I don't grant it, but let's say that a Christian school means homeschool. My question is the requirement. At any point, along any definition of good Christian school, may there be a requirement so that if there were a family that said this homeschool is our good Christian school and they were not educating their children, that the church could say it's a requirement. Now I realize I'm, I'm working with uh, Brother DeVries's understanding of good Christian school, but I want to know about that requirement. Does he have a problem with requirement, that something is required of the believer, and that there may be a consistory that sees to it, that he follows the requirement? That's why I asked the question earlier in the discussion, 
of what are you going to do if someone sends their kids to a home school, then that's going to fall under discipline, and then people are going to be put outside the kingdom of God under discipline, because that's the requirement. I think you're missing the point of the question. Let's grant you send your kids to a home school, and that's a school. Let's grant that. But let's say you have the kids running all over the farm and you're not educating them, right? And that comes out at family visitation. Elders inquire about what kind of instruction is going on in the home, you know, how long the instruction is taken, what form the instruction takes. The elders start to ask questions to you and your wife about your home school. And it comes out that your kids are you know, being educated about two hours in the morning then they get to run over the farm for the rest of the day. May the elders require you, including a charge, that you are not educating your children and you must educate them or face discipline. Answer? Yes. Thank you. I, yes, that's the gist of the question. That was my whole point, is once you go this direction and bring it into church and bring it into the elders work, that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to have to make those decisions and go to that family and you're going to have to decide two hours isn't enough for this family, four hours isn't enough for this family, six hours isn't enough for this family. That's why the reformed people never put the church and the school together. That school comes out. I would like to have the answer from Elder DeVries Elder De of whether or not he believes that an individual in the church can be disciplined for not educating their children. Let's take out of it the fact that it's two hours a day. Let's say you're not educating them at all. Would you discipline someone in your church for that as an elder? I would say that right now, with what I've been prepared with, and for the little amount of time I have, this is where it's come already. In just this short period, it's come to all these different scenarios. I can't re-quote his question exactly, but I get the gist of it. We're starting to do scenarios of, what if this happens? What if that happens? Would you do this? Would you do that? I can appreciate that the scenarios um, that, that the brother doesn't want to answer about this scenario. Let's take the scenarios out of it. Is there, is there any elder's work that may touch on family's education? Forget scenario. Is there any elder's work that they come and say we have a requirement? That touches on a family's education. Off the top of my head, I would say yes. That's why we work and look to having a school together as a congregation. That would be the elders' work for the unity of the congregation. You would talk about having a school and visit the families about having a school and encourage the families to have a school. You just you have to be patient. You have to leave that school come. You can't require that you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I don't mean to harp or, or badger in any way. I, I want to get to that matter. May the elders ever Come with a judgment you have not met a requirement in education. May they judge you have not met the requirement. Keep the scenarios out of it.
that's where I'm confused on the whole thing. And I know it's not a debate, so I can admit that I'm confused. What are you talking about? What's the requirement? Anybody else? Um, Alvin DeVries' answers and clarifications sought. Mr. Chairman? Yes. In our, in our uh, church order, questions for church visitors ask the church, they ask the consistory this question, number 18. Does the consistory see to it that the parents send their children to the Christian school? That to me lays it out as an elder. You have to see it as a requirement. And that just follows through with the rest of our church order and the confessions. Anyone else? Yes, sorry. And I'd like to ask if. Elder, Elder DeVries could ans ask that or answer that question in the positive if that question was asked to him. I don't know where you're at. Questions. Questions for the church visitors when they come to the consistory. We don't have church visitors yet, but that is uh, that's the, the form. But number 18 of those questions for the consistory says, does the consistory see to it that the parents send their children to the Christian school? Can I answer that? Can I read the question? Which number? Sorry, 17 did you say? 18. 18. 18. As an elder, can you answer that question, yes or no? I would. I would answer yes. I think that's what the whole discussion is happening right now. That's why we're trying to get to what the definition of a good Christian school is. It, it goes back to scenarios. You've got to wait and let that happen. And if that happens in time, then you can pick it up and deal with it as a body again. Can't say yes. Right. Any further clarification sought? If not, then I'm going to declare closed session. Yes. Uh, sorry. Are we, are we on question two as well? Or yes. We are both were asked, so clarification. With regard to the Reformed Confessions, would the brother say that the doctrine of the Reformed Confessions is in full harmony with the Word of God, so that the doctrine of the Confessions can be the rule of a body of this classes, for example, and that that would be an answer from the Word of God? Doctrine of the Word of God. Darrell? Yeah, I'm trying to comprehend everything that's going on. If a classist made its decision, as in here on the basis of Lord's Day 38, does not quote. Deuteronomy 6 or Psalm 78 or any other passage that refers to Lord's Day 38 or a confession. Is that decision, if it's in harmony with that church or, or with that confession rather, is that settled and binding according to the Word of God? 
for is that weak and needs needs the scriptures. Right. Yeah, I guess I don't quite fully understand the question or I know you rephrased it twice for me to try and help me because I'm a little slow. I get that all. But I would say I would like more time to think about that to answer that question. And if that's not possible at this level, then yeah, I would ask for a break to think about it. Uh, Dewey and then Clinton. So, Mr. Chairman, these questions are not gotcha questions. And these questions should not require additional time. And I say that not because of this, that, or the other thing, but all of us put our signature on the formula of subscription. So the answer ought to be a resounding yes, with no hesitation, no additional time needed. But I have my additional concerns. I have concerns about the hesitation to answer that question, but I also have concern because in the course of my study for other work, I was reading the 2021 uh, decision of another denomination. And I would like to ask Mr. DeVries whether he believes, still believes, that the three forms of unity are a Nerf gun which is how he characterized them in his document. Does he consider the three forms of unity to be at best weak? And does he understand them to be a Nerf gun? What was done to me right now was what was continually done to me in the PRC church when I was there dealing with them, the second part of that phrase was continually left off to make me look stupid and like I didn't have any regards to the confessions. The second part of that phrase is as compared to scripture. Mr. Chairman, that doesn't satisfy me because I believe that the three forms of unity accurately and entirely summarize the doctrine of the scriptures. What? I wonder if there is a disconnect between the understanding of what homeschool is and what school is. I don't think we're saying you are not allowed to teach your child math at home. I think it is a must. We must teach your children math. But if the child does not get it, they must be taught at home. I think what we're trying to say is the body of Christ must gather together and must teach children together. Not must teach math together. But they must gather because we are a body. And we have to act by the body. Not teach math as a body, but must teach, must instruct together. Any further clarifications? All right, then I am going to declare a closed session. I'm going to, before that is done, I want to move that Luke Boomers and Tyler Uphoff be allowed to sit in on all closed session discussions. So and here. Oh, and here. Can someone move that? Someone. Okay, support it. Any discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All present office bearers, of course, can stay.
need a motion regarding the examination of Elder Darrell DeVries. Make a motion that he not sustain, that he did not sustain the formula subscription examination. We're missing a, a He's member. cutting ballots. Okay. Okay, the motion is do not sustain, motion not to sustain the formula of, that seems oddly worded to me. The mover is open to improvements. Motion that he did not sustain the formula of subscription examination. I guess we'll go with that. Is that supported? Support. All right, the motion on the floor is that he did not sustain the exam. You had a question? I think we should wait for yeah. Elder to cut. Yeah. Can, can somebody else in the assembly cut ballots maybe yeah. for can us? Someone go cut ballots. sustain the formula of subscription examination. Is there uh, questions or comments about that topic? I have a question in regards to what does this motion pertain? The yay or nay of this examination? Alright, so if you vote for this examination, then I believe that the classes would recommend his suspension to sovereign. That would be a recommendation from classes for suspension from office or suspension as a delegate here at classes. So he wouldn't he wouldn't be seated anymore as a delegate? Correct. And then the class classes don't suspend. Right. Consistories do. And we would recommend his suspension and then sovereign would involve second, which is the nearest consistory, in his suspension. There's a, there's a debate whether once classes recommends suspension, uh, another consistory needs to be involved. We can discuss that and probably should decide on that. But the, the implication of voting yes is that classes recommends to Sovereign his suspension. Sovereign can choose or not to choose, choose or not choose to do that. If they don't, they would have to protest or leave the denomination. Um, a question that I, I have, I think we need to consider it, is how long Elder DeVries has been in the office of Elder. Um, has he ever, has he been Elder before? Has he occupied the office of Elder before? So, okay. Um, I find in the brother's answers what seems to me to be a difficulty in understanding the nature of the questions. Um, I understand, first of all, that he's very nervous. Understand, secondly, that he feels his back is up against a wall. And most importantly, I am not sure of his um, ability in this frame of mind to understand exactly what is happening and um, what the nature of these questions are what they signify. Now, 
on the one hand, what has to affect the way I look at the answers to those questions is how, how experienced is he? Um, what he, how he's processing the, these questions. What is striking to me is that he is in the office of elder, which requires certain capabilities to um, think, to uh, reason, and to communicate. And I'm torn between understanding that what he has presented demonstrates that perhaps he should not have been placed in office. I think we have to, we have to think about that. Um, this church is organized only so recently. We took the decision to organize and, in effect, approved these men for office. And we ought to bear that weight. But it doesn't change the fact that the answers that we received in my judgment were less than satisfactory. Um, to me especially, that latter question concerning the authority of the Reformed Confessions is a very simple, simple question that should be, be able to be answered very simply and um, without hesitation. But especially given that, that question, I had wondered in, in the brother's explanation whether or not he understands the distinction between power and authority. That the power of scripture is the power of the creeds and confessions. And the authority is not the same. The authority of scripture is primary authority. The authority of the creeds is secondary authority. Um, and I'm still wondering if the brother can account uh, for that distinction as he understands it and know that um, it's not so much a matter of power, but authority. Do the creeds have uh, authority in the church? That's all. Do you want? Him, are you looking for an answer, or is talking to us? Uh, I'd like. I'd like to have some clarification from uh, fellow delegates on on that. Okay. Um, it'll help me settle in my mind. Comments? Yes. If I understood those comments correctly, there's a concern that the exam, the answers to the examination do, may not reflect the convictions of the brother due to whatever circumstances um, as I as I listen to answers and tried to get to the heart of things, I think I was hearing conviction. I do think there is nerves and whatever else may come into it. But for me, that's the question. Were the brother's convictions expressed by him? And if those were, then I believe we could judge. If other delegates believe they were not, then we may have to table this and set another time when we might think some of those impediments may be removed. But as I as I heard, I thought I was hearing conviction. Any further comments? Otherwise, I'm going to call for the vote. Singapore. Okay, I can't see. Tiana? You're going to have to send each of you an email to 
Deacon Wilcher. Craig. Craig. That's not a secret, really. Reverend Lannan was cutting in and out in that last bit. Could the chair summarize yeah. uh, what Reverend Thomas heard? So Reverend Lanning, uh, in answer to Reverend Vanderwall's inquiry, whether we felt that there was uh, nerves that came into play so that he wasn't able to express what he really believed, Reverend Lanning responded to that, that what he heard was conviction that the brother did, despite whatever the circumstances were of the, the questioning, the brother did state what he believed with regard to those two questions, and that Reverend Lanning was able to vote. Yes. Is this simple procedure, or are we required to speak if we plan to vote contrary to the motion on I, the floor? I believe if you're going to vote contrary to it, you should say so. What, what would be the point of balance then? Because you have to try to convince us of why we shouldn't vote for it. You don't have to tell me you're not going to vote for it, but you've got to try to convince me. And this is a deliberative body. The reality is you may try to convince me and then be convinced by somebody else that you should vote yes. Nick? The meeting of the committee with Sovereign's consistory, I think nerves were a little bit less of a, of a play in that. And I don't know how much I can speak to that about what was said in our committee work, but I don't have it written down here, so maybe the committee can help me remember this better. We did ask the brother of the weightiness of the confessions and their guide for us, not only as their, not only as a guide, I shouldn't say, but as their, the weight that they hold along with scripture. And his conviction was much more to the affirmative in our meeting that, that these confessions do that way as the scripture. I don't know if that is out of place that we can take that into context at all that came out of our meeting with the consistory. I, I just, I, I would hesitate to recommend suspension of a man. Well, I don't believe that is his conviction that the Heidelberg Catechism doesn't hold the weight Scripture. I don't believe that from our discussions with him. And that may be subjective to my own opinion, but that's what I gathered from our meeting with Sovereign's Consistory and our committee work. May I, may I just speak briefly without relenting the chair? It's not a large point. In the deliberation that we heard, the question that was put to him is Do you believe the Scriptures are an earth number? And he said, but they did that in the PRC, and they never quoted the second part, which is what, in comparison to Scripture. A reformed man may not have that view of the creeds. We're never comparing the creeds to Scripture. The creeds flow out of Scripture. The creeds have their authority because they faithfully summarize. You may never pit the creeds against Scripture. And that's not what we promised in the formula of Scripture. We can decide a doctrinal issue strictly on the basis of the creeds. Why? Because they have some status in comparison to Scripture? Absolutely not. And if that's the attitude, then we, we, did, we don't belong signing the formulas of Scripture. They flow out of Scripture. They give the doctrine of Scripture. So that the 
phrase in comparison to Scripture does not save the disparagement of the creeds as a nerf gun. Any further? Yes. Just in response to the questions about, you know, is he able, able to answer these things, he could speak now and say he could damn that statement about the creeds being a nerf gun. I do, for what that does to the creeds and to a reformed man. So you could take up the sword against that statement. And that would help us. But we simply, a man can't serve in office having that conception of the creeds. Not just because he vows to uphold the doctrine found in the creeds, but how can we decide here as a body? How are we one with that conception of the three forms of unity? I contend we're not. I contend it's not reform. So there's a path forward here. All of us are, we're all listening very carefully. So I'll stop there. If there's no further comments, I am going to call for the ballot vote. Uh, those who are from outside should in some way send a message to Deacon Wiltshire. And those here should write yes if they believed he did not sustain the examination or no if you believe that he sustained it. Is everybody clear on what you're voting on? Yes, if he did not sustain it. No, if you believe he sustained it. Go ahead.
Yes. 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 No. Yes. No. Yes. 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 The motion carries. Next uh, order of business would be to pass a motion to recommend to Sovereign to move to his suspension. Uh, and I believe in that motion we ought to discuss whether they have to get the neighboring consistory involved. that we advise Sovereign RPC to suspend Mr. Daryl DeVries from the Office of Elder in consultation with the consistory of second RPC on the ground that Mr. DeVries did not sustain his formula of subscription uh, exam. Right. Does everybody have that? Motion to advise Sovereign RPC to suspend Mr. Daryl DeVries from the Office of Elder in consultation or I, think, I think in consultation with 2nd RPC on the ground that Mr. DeVries did not sustain his formula of subscription exam. Any further deliberation on the motion? Yes. Is that our intent to suspend or remove? Just going to Article 79 of the Church Order. Yeah. So cheerfully submit. They shall be examined, ready always cheerfully to submit to the judgment of the consistory classes and Senate after, under the penalty in case of refusal to be by that very fact suspended from our office. So I think you first have to move to suspension then you can decide, uh, the two consistories would decide where to go from there. Yes. I, ju I just want to point out at the, uh, the end of the formula subscription does give the right, reserves the right of an appeal uh, whenever we shall believe ourselves aggrieved by the sentence of consistory classes or synod. And until a decision is made upon such an appeal, we will acquiesce in the determination and judgment already passed. That's correct. Yes. Under suspension, does he maintain the right to appeal? Yes. Only in his own case. All right. I'm going to call for the question. All in favor say aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries.
Daryl, this is really serious. our unity is in the creeds. It's in the truth of the creed. And I would plead with you that you reconsider your positions. That you don't harden yourself against the judgment of the classes. But that you reconsider those positions and see that those positions are wrong. And that you adopt the thinking that was expressed in the motions today. But your consistory obviously now is going to have to work with you on those, on those matters. And is there, any, is there anything else? Anybody? All right, then I think you are, yes. I would just say in parting, does this not strike anyone as kind of odd that this whole thing started 17 minutes? Classes got started today. And I know I, you said. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that that comments are out of order. It's militating against our decision. Okay. And I also want to say this to you: this didn't start 17 minutes before classes. This started a long time ago. It started months and maybe even years ago. And it is your view of the creeds wrong. It's not reformed. If it is your view of the Christian school, it's wrong. It's not reformed. It's independentism. It's selfishness. And the reality of what's happening to you right now is, is the truth of your position. So you are dismissed. Proceed to the formula of subscription examination for Elder Jeff Andriga. Same questions. Jeff, do you believe that the Good Christian School institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord Day 38? Yes. Jeff, what are your convictions about the authority of the Reformed Confessions as binding on the life of the believer? I believe they maintain and uphold the authority of the scriptures. And as you confessed before the deliberation today, that the matters discussed could be decided based on confessions. All right. Are there any follow-up questions for Jeff? Todd? It's also in of one main question. Do you love the schools, the Christian schools, and see to it that they are upheld in our churches? Yes. And as a follow-up too, could the brother discuss the difference between must and may with regard to the Christian schools and explain his stance? Now, on that, right, Jeff. Yep. In the deliberations of today, and even in the meetings with the committee, I understand now that that has to be a must for the strength that it carries. I'm wondering if Elder Andringa can answer the question, does he recognize good Christian school institution as being the Christian school institution that the church has viewed that to mean for the last 400 years, or does he view that as being a home school? Elder Andringa? I believe what we've identified as the school that we've
any further questions? Reverend Lang. Um, are there any reservations regarding the must that the brother believes he has to clear up either in his own conscience yet or in his own study? Or is the brother convicted of the must over against the may? That was a lengthy discussion in the forming of our school board about that word. And at that time, we did have the word may in there for purpose that was explained. And yeah, I see now that the must has explained to me and today is what I maintain. Any other questions, comments, clarifications? I don't want to rush anybody if there are issues that you, you want clarified or questions you have that I'll wait, but if you're ready to cast your ballot, let's move to casting ballots. We'll move to casting ballots. What is motion? Oh, sorry. Motion. Go ahead, Reverend. Uh, motion that Elder Andringa sustained his formula of subscription examination. Supported. All right. Then you can cast your ballots. You explain what we're voting for because the yes will mean different than it the means. The yes now means completely differently. It means that he sustained. Yes, he sustained, or no, he did not sustain. Yes. 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 
that was a unanimous sustaining of the exam. Jeff, we're, we rejoice with you that you stand one with us in the truth of creeds. And we commend you now to the hard work that you're going to have to do, which is the discipline of one of your office bearers. And pray that the Lord sustain you and he can alternate in that. And I want to assure you now, too, that the second stands ready to help in any way that we can. And so we should get together on that and begin to labor on that. And I also want to say something about this whole matter that was treated today. This was a matter that was necessary to settle in the churches. I believe that this decision was a bulwark for the gospel, the covenant, the school, and the church. This decision allowed the school to be preached, to be preached as the school must be preached, to be preached as something from God, and not something that's merely a good idea, but something that God wants and commands his church to do. And it's that preaching of the school that is also going to bring up the desire and solidify that desire in the mind of the people. And I want to say to the elders and the deacons that are seated here, demand the preaching of the school. Demand it from whoever comes to preach to you. Demand it from your own minister. And demand that it be preached as that which comes from God. And then also that which God blesses in that congregation. So that I can see this decision, as hard as it was, to be a decision for the flourishing of the gospel, of the covenant, of the church and of the school in our churches. This was a, a decision, too, that really was something that was left over from our old denomination. This question was never settled, and it led to unrest and trouble in the churches. And it muzzled preachers, it muzzled elders. And the Lord has used this situation to bring this issue before the churches. And I'm thankful for it. And I rejoice. We now have to move on to other matters. Men, it's 5 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock. We have until 6 before dinner. My question is after dinner. And really the question is this. I have to assign all the material to the agenda. Do you want me to assign that material so that you then go to work on it to come back tonight? Or do you want me to assign the material, everybody goes home, and we come back tomorrow morning to finish the agenda? I would like to see you assign the material and the committees exert themselves to bring advice because there are those here who are here to hear protests and appeals and I have particularly J, K, L, and M on the agenda and if we just agree to come back tomorrow that puts them in a burdensome position okay. whereas it's possible that we come back and they can discuss it tonight so they can be here for that. So okay, I'm, I'm going to divvy up the material right now. <clears throat> Material is as follows, divided as follows. This is this is the only material that I thought needed to be in committee and thought the rest of it could be handled on the floor in open session. So the overture, Reverend Lanny, Nick Milker, and Lee Wilcher. I'm putting together the Rainey appeal, the court of protest, and the dues of the protest because they deal with similar issues. 
and I'm assigning Reverend Martin Vanderwall, Andy Burkett, and Clint Milker. Then the Klein appeal. Oh, I'm sorry. Finance, Sister Church, and the Orthodox Reformed Protestant Churches letter to Dewey Inglesma, Todd Ferguson, and Felix Chan. And then the Klein appeal to Jim Seertsma, Al Kicker, and Dylan Altman. I have is for Felix. Is he able to keep cruising through the night? Or does he want I can assign somebody else? That's fine. He's, uh, he's six o'clock in the morning. Uh, I want a <laughs> assign okay, I'm, I'm going to assign somebody else. And I'm going to assign uh, Ben Tolsworth. Everybody have that? You want it again? I have it again. Have it again. The Overture, Reverend Lanning, Nick Milker, and Lee Wilcher. The Rainey Appeal, Courtney Protest, and Dusima Protest. Reverend Vanderwall, Andy Burkett, and Clint Milker. The Klein Appeal, Dylan Oltena, Jim Seertsma, and Al Kicker. Then Finance Committee, Church, Sister Church, and ORPC Letter, Dewey Inglesma, Ben Tolsma, and Todd Ferguson. Yes. Is it a, so finance, I'm part of that committee from first? Is Perfect. It, okay. I think Alderman Barron was all last year. I did it last year, Dewey. Okay. Let's try. Let's try. All right, then we are going to uh, recess. We are going to recess until supper, and then after supper, and I'm hoping somebody has something to report. Give, up, give us a time. If supper's at 6, should we reconvene at 7? 6.45. Eat your food and get back in here. Online have all the documents. If you could just indicate to me that you have them all, that would be appreciated. Just got emailed. They just got emailed, so you may have to click F9 a few times. What are we missing? And mention has received ours. All right, thank you. We are missing the client. Committee's report. We're going to be printing it off right now. Did you just get that? I did not. Okay. I'm going to print it right now.
We have received them too. Thank you. Thank you. For the sake of the gallery, the very first thing we're going to be treating is a matter that came on first credentials, and that will be in closed session. It's a matter of discipline. So I will be declaring uh, closed session shortly, but we can open the session with prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we call upon thee as the great God of the covenant, who from eternity to eternity the same abides in thy own glorious covenant fellowship, and hast in thy good pleasure given us all of thine elect to Jesus Christ as the head and mediator of the covenant. We thank thee that in thy covenant love thou hast united us to thyself in Christ, and that thou hast also united us one to another. We thank thee, Father, for the love of the covenant, thy love for us, and the gift of thy spirit that we may love thee and love one another. We thank thee that the classes in this day would be busy, the glorious truth of that covenant, and the glorious application of that covenant in the Christian school. We rejoice before thee, Father, and thank thee for the great victory of the truth and unity in the truth that thou hast delivered to thy churches. We beseech thee now as we take up the material of the evening, thou wilt give us that spirit of Christ yet, that covenant spirit of Christ, that we who are ignorant and blind may be illuminated and may see, that we who are by nature unrighteous may be righteous in Christ and may be granted that we may judge righteously. Remember those who speak and bring material. We may submit ourselves together to the great gospel of our Lord and the truth of thy word for thy glory and for the church's good. Forgive our iniquities you who are the chief of all sinners may know the righteousness and obedience of Christ as our own. Keep us from sin, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, Chairman declares closed session. We have that uh, recommendation from Sovereign with its grounds. And then we have a membership list and a letter from the fellowship. Uh, can we have a recommendation to adopt the recommendation of Sovereign? For the organization of Sovereign with its grounds for the organization of Loveland. So moved. The motion is to adopt. Yes, Reverend Lanning. I'll support that, but I'd like to add the three grounds from page nine from um, Loveland. So there would be eight grounds total. Andy, can you support that? Yes, I will. All right. The motion then is to adopt the 
the recommendation of Sovereign to organize Loveland with the grounds of Sovereign and the grounds from the fellowship. Yes. Pages seven and nine for those who want to follow. Page seven and nine of the agenda. <clears throat> yes. So it looks like number three and number one are duplicated. Is it necessary to, or should we have things that are duplicated? You said number three of what? I'm sorry, on page nine. Okay. Regarding the office bearers, yeah. there's enough qualified men. Yeah. It appears that that's covered. I'm, I'm happy to add it if that's. I, I think they'll but, say two different things. One is <clears throat> location of office bearers, and the other is qualified men. Okay. Do we all understand it's the recommendation of sovereign with its grounds plus the grounds from the fellowship? I think our one. Representative from Loveland has left the building. All right. Any discussion on the motion? Should we table this until he's here? Because we can cover it tomorrow, and that's maybe why he's here, and maybe he wants to speak to it? He's got to leave by noon tomorrow. Okay. Discussion? Otherwise, I'll call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Wisconsin Fellowship. <coughs> there should be a motion to formally instruct us or some other congregation to take the oversight. I'll make that motion to appoint second to take the oversight of the Wisconsin Fellowship. Is that supported? Right. Any discussion? Uh, how does that square with the letter on page 10? It says, we inform you that we have taken oversight. Um, maybe the motion could be that class is approved, and then the ground would be Article 39 of the church order. Can I say something to that? So we believe that a local church and receive a request for help and do that work by itself up to the point of classes. And so while we have taken oversight, and that's our right to do that, once classes comes, then we have to see what classes wants to do. That's our position. So that the motion to instruct us to take the oversight is the proper motion. We have only taken oversight as an individual congregation, just simply because we had a request for help. Is there any further discussion? Uh, motion is to appoint second to take the oversight, you can even add on behalf of classes or something like that, of the Wisconsin Reformed Protestant Fellowship.
discussion. We'll call for the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Um, I'm going to suggest that we move to the overture appeals and protests. Uh, at, at a later time, will, will there be an um, opportunity for the chairman to recognize the receiving of sovereign as a new church, and uh, not sovereign, of uh, Loveland church that we just voted for? How are we going to do that? I don't know. I'll think about it. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to the overture, the protests, and the appeals. I think everybody's here that wants to be here, so let's have at it. We're going to take the overture first. Uh, who's reporting? The report that I'm reading has at the top of the first page committee regarding church order article 21 overture and it's a front and back recommendation one and this would follow pages 42 through 44 in the agenda, 42 through 44. Recommendation one, that class is declared the overture from first PRC of Edmonton to be legally before it, ground the requirements of Article 30 and Article 86 of the church order have been satisfied. <coughs> Recommendation two, that class has not sustained the overture. Ground A, the overture does not proceed from the confessional and church orderly doctrine of the schools which is that the schools arise out of, are founded upon, and are required by God's covenant of grace with believers and their seed, who as a result of that covenant love God and each other, instruct the covenant seed, look upon one another's things, and seek the advantage and salvation of each other. Lord's Days 21, 38, Church Order 21, 41, Baptism Vow, and Acts 4, verse 32. In contrast, the overture proceeds from the premise that families in the church may be independent from each other in the rearing of their children. The overture speaks of denominations that, quote, honor these par those parents' convictions who homeschool their children, end quote, from ground six. Ground B, the overture does not proceed from the confessional and church orderly doctrine that the lives and callings of God's people and their families are subject to the oversight of Christ's watchmen, Belgic Confession 30 and Lord's Day 39. In contrast, the overture proceeds from the premise that parental authority over their children is independent of the consistory's oversight. The overture states that the use of the church's authority, quote, for seeing to it that there are good Christian schools is both improper and transgresses the boundary of God-given parental authority and the relative derived authority of school societies and school boards, end quote. And ground C, the eight grounds of the protest do not support the protest. Ground one, Article 21 does not contradict Article 30 because Article 21 does not make the operation of the school the consistory's work. Rather, Article 21 teaches the consistory's oversight of the parents in the parents' calling to establish and use the schools. Ground two misrepresents the consistory's calling to see to it. The consistory seeing to it does not take away the parent's responsibility to establish and use the good Christian schools, nor does it give that responsibility to the consistory. The article makes the school the parent's work, quote, in which the parents shall have their children instructed, end quote. Rather, see to it teaches the consistory's oversight of the parents in the parent's calling to establish and use good Christian schools. Ground three. Belgian Confession Article 32 does not exclude the parent from the church's exercise of the spiritual power of the keys. The church's exercise of key power with regard to the parent is not an intrusion into the covenant home, but recognizes that the believer, according to his baptismal vows, is subject to oversight also in his rearing of his children. 
Ground four, the original wording of Article 21 by Middleburg in 1581 is due to the fact that there were state-run schools in the Netherlands. Our fathers dealt with that circumstance by calling for godly school masters. Just because congregation is used instead of consistory and school master is used instead of good Christian schools, the fact is that the church was to see to it that those in charge of the school were fulfilling their calling in the rearing of the covenant seed. Ground five. The controversy in the PRC over Article 21 did not reveal any weakness in Article 21, but it did reveal weakness in the PRC. The fact that the PRC made a hash of Article 21 does not mean that the RPC should discard the article. Ground six. The church orders of other reformed churches have no bearing on the doctrine of the schools as that is maintained in the RPC. The fact that other denominations allow their parents to live in opposition to forming and using a Christian school does not speak to the weakness of Article 21, but to the disobedience of those denominations. Ground seven. If there is any compromise to the, quote, organic support of a school society, the close government of a school board, and parental responsibility for the cause of covenant education, end quote, that compromise does not come from Article 21, but from a consistory's and congregation's refusal to live up to Article 21. The language of Article 21 is not ambiguous, sitting where it does among the other articles of the church order and alongside the Reformed Confessions. Ground 8. When Article 21 re was revised in 1914, the revision did not merely address whether God's people could use public schools or should have their own Christian schools. Rather, the revision continued to address the one great issue in the whole matter of Christian schooling, the covenant. The great issue of the covenant in the rearing of the covenant seed, addressed in the version of the church order both before 1914 and after 1914, will never become obsolete. Now until glory, the covenant of God remains the firm foundation of the Christian school, the solemn demand of the Christian school, and the powerful cause of the believer's spontaneous, joyful, and thankful formation of the Christian school. In Christ's service, the committee. I move recommendation one that we declare it legally before us. All right, recommendation one is on the floor. Any discussion on recommendation one? Supported. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I move recommendation two that class does not sustain the overture with the three grounds A, B, and C. Is there support or <coughs> right, discussion? Um, C should have the word protest changed to overture, I believe. Correct. In some respects, the grounds brought up here speak to the fact that the Reformed Confessions uh, themselves support uh, good Christian school institutions without Article 21. All these references uh, that are given were in place before 1914. And uh, this overture is not at all to, to be considered an attack on uh, good Christian school institutions in the churches. It's, those become clear from all these, these references uh, that are evident. The main point of the overture is that Article 21 
does not uh, fit in with the church order as the church order. In looking at the relationship of a church as an ecclesiastical body, and in particular the ecclesiastical assemblies of consistory, uh, classes, and synod, and relating them directly to the institution of the Christian school, so that the parental obligation and responsibility as it's stated in the overture, is more clearly um, delineated from the parents. And that does not remove the consistory's work uh, in things like family visitation and uh, visiting parents that are neglecting this instruction. With regard to that notification, I think that does lay the finger on why we began with ground one. That as the, the committee's conviction is that there is a doctrine of the schools, a confessional church orderly doctrine of the schools, and that the approach to Article 21 then ought to proceed from that doctrine of the schools. And that as we looked at the overture, the overture actually proceeded from a different premise. The church orderly confessional doctrine of the schools is that the schools arise out of and are required by the covenant. The premise of the overture is that families in the church may be independent from each other in the rearing of their children. And that especially comes out in the favorable reference to homeschool and honoring parents' convictions who homeschool. And I think it's the second ground that actually gets closer to the comments of the previous speaker that the church order and the confessions also have a doctrine of the oversight of the parent. And the overture does not proceed from that viewpoint of the overture or, or the oversight of the parent. <clears throat> in fact, there are statements in the overture that will not allow key authority of the church, the key power of the church, the church's authority to enter into the parents' decisions with regard to the rearing of their children. So there's some premises in the overture that depart from and do not proceed out of the confessions doctrine of the schools. And that we believe that that's what led to the eight grounds that are in the overture. The eight grounds in the overture simply don't resemble the confessions on the school and the oversight of school. Reverend Vanderwall. Um, I'd like to see two assertions demonstrated. One is that the overture was favorable to homeschooling rather than an observation. And the second, how the overture and either the uh, concept of the overture or the grounds will not allow uh, the work, as it was stated, of, of a consistory. Is it to be understood that Article 21 is the only mechanism that there is um, in all our confessions uh, in all of scripture that allows for this oversight. Anybody on that?
42 to 44. Any other discussion on the overture? Just ground two, I'm trying to understand what is my calling then? How do I see too that there are good Christian schools as an elder? As ground two here says, the article makes the school the parents work, yet I'm confused how as an elder, I can see, too, that there is one, and it yet be the parents' work. I can answer that very simply. Uh, elders have two main callings. One is the oversight of the preaching. And the other is the oversight of the lives of the members, especially in family visitation. And the exercise of the elder's office is with the word. And so therefore, seeing to it in the article means bring the word to bear on the issue of the school in your church. And you do that two ways. You bring the word to bear to see to it that the minister is preaching it. And secondly, you see to it that the word is brought to bear when you go in and out of the congregation. So... That scene to it has to take, be taken, 21 needs to be taken in its context of where it sits in the church order. It's, it's explaining the offices and assemblies. And that article reflects the Reformed conviction, A, of the necessity of the school, and B, of the church's right to be involved in seeing to that. Just very quickly from Vandalen Munsma. How can consistories best carry out the charge of Article 21? Answer, they can urge the minister and all the members of the consistory to promote the cause of their personal con in their personal context with the parents. But consistories should especially urge the ministers to remember this cause in their sermons. The word of God certainly demands Christian instruction. These demands should be preached wisely, timely, but also persistently in places where parents are neglectful. I don't know who's first. We'll get Dewey and then Lee. And so in response to that question about seeing to it, I had to be instructed by my fellow office bearers on this point because I thought see to it was mainly that, so for example, when we formed, we called a, a meeting of the congregation to discuss the Christian schools. I forget the exact wording of that, but it was based on Article 21. From that, an ad hoc committee was formed and then a school board. And then I and my folly thought that was our seeing to it. Um, but it was pointed out to me by fellow office elders that it's the preaching of the word, that that is that constant ongoing seeing to it and admonishment. So we see to it that our young people date and marry in the Lord. And we see to it that many things take place in the lives of our uh, members. And this is one of those ways where the preaching speaks to that and must speak to that and teach the good Christian schools. So I think that's probably far more primary than even calling one meeting maybe in your lifetime to get a school started. Me? Reverend Vanderwall asked that it be demonstrated where the favorable references to homeschooling were. Ground six of the overture um, is talking about the various church overtures. on to say it is noteworthy that these latter two do not draw a relationship between the consistories and the 
Christian school institutions, but between consistories and parents of school-age children. It is also evident from personal experience that these denominations honor those parents' convictions who homeschool their children. And then, in ground eight, background of the revision of Article 21 by the CRC in 1914 demonstrates that the circumstances which made the revision are no longer present. At that time, attendance at school institutions, public and private, was required by state law. However, with the advent of homeschooling and its increasing popularity, education in the regular institutions is no longer compulsory but left to the judgment of parents. So much has this state control relaxed that parents are now free to allow their children to explore and choose their own education. Um, if I can respond to that, those are brought up in the overture as observations and not as uh, passing judgment on them as, as favorable. Ferguson, Cornerstone. Deacon. Deacon, sorry. In our churches, it's about the same. Uh, so, I agree with what the committee has brought for, for the, I think that the overture fails because it doesn't prove what it needs to prove. Um, as far as A and B go, I just have a very different reading of the origin. Uh, I won't see in the overture there's reasons to question uh, where the overture comes from. In ground A, the overture does not proceed from, and in ground B, the overture does not proceed from. I, I did see that in the overture. Uh, I agree with what our panel has said that the overture gave observations, but I did not read in those observations the consistory children regarding that. So, from that point of view, I don't believe it comes from a particular direction. But I would agree that the overture fails to prove its point, which is that the article must be removed. Um, to that point, I think it's the burden of the overture to prove its point. Um, it's calling for that. It's calling for the removal of Article 21. And yet, uh, I would agree with the recommendation that it does not uh, you know, carry that burden of proof. So I'd be in favor of, of the of C. I, I do appreciate the positive teaching of A and B. But I didn't see those contradicted by the overture. Just a technical question, am I? allowed to vote, or are the delegates of Edmonton allowed to vote on this as an overture? I don't think so. Do you agree with that? That's kind of how you're bringing your own thing. I don't think we voted on our overture. Right. Yeah, I wonder about that. You're not allowed to vote in your own case for this overture your own case. It's possible that through deliberation the delegates come and are convicted a different way than they brought. So I could go either way, but I guess I'd be inclined that the delegates at this assembly all vote. Okay. We can go with that. I don't think there's any principle compromise. 
you don't really have a case, you have a suggestion. Okay. Right? I would like to have their votes present. All right. Is there any other further discussion on the overture and the recommendation of the committee? Just to be clear, um, confessing my own lack of understanding on the word school, it's my understanding through the deliberations this morning and through this that that form can look like many different things so long as it is together, so long as it is to the education of our children, so long as it is our covenantal desire to rear these children up to, in the Lord together in a mechanism? Or am I wrong? Form can change. Right. I'm not sure how that bears on the overture. Because if this is a calling to see to it, um, for some, myself included, and I'm trying to learn that school doesn't mean what I've grown up knowing that school meant something. It doesn't come with a form in the in the word, but that it will take church as needed there. I, I ask, I just I want to learn. Maybe not here. Start a school. <laughs> you know, I, I think asking for a definition of the school is like asking one plus one equals two. It's, it's, there's something of an accident. It has its definition built into its word, into the word. Pla a place or institution of learning. Any further, are there further questions, comments, thoughts, clarifications, Reverend Lanning? There has been some discussion about grounds A and B that those grounds <coughs> impute a certain place from which the overture proceeds. And I think I detect that at classes right now, we are in a different place than we were at 8 a.m. this morning. Over the last weeks, as this overture and the agenda made its rounds, there was a lot of discussion and debate about the overture. Um, some of that discussion and debate questioned the whether homeschooling was legitimate as an option, questioned whether the good Christian school really was a demand of the covenant. Now, the weakness of the overture in that regard is that it didn't give us that specific ground. It did not address the issue of the demand of the covenant. And I think that was the issue. That was the issue all along. And I think in the overture itself, there is evidence that that was the issue even in the overture, even though it didn't explicitly say so, there was that evidence there. I take what's at the end of ground six, for example, as somewhat more than a bare report or observation of what other denominations were doing. In those denominations, there's a school, and there are families that say to that school, no, we will not be part of that school. We will not 
use that school, we are going to homeschool. That, that decision to homeschool is more than, than simply a decision. This is how we're going to educate our children. It's not only saying yes to something, homeschooling, it's saying no to the school, no for our family. And that's reported this way. It is also evident from personal experience that these denominations honor those parents' convictions who homeschool their children. With other material in the overture uh, saying to the consistory, stay out, don't use the key power with regard to the school, I see that as more than a bare neutral report. Why isn't it this way? It is also evident from personal experience that these denominations connive at those parents' disobedience who homeschool their children. That's a judgment. Connive at disobedience. That tells you where someone stands. So also does honor those parents' convictions. That's why ground A is what it is. There is a doctrine of the school in the confessions and the church order. And when you stand on that doctrine of the school and the confessions and the church order, and then the doctrine also of the consistory's oversight of parents, when you stand on those doctrines, an overture does not look like this. This proceeds from something different. And we've tried to demonstrate that with a couple of quotes in ground A and B uh, without getting into uh, every word or every quotation that we might, we might have been able to make. And I think that's even evident in the eight grounds of the overture that there's a certain place this is proceeding from. As a committee, when we're working with these eight grounds, there's times when we're scratching our heads because it was almost like there's a grasping for anything you can find to hand to make a ground. Key power, Article 30, confusion of the language, the PRC and what they did with it what every other denomination does with it. It struck me as a, a grasping for anything to hand. And there wouldn't be that if you proceed from the position. There's a doctrine of the school. And there's a doctrine of the consistory's oversight of the parents and their use of the school. So I can, I can hear understand the consistory didn't necessarily intend to betray a certain position. But as I read through this, and as the committee looked at it, we thought they're not proceeding from where they need to proceed. So that those first two grounds are helpful to us to see where we need to proceed from in interpreting Article 21 and the whole matter of the school. Thank you. Anything further? Singapore. Uh, Tien? You're muted. muted. Still muted. Hi. Yep. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I would like to ask about point six of the overture. Since Reverend Benderwald said that it is just an observation. And if it was just an observation, what is the point of point six? Like, what is it trying to drive at? Because otherwise, my reading of point six of the overture would be the same as the end and the others.
is for information, knowing that what these different churches did with different denominations did with their church order um, out of um, the, revision, the different revisions made in comparison to what the CRC made in 1914 and who shares them. Um, so that the um, CRC, the PRC, and the H, HRC have it, and that's formed from 1914, and the, um, it didn't make it in there that um, the NRC still has the original one. further we had considered putting something into the effect of um, understanding that there are many of these other references but we knew that it wouldn't be grounds and for removing the overture it simply would be, um, it would be a parallel line, but we didn't think it would be considered as a ground. I didn't follow that. Could you say that oh, again? That we, we could have expressed that the sentiment that is present concerning the covenant and good Christian schools uh, could be stated from other, from other grounds, in scripture and the creeds. But... Uh, we felt that that wouldn't have supported the, the character of the overture itself. All right. Any, anything else? There's nothing further. not to sustain with its three grounds. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. The motion uh, carries. The overture is not sustained with its grounds. Phil Rainey has appealed to classes his, quote, charge of false doctrine against the sermons that they are denial of the biblical doctrine of man, of the incarnation, of the church institute, and of church ordinances, unquote. Recommendation that classes declare that the protestant is not being charged with the sin of legalism by the consistory of First Reformed Protestant Church, for the consistory to state that Philip's protest, quote, teaches the same legalism that the consistory is currently battling, unquote, is not to charge one with the sin of legalism. Two, the classes, that classes does not sustain Philip's appeal. Grounds, 
the consistory of First Reformed Protestant Church has comprehensively addressed and answered all of the contentions that Philip has expressed. Move one. I'll move one. Support. All right. Discussion? Yes. Um, it's not in the recommendations, but may we recommend that it be approved legally here? Yeah, that should be first. I apologize. I, that was my oversight. Uh, so I'll make a motion that we uh, recognize the appeal as being legally before this body. Because grounds 30 and 31 have been met. Yeah. I'll get the verbiage down. Got that lead. Motion. To recommend to classes that the appeal is legally here. We can have the same thing on this one. Obviously, yeah, they treated right. it on the grounds of that Articles 30 and 31 of the church order has been met. Have been met. I think they got it. The next one. Salvation will be declared. Declared. Legally. supported any discussion on that all in favor say aye aye, aye. 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 Oh, same sign appeal is before us move recommendation now two which would be that classes declare that the protestant is not being charged with the sin of legalism etc with this crown is that so moved so moved supported all right that's on the floor Why was this question answered into separate from the appeal proper? So is there a reason why this issue was separated out and a statement is made about it? Not necessarily challenging the content of it, but just wonder why this is singled out from the rest of the appeal. Can committee speak to that? I think for the sake of clarification that um, it's not the, it's not the fact that the consistory is turning around with uh, counter charges and that's part of what the protest alleges and to make it very clear uh, and distinctly in its own point that it's part of the refutation and reason given by the consistory not to sustain his protest. And it's not meant to be uh, the use of the keys of the kingdom. All right. Any further discussion on this, just this point? Uh, Dewey and then Philip. I was just going to suggest that Mr. Rainey should be given the right of speed. Yeah, he has the right floor. Mike him. So, uh, I'm afraid the other delegates are not going to be able to hear him. Is there a mobile microphone or not? David? My point is... <coughs> You'll have to come by a microphone, Philip. So you have to, other you have to stand right here. Or sit. There's the microphone right here. Right, so my point is um, to teach legalism would that not be false doctrine? The point is not the, 
protest against the consistory and what um, the Protestant is saying to the consistory about whether or not the consistory might be legalistic or not in teaching what's here alleged to be false doctrine. But the point that we're making here is that the Protestant is not being charged by the consistory with the sin of legalism. Distinction is between a formal charge of sin and the judgment that one's position is the same legalism. In other words, I might take this motion to read. You haven't been charged with legalism. They, they have judged that your position is legalism, <coughs> but you've never been formally charged. So as right, so we. So you can teach false doctrine and uh, get away with it. Well, right now you're in the process of protest and appeal, and you might not get away with it after that's been judged, but the consistory may characterize your position with the hope that you will hear them without charging you with sin. And in fact, it's required of them as a consistory judgment of your protest to tell you that without you saying you charged me with sin. Well, no, not yet. We are characterizing your position. Is there a hand over here? Yeah, it was It was the feeling of the committee that the consistory was admonishing Mr. Rainey that his position leads to legalism. It was admonishing him to not pursue that position, but it was not, as Mr. Rainey alleges here, the counter, the consistory rejected my arguments and they countercharged me with grievous sin. And we did not see that they had countercharged with grievous sin. They had admonished you to, or admonished Mr. Rainey to avoid grievous sin and even told him what grievous sin to avoid. But that's an admonishment, admonishing a brother in love is different than countercharging. That was the feeling of the committee. This discussion makes me wonder whether this recommendation really ought to be dropped. When an appeal comes, I don't know that it's necessary class's job to um, decide for the Protestant history, what stage their whole work is at, but rather the, the Protestant has a judgment. He says, this is what I judge to be the truth, and the consistory has a judgment. It says, no, we judge that this is the truth, and now that comes to class. It's not for us to say, now here's uh, what they mean, and here's what you mustn't take it to mean. Classes says, who's right? Who's right? Who's teaching the truth? Well, that brings me to my second point. Um, recommendation two. We're not on that. Recommendation one is on the floor. Which pleasure, man, if you don't want it, you're going to have to defeat it. want it, you have to vote for it. I'm not hearing a lot of debate or even questions on it, so I am going to call for the question. Cornerstone. Okay, Cornerstone. Uh, Craig? Um, thank you. I have a question regarding it. Uh, there's a number of protests that have come with similar arguments as to why we're at an impasse. Was it the committee's view that this is standing in the way of the district's ability to work and for Protestants' ability to be helped? If they believe that the counter charge feels like it's the end, but if it's an admonition, there's an opportunity to help. Was that, because it seems like an area where classes could advise and could provide some help 
and disappointed that you're not being countercharged and, and the conversation can continue. Um, I would agree that that's probably not what's going on here, but we have in a lot of protests this this positive. Right. The motion is as it is presented to us. We call for the question. All in favor of declaring that the Protestant is not being charged, etc. Say aye. All opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. The motion fails. Recommendation two. Class, that classes does not sustain Phillips, Mr. Rainey's appeal grounds. The consistory of First Reformed Protestant Church has comprehensively addressed and answered all of the contentions that Mr. Rainey has expressed. You shall move that. I move that. That's supported. supported. Right discussion, Reverend Laddie. So I, I think the ground. Um, is a little bit beside the point. Uh, the impasse between the appellant and the consistory is not whether the consistory has worked. And that's really what the ground is addressing. First Reformed Protestant Church has comprehensively addressed and answered all of the contentions that Philip has expressed. I think Brother Amy would say, yeah, I know they did. They comprehensively addressed them. They gave their answers to them. The problem is they're wrong. The consistory's wrong in all the things that expressed and addressed. And so classes adjudication of this isn't to declare whether work was done, even comprehensive work, but to say we judge one of you to be right and one of you to be wrong. And so I think the, what, the direction that this ought to go, if it's the mind of classes not to sustain Brother Amy's appeal, is that classes not sustain the appeal and adopt the answer of first and the grounds of first as its own. And now classes is saying all that material, which is pages, uh, 48, 49, 50, through 53, that's now our decision. And that adjudicates the matter because now we say the consistory was right and the appellant was wrong. Can I move to amend the motion? Or really should I withdraw? A substitute motion, which I regard as very slimy. Okay. So, um, recommit. I would say you have to recommit to uh, reformulate. has to be the will of the body so I guess the way to check if it is the will of the body is to make a motion to recommit for reformulation All right. can someone move that I move to recommit alright uh, someone support that support alright the motion is to recommit for reformulation uh, it's only debatable on the reason Anyways, do you have something to say about other ones call the question? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Let's move to the Wayne and Sarah Courtney. A protest. We need a recommendation, one, about legality. The committee recommend that we declare the protest legally before it. 
because it meets the grounds of Article 30 and 31. Okay, that's, is that supported? Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Well, the overture is for the protest is legally before us. Uh, we move one. I move recommendation one that classes declare that the protestant is not being charged with sin of legalism by the consistory of First Reformed Protestant Church. <laughs> All right, is that supported? Supported. Okay. Any discussion? Cornerstone. 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 Again, it was to see that the Protestant knows that um, what they're making out of the, the protest, as we underst understand it, does not indicate that they are being um, brought under discipline by the consistory and, and charged with sin. Uh, because they brought a protest. So the uh, recommendation is in substance the same as the one that we failed. Um, so I think we kind of know the direction of classes. So uh, if there's no further debate, I'm going to call for the question. Yes. Sure. Slightly confused with this uh, charge of not being legalist. And yet, in several sermons, it was clearly preached that there's a life and death struggle in our church regarding legalism and legalists. And several times, legalists have been mentioned. So, is that not a charge of Mr. Chairman, the recommendation is about this answer to their protest. Uh, not sermons, not whatever else is going on. But I think this, this recommendation ought to be failed too. I don't think it's the business of classes to... Oh, wait a minute. No, it's not good. Mr. Chairman, I... Response rather directly or indirectly to the letters of protests that have been written. The charge of legalism has been swiftly followed during multiple sermons. It doesn't take genius to figure out who the legalist is, a demon person. So now I'm being told that I'm not being charged with legalism. Just a, just a formality. Uh, I, I honestly don't know why in the world this is even here, whether they're being charged or not. This is a protest of a classical decision. The, the, it, what the consistory does is immaterial. It, it's a classical decision. 
Sarah? Why is that here? That doesn't belong here. And I believe it's this. I'm going to call ready to declare this motion out of order. I do believe this motion is out of order. And I'm going to rule that way. It's not here. This has to do with a protest of a classical decision. And unless I'm challenged, I'm ruling the motion out of order. And we're moving to two. Yes. We've already declared it legally before us, though. But the, the protest is a motion, though, to address a consistory charge of sin at this body in a protest of this body's decision is out of order. I would ask that the committee uh, move its second recommendation. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can the other delegates hear the Courtney's speak? No. And that they ought to. So I don't know if that means we recess and to get another microphone or what that means. Can we move that microphone, maybe? Recommendation two, that class does not sustain the protest of Wayne and Sarah Courtney. Grounds, classes as a deliberative body did adopt the decision of the consistory as demonstrating from scripture, the creeds, and the church order. Just because the protestant does not agree with the decision of classes does not give the protestant the right to charge the classes with failure to deliberate. Grounds, one, while we agree that the physical herald and physical gathering of one body may not be spiritualized away any more than the physical element of the sacraments, the grounds given in the protest do not substantiate the contention of the protest. Two, circumstances may arise which prohibit every member from being in the immediate presence of the minister, building restrictions, etc., in these God-ordained circumstances, the congregation is not divided. Three, such arrangements in these circumstances may be made by the consistory do not violate any scriptural or confessional norms regarding congregational or corporate worship. Four, the worship and praise that God receives from the body in the congregational worship does not depend on the physical distance between the members. The focus of the preaching is the glorification of God by God's people. You so moved? So moved. Support it. All right, that's on the floor. Uh, I was of the impression that we were going to deal with uh, number one again, the gal of being charged with legalism. No, the motion's been ruled out of order. It's been ruled out of order? Yes. I thought that the man on the screen couldn't hear. That's a ruling of the chair. Is out of order, and we are two. Okay. Well, I got nothing to say. To two. You. I was under the impression that we we're still dealing with number one because the gentleman on the screen couldn't hear. No, we.
we are dealing with two. Do okay. you have anything to say about two? Um, no, but just in general. Yep. May God have mercy. Thank you. That's all I gotta say. Recommendation two. Is there a discussion on recommendation two? Seven, do you want to keep moving? What do you want to do? If you want to keep moving, we're going to keep moving. All right? Anything different? Uh, the next that we going to treat is the protest of Sarah Duzema. Committee to bring advice regarding protest of Sarah Duzma. Sarah Duzma protests repeal of Wayne and Sarah Courtney to the May 13, 2020 classes regarding the ordinances and worship at First RPC, specifically the administration of Lord's Supper. Recommendation one, that class is declared protest of Sarah Duzma legally before it. Around Article 30, 31 of the Church Order have been satisfied. That's supported. Supported. All right, it's on the floor of legality. Any discussion on legality? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Go ahead. Motion two, that classes reject the protest of Sarah Duzma. Ground, she brings no new arguments to show or prove that the decision of classes is contrary to the scripture and the creeds. Is that supported? Supported. All right, discussion. Can you? Yes, that's better. Better? Yeah. Okay, so in the first place, uh, there's two different parts to my protest. And one of the main arguments is that classes misrepresented the court needs and that classes jumped to conclusions regarding um, their position. And that's that's not dealt with at all here. I'm wondering why not. Yes, go ahead, Aaron. I can't hear. Sorry, we cannot hear Sarah. Sarah, you're going to have to speak. 
speak right into that. Might have got unplugged. Is it on? I can hear it sound. Big one here. Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was saying that there's there's a couple different parts to my protest. Um, in the first place, I contend that. They do not represent the Courtney's um, accurately, and that they jump to conclusions in in the decision of classes itself. Um, I don't see that addressed at all here. I'm just wondering why not. Anybody on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I have sympathy for that question. Um, I believe that Ms. Duzema's protest introduces a certain interpretation of the Courtney's position. And uh, that's not addressed in the, the advice here. In the ground, I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate. No new arguments to show or prove that the decision of classes is contrary to scripture and the creeds. If it's true that classes misrepresented the court needs, I think that is a new argument that we need to answer. So I have her in mind, for example, on page 144 of the protest, there Ms. Duzema summarizes what the question really is at its heart. And she proposes that that's the issue. That's the issue the Courtney's were dealing with. That's the issue that classes should have been dealing with. And I think that needs an answer. And and the question would be, is that really what the protest was at its heart? So is her interpretation of the Courtney's protest correct? I don't know that that needs a long answer, but I do believe that does need an answer. So I, I would have gone with that recommendation to reject the protest of Ms. Duzema. But I think the grounds ought to deal with the protest. To get to the second part of my protest, I, I go to quite length in it trying to explain what corporate congregational worship is. To me, that seems like a something that clearly I don't have the same understanding of 
as my consistory in classes. And that's where I believe this class is, has that calling to try to explain now, this is what con corporate congregational worship is. Your understanding that you set forth in your protest is not correct based on this scripture and this confession. That's, that's what would be helpful to me. The, the goal is to try to reconcile here, and I, I don't see that as a goal of this decision. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address that. The goal is not reconciliation at classes. The goal of classes is a righteous judgment. Now, that may lead to reconciliation and follow-up work, but classes must judge the case. I want to say something, too, to this document. Um, I was prepared to recommend that it be not declared legal because it's a hybrid. Under the name of a protest, you actually bring an entirely new document. You have all your own arguments. You have all your own interpretations of the Courtney's argument. This, this, is, this is a whole brand new thing we have to deal with. Um, it's, so it's like, well, why don't you go to first and bring your, your own protest to first of their understanding? There's, there's something off about this, and I, I want to just declare it illegal. And I, I still do. <coughs> go ahead. I guess I don't understand why that I'm specifically addressing a decision of classes and saying I disagree with these points of classes. Um, it's in here a couple different times, a couple places where I quote the piece history of the classes. I'm not on yet at the moment. But is that not the right of the Office of Well Believer in the church to protest a decision of classes? And bring new grounds? I thought that's the point. We have the simple quotation of the decision protested at the beginning um, of, this, of this protest. And the full decision is this motion made that classes not sustain the appeal of Wayne and Sarah Courtney and that classes adopt the answer of First Reformed Protestant Church with its grounds as our response to them. That's the entire decision. The body of this protest, according to the decision of classes itself, must deal with the decisions of the consistory, the original governing body here. Accordingly, it would seem to me that this does belong then to that original governing body rather than before classes. Sarah? So to clarify, what I'm understanding that the previous speaker is saying is that I ought to go back to first RPC and protest? No. What if it's been to a broader assembly? How can I do that? No, you're right. You come here. But it's not legally here? Or you don't? I, I, in, reading this, I, in reading this document, I feel it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. It, 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 it deals with the decision of classes. But it introduces a whole bunch of new things. Like, it doesn't, it, 
It doesn't take the courtroom's position and say this is how this position is the position Scripture creates. This is how class's position is not the position that you, you introduce many of your own arguments. I, I, I'm struggling to see how that's appropriate. protest is out of order. <laughs> like, I, I feel like I dealt pretty specifically with the classical decision. So, to my mind, the difficulty with the document is that it proposes an interpretation of the court in protest. It is not dealing with the arguments of the Courtney's and it is not dealing then with the arguments of the classes against the Courtney's but it is proposing here's a different interpretation a new interpretation of what the Courtney's protest meant and what their position was and to my mind that's most clearly demonstrated on page 144 in the paragraph that begins first of all and then towards the end of that paragraph, about five lines up, there's this statement. At its heart, the question really is whether the preaching and sacraments are one of the keys given to each autonomous church to be exercised in that autonomous instituted church alone, or whether the preaching and sacraments can be shared and exercised outside of the local church institute and her local public worship. So that says the Courtney's case was about you know, the autonomy of the church and key power that's proposing an interpretation of the Courtney's case and then to find the answers to these questions we must look to scripture and the confessions well there's a lot of scripture in the confessions about key power in autonomous church but is that the Courtney's protest so there's a whole whole demonstration of a new question and so I think the class's answer would address that. No, at its heart, the question isn't this. At its heart, the question that the court needs brought was these five grounds. Lively preaching, one body, one table. Uh, I can't read my writing there. Spectators, I think, and then will worship. That, that's what the court needs brought. So I, I, um, I believe we need to recommit this and deal with that question. And maybe there are some others too, but that's one question. Did, is this the right interpretation of that protest? Speaking of that, um, I'm going to ask you I'm not understanding the difference between the court is arguing that we have to be one body to partake of the Lord's Supper and me arguing that we have to be one and one corporate worship. That's what one body is. It's a corporate worship. This, this is what we're talking about here. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to recommit for reformulation. Is that supported? Supported. Right, the motion to recommit for reformulation. No discussion, I'll call for the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. I'd like to reconvene tomorrow, but can you um, remind the delegates to turn in their expenses to the Finance Committee? All right. We're going to re reconvene tomorrow. We'll talk about the time in a minute. Uh, the delegates need to turn in their expenses to the Finance Committee. Uh, do you want to reconvene tomorrow at 8, at 7, 6, 5.30? Thank you.
We have two committees that re have their material recommitted, so 10, I, I don't know. 930. 9.45. <laughs> <laughs> re Reconvene tomorrow at 9.45. Can we close uh, the session in prayer? I believe would you close for us, please? Well, Our Father, which art in heaven, we come to thee at the close of this day. We come to thee as those who are blind, naked, and impoverished in ourselves. And we come to thee, O Lord, and we give thee our praise and our thanks. Thou hast taken us poor sinners and opened up the very treasure house of heaven itself unto us. Thou hast done so in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ gospel which frees men, frees women from bondage, frees them to the glorious liberty of living a joyful, thankful life unto thee, knowing their salvation is secure in the one work of Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the decisions that were made today. We marvel at thy hand, and we tremble for this is thy work. We pray that thou wilt give unto us wisdom as we continue our work. And we never forget, Lord, that we are nothing of ourselves, and that all of our sufficiency is in thee and in thee alone. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. talking to this one. Yeah, but it's muted. Oh. Ryan, you got a button right there. Uh, we're going to be about 15 minutes yet. We're waiting for some things to send out to the delegates online. Yes.
to come to order. We open the session with singing and the reading of scripture and prayer. Let's sing. Psalter number 262, 262. Let's sing the three stanzas. Unto God our Savior. Scripture from that psalm, Psalm 98. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness hath he openly shown in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp and with the, vo and with the, harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and a sound of cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar, and let the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world, and the people with equity. Let's pray. Almighty God and merciful Father, humble ourselves before thee, who is a God like unto thee, a God of power, a God before whom the nations tremble, a God who shakes the heavens and the earth, a God who is sovereign over all things, whose servants do thy pleasure, and it is thy right hand and thy holy arm has gotten thee the victory. We give thanks, O Lord, for the decisions that have been taken at this classes. We stand amazed at the advance and the reformation that was made, at the upholding of the truth that we are governed in our life by the creeds as faithful summaries of scripture so that there has been a return to the creeds Thank thee, Lord, that 
in that we have a return to being ruled by thy word, and not by the will or the whims of men, and certainly not by their laws. We ask, Lord, that the decisions that have already been made may cause the church and the gospel and the schools, and therefore thy covenant to flourish among us. We may be carried by the wind of the Spirit to stand fast and to walk in the liberty where thou hast made us free. Now bless us, Lord, as we gather. Now give unto us a rich measure of thy Holy Spirit that he might fill this room, that he might guide the delegates, and in guiding the delegates to their decisions, that we may be able to say it please the elders and the Holy Ghost. We ask, Lord, that by that means, that will also lead us into a wide place. We ask, Lord, that thou wilt pardon all our sin, that thou wilt keep us from sin. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. It should be noted in the minutes that Elder Jeff Antinga left classes this morning. We take up the recommitted material, I believe the appeal of Philip Rennie. Is a microphone set up here so that it can be heard by the delegates online. I believe it's up here by that lectern there, the plant stand. If it's green, it will pick you up. It's good. No, you don't. You can stand right there. Or sit. Or sit, whichever you prefer. It's going to pick you up. Uh, to the delegates online, if you can't hear, can you please give us a signal? Thank you. Well, first of all, there's the, uh, I guess it's a matter of my name, because you guys only want to give me two L's. Mm. One's enough. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not going to ask that to be reformulated or recommitted, but, you know, my dad only gave me one, but that's okay, he's only giving me two, we'll take that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I just want to ask, I just want to make one remark about um, my protest on preaching. So the burden, part of the burden of my protest is to get at the idea, the concept of preaching as both message and form. Now, I mean, the consistory position is that, there, that, that it's really the message. I mean, the consistory writes, um, <clears throat> but what is important is what is conveyed. That's the only point. Page of six of their of the consistory response. They say, 
was important to us to convey how that voice is, the preacher's voice, how that word is conveyed is not important. What is important is the word itself. What is important is the content that is distributed by the medium. And you say elsewhere, I don't want to get the important to that, but you know, it can be a broadcast. Preaching can be a broadcast. So it's not the, it's not the, it's the word conveyed. I like people to think about that because, because to me that there's a link between preaching and the herald. I'm breaking the link between preaching and the herald. The man in the exercise of his office breaks the link between preaching and the local church. Romans 10 makes it clear that preaching happens when you hear the preacher. Why shall we hear the voice of the preacher? Why shall we preach except to be sent? The local church has to call and send the preacher. That's preaching when you hear the voice of Jesus Christ from the mouth of the herald, the man in the exercise of his office. So Christ ties the message to a certain medium, namely a weak, a weak vessel in the exercise of his office. So if life giving can be preaching, then you have preaching that is sent without sending that herald, the man in the exercise of his office, you're preaching that is that is not that is not a matter of sending the man, and since the church calls and sends the man, then you're preaching that is sent without the sending of the church. In which case you break in my my view the link between preaching and the herald, and therefore since the church has to call and send the herald, you break the link between preaching and the local church. So then the church will lose the preaching and in which case you will lose the gospel. That's the burden. I think that I want to keep this share and make it clear that that's why I'm really getting out of my protest. Thank you for that. Are there any other comments or points? Comfortable to call for the question? I don't want to rush it. If we're settled on the question, as the process, we can take the vote. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just to reply to the Protestant or the appellant, um, he points out that beautiful link between the preaching of the gospel, the herald, and the link between the herald and the church. And he's correct in all of those links. And Romans 10 establishes that very clearly. The issue that the consistory had with his protest is that uh, he said there's something else, and that is how that message is broadcast that must be included in the understanding of those links. So he makes statements, for example, and you can find this on page 52 in the agenda as the consistory quotes, um, live stream preaching is a contradiction in terms, or uh, a man, an ordained, called, and sent man, a preacher, is the official bearer, herald of God to the world. YouTube is not God's herald. But the argument that the Protestant makes at that point is, is an attempt to make the uh, means of broadcast to be part of that link God established. And that's not the case. It can be broadcast by microphone. It can be broadcast in various ways. And that does not violate the link that the Protestant just pointed out to us. And that's the burden of the consistory's answer on pages 51 to 52 in that point five that the Protestant refers to. Um, his concern simply uh, doesn't deal with the reality that the preacher is still sent and that still the preacher who is preaching the word of God. The issue is that matter of the broadcast. 
Thank you. All right, anything further, Philip? You're going to have to come up here again. You should just stay by that microphone. amplify the preacher's voice naturally. You can have a natural amphitheater at the Presbyterian State of Scotland with natural geography. On the mirrors, you can amplify it in a natural topographical feature. You can amplify it by having voice training. You can amplify it by people where I'm not getting any amplification. Nobody's disputing that. But it's not a broadcast to a remote location. At least it doesn't have to be that. I'm talking about broadcast specifically, not amplification. is not sustain Phillips with one L appeal and that classes adopt material from First Reformed Protestant Church as its own say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Uh, for the protest of Sarah Duzema. Uh, recommendation that class has not sustained Miss Sarah Duzema's protest with its two grounds. Uh, who's presenting? Would you read through that decision, please? Recommendation class has not sustained Miss Sarah Duzema's <coughs> protest. Grounds Miss Duzema's protest does not deal with the actual case that the court needs made and that class is answered, but introduces a new interpretation of the court needs case. Courtney's case rested on five specific grounds, each of which classes answered, lively preaching, one body, one table, baptism, and will worship. See agenda pages 136 through 139. Rather than dealing with the case, or with that case, in its grounds, and the answers, Ms. Duzma goes back to the original protest to say what she believes the protest was really about. Oh. At its heart, the question really is whether the preaching and the sacraments are one of the keys given to the each autonomous church to be exercised in that autonomous church alone, or whether the preaching and sacraments can be shared and exercised outside of the local church institute and her local public worship. Agenda, page 144. This restatement of the case bypasses the judgment that classes made, so that the protest is not so much a protest against classes' decision as it is a presentation of a new case. All of Ms. Duzma's labor and proof for her newly stated case are therefore beside the point. Because Mrs. D Ms. Duzma has not proven that classes' decision was contrary to the scripture or confessions, classes must maintain its judgment as settled and binding according to the word of God. Church Order, Article 31, and further grounds B. Miss Duzma's mischaracterization or mischaracterizes Classes' answer as jumping to conclusions. Classes, 
certainly came to conclusions and drew conclusions from the Courtney's appeal, but making conclusions is not jumping to conclusions. Making conclusions simply belongs to the work of making a righteous judgment. And I charge you, I charge your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. Deuteronomy 1, 1 16. Is that so moved? I move that. Is that supported? Support. Discussion. There's nothing. I'll call for the question. I can't. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Come up to the microphone, please. We cannot hear you. You have to speak up a little bit. Use your playground voice. Um, first of all, just to make clear, what is the proper avenue that the appellant here should take given these concerns? Uh, we're, we're simply saying here they don't belong at classes. But now to, um, to speak to the issue of where, where this should be or where this should go. Um, my sentiment is that it should be with the consistory that has um, made this arrangement for worship and the administration of the Lord's Supper. Would I be correct in, in saying that?
Well, the reason is that classes is not the place to take up. Um, it would be the, ta the place to take up a protest against this, the decision of this body concerning the Courtney's appeal. But to introduce material that was not treated by this classes before um, as part of the Courtney's pro uh, appeal cannot be taken up by this classes. Only the, the content of the material that was brought by the Courtney's to this classes uh, can be treated. The, the point of this advice is that you're dealing with the content in a completely different way than the Courtney's did. You're, you're, you're saying that their protest is justified, but you're asserting that on completely different grounds than what the Courtney's did. If it were the same grounds that the Courtney's did, then it would be proper for classes to treat it. But the judgment of classes in this first section is that it's different. It's not the same uh, grounds. It's not the same content. I think I agree with Sarah's question and her confusion that she expresses of why she can't bring it here. Because to me it seems clear that if she can't bring it here, then it ought to be declared illegal. <coughs> If she can bring it here, then we ought to answer the protest. So, but I don't believe that this body is saying you may not bring this here. So I agree with the thrust of Sarah's question that why can't I bring it here? And my response is you may bring it here. You did bring it here, and we're going to answer the protest here. So maybe I'm, con I'm confused as well possibly, but that's how I understand it. So the protest is legally before this body, and the thrust of the answer is that the protest does not really do what a protest is supposed to do, because what the protest does is charge the classes with dishonest treatment and misrepresentation of the Courtney's. It restates the issue, and then it goes about prove the restatement of the issue. And we're saying you can't do that. We didn't misrepresent the Courtney's. We didn't dishonestly treat their protest. You have to deal with their grounds, not restate the issue, and then go on a long and arduous journey to prove the restatement of the issue. We didn't misrepresent them. We didn't miss the issue of their protest. Their protest rested on five grounds. Yes. And I would say, too, that if, if Sarah, in my judgment, if Sarah had brought material that made it abundantly clear that we had uh, bungled or misrepresented or misunderstood, I'd be very attentive to that. And I would hear that, and I would want this body to judge based on that. Not, and I'm not saying anybody's suggesting that, but not say, well, that's you know, it's a new case, bring a new protest. We're here right now to judge this matter. Is it legalism or is it not? And so even, a, even if there were new things in there, I'm still, I'd still be very, very insistent that we treat it. Now, I have my own thoughts to say about her document and to answer her concerns, which I can address later, but that's where I'm, that's where I say, let's deal with it. So are you in favor of this advice or not? I'm in favor of the advice. All right. I still don't understand how I'm necessarily in favor of the advice, because that's not what I get out of it, but I do appreciate the comments that you made to hear that. If you don't believe that you misrepresent So Sarah makes the point 
in her document that classes came to faulty conclusions. Faulty conclusion one. The Courtney's, her conclusion is that one may not partake of the sacrament in the outbuilding equals one cannot spiritually partake of Christ or hear of the gospel in the outbuilding. And in her protest, that's treated on page 147. And the line specifically is, on the contrary, the Courtney specifically state that we are spiritually nourished whenever we hear the gospel, no matter where we are or how we hear it. That puts a certain reading on the Courtney's protest. That it might be saying something like, you know, we're getting Christ in some regard, but this is more of just an administrative issue. So if we could just get through that. However, the Courtney's, if you look at their protest, call it desecration. Desecration is to violate the sanctity of something or to profane something. And they do use the word profane later in their protest as well. The Courtney's go on to charge that this is will worship akin to Nadab and Abihu's strange fire for which they were devoured with fire and they compare it to Uzzah for which he was immediately struck dead. So I, I, I hear Sarah. I disagree with Sarah. That wasn't a faulty conclusion at all. That was the absolute proper conclusion. That's why I appreciate ground B of the advice. We're making a righteous judgment. And this is not a difficult righteous judgment to make. It's, it's, those words are in her protest. Faulty conclusion two, she states that there are certain physical aspects of the Lord's Supper that must be observed equals the Lord's Supper is turned from a spiritual feast into a carnal feast. I disagree with that judgment. And that, that gets to more of Sarah's entire document and really all of the documents that we've judged and read as a consistory and this body, I believe, also is that many, many, many true things are stated by the Protestants and by the appellants. Many true things. A herald, um, that there are physical elements, that there must be preaching. I could, I could go through and, and weary this assembly with all of that. But none of that is disputed. We don't deny that there are physical elements to the Lord's Supper. We don't deny that there's a physical herald that preaches the Word of God. And actually... Well, that gets to the previous Protestants, so I'll, I'll leave that off. So her faulty conclusion, too, which she, which she goes on to try to prove with many references to the creeds and to the scripture, I'll just point out a few places. The Second Congregation, this is page 144. Um, second, the congregation must be gathered together in one place, particularly the Lord's Supper. Yes. She goes on into one place at the bottom, the assembly of the people of God, yes. Um, the Courtney's insistence on adhering to the rules of Christ, yes. All of these things, con corporate congregational worship and so on and so forth, all of that we, we don't dispute, we don't disagree with. So I, I hear what Sarah's saying and, and she wants to know, like, do you disagree or agree? I disagree with her. I disagree with her document. I agree with much of it, but I don't, I don't agree that this assembly made faulty conclusions at all. I believe they made righteous judgments. has been given to what constitutes the church 
one body what makes a local body. A local body isn't or isn't um, restricted by physical walls or the location of that body. That body is a spiritual body. So the lack of interacting with the grounds made it something very difficult for us to to say she brings her own argumentation without refuting the grounds that we've already brought. So that was the struggle within the committee of saying, what do we do with this thing? If she would have taken that same argument, worked with the grounds to disprove the grounds of our classes of last um, meeting, and we could have had, that's how this is disproved, it would have been much easier to, to understand So to res I appreciate the comments of the previous speaker because those things have been proved and that needs to be refuted. But to speak specifically, she said it's a desecration of the sacrament because those in the outbuilding are not, I don't want to put words in mouth, maybe one with the rest of the group, something like that. And Galatians 5 verse 1 applies to our consistory and to our church, that we must stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. When we first formed as a congregation, we, were, we met in a barn. And we all couldn't fit in the room in the barn. So there were those who had to be in the other room, which was also accompanied by a tractor, interestingly enough. But none of us had the thought that we all have to get ourselves inside of that one room because they weren't in the presence of the minister. So now, but we never had that thought. And then we moved to the tire shop and now the church. And I know it, it, it gets a response, and I don't mean it to, but there would have to be endless calculations. Because just for example, in this church right here, if you overflowed, you would have to have a discussion if there were those behind these doors, whether they're actually in the midst of the congregation or not. And I've heard things like, well, can you hear their voices? Are they together? Are, or or the, in the back, you'd have to do that. Now, you'd have to have that discussion. What does that look like? And my response to you would be, stand fast in the liberty. The circumstances are going to change of that preaching and the administration of the sacraments, but stand fast in that liberty. Because if you're down the hall in another room, if you're behind the glass, it turns into endless calculations. And if you look at the Belgic Confession on the Lord's Supper and the administration of the Lord's Supper, it is a simple spiritual feast. A simple, that is what our Lord ordained. And it is not. And the view that's being expressed in this protest and in other protests is legalism. And our church has our church must stand fast and fight that off. It's troubling our church. And so I'm thankful for this advice and I I pray that it it passes because there are endless calculations that we will all be having to perform to determine have we done enough or, or have we checked every rule?
Mr. Chairman, the, the protest and the protests in general don't bear any resemblance to the reality of the case. And that's part of the uh, part of the bondage that is being laid upon First Church. So on page 144, at its heart, the question really is whether the preaching and sacraments are one of the keys given to each autonomous church to be exercised in the autonomous instituted church alone, or whether the preaching and sacraments can be shared and exercised outside of the local church institute and her local public worship. What resemblance at all does that have to what happened at first? It, this makes it sound like we're walking down the street with a tray of wine and a tray of bread knocking on doors and giving communion to everybody. That's not what happened. And a previous speaker alluded to that in the history of First Church and the different places we worshipped. Accommodations had to be made here, there, in every place. And one of the accommodations that's made with the current building that God has given First Church is that those who for reasons of health cannot come in to one building on that property are accommodated in another building on that property with the oversight of the, the elders, with the preaching of the gospel, with the administration of the sacraments. Uh, that's the case. That's what happened. This simply doesn't bear any relationship to it. And that's part of the weakness of this protest in general protest says, here's really the issue. Here's really the issue. Instead of coming to the grounds and saying, this is why that ground is unbiblical, it says, here's the real issue of the original protest. I'm going to tell you what that real issue was, and then I'm going to deal with that. The Belgic Confession, Article 28, identifies this church. Now, understanding that it moves out of Article 27, it speaks of the Catholic Christian Church overall burden of Article 28 is to demonstrate that that Catholic Christian Church is manifested in individual congregations. And this is that church, that church to which is administered the preaching of the gospel and the sacraments. We believe since this holy congregation is an assembly of those who are saved, that out of it there is no salvation no person of whatsoever state or condition he may be ought to withdraw himself to live in a separate state from it, but that all men are in duty bound to join and unite themselves with it, maintaining the unity of the church, submitting themselves to the doctrine and discipline thereof, bowing their necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ, as mutual members of the same body, serving to the edification of the brethren according to the talents that God has given them. It is to that church that the word is brought in its gathering. It is that church to which the sacraments are administered in their gatherings. Now, the circumstances of their gatherings may change, but it is the point to administer the gospel and the sacraments to that congregation in its worship. And that this stands independently of uh, various circumstances that make being in the same uh, location and surrounded by the same perimeter of no significance. It is the aim and the goal that all in this congregation hear together the word of God and receive together the sacraments of the Lord's Supper so that the, the question of whether or not there is any kind of separation upstairs, downstairs, across 
is really irrelevant. It is this congregation to which the word must be preached and to which the sacraments must be administered. And that's the goal. Now, there can, be, there can be differences about how that's to be accomplished in these various circumstances, but that, that's a question that never should hinge on whether the sacrament is being administered or whether or not the sacraments are being desecrated. Um, those questions belong to an entirely different category than where uh, these members can be found when that word is preached or when the sacrament is administered. Thank you. I would just like to say that when I when I hear the protestant speaking, it there's a total disregard for the truths that are presented to her. There was a long presentation just a minute ago that was that was wonderful. It was filled with the truth and it stands on the confessions. And she goes on to just disregard that say that she can't worship in that building. And that was also part of the struggle that we had as a committee with her protest. And she disregards the decisions and the, the good and just decisions that were made by the previous classes and the grounds that were given in all the work that was done in First Consistory and then also in the classes. I have to say, personally, I understand the burden. It is troublesome, and from what I understand, the consistory is taking every effort to change the situation. But that, that burden mustn't be turned into a ground to reach the conclusion that the Lord's Supper is being desecrated or it's being improperly administered. I, I think of saints in the nursing home that have not been able to worship among God's people for years. That's a tremendous burden that they have. And they're lonely when God's people are gathering and they're not able to be there. But that doesn't mean that there's no church. And that it's not the preaching because here's a member of the congregation that just, just can't be there. Um, it, it's a real burden. But that burden can't be made into the conclusion that there's something wrong and that the church is erring because this individual has a burden. And I would think that spiritually, every person who, who cannot worship where in, in the sanctuary has that. And if, if a congregation has to be divided between upstairs and downstairs, that, that, that's a burden, and no church really wants that. But sometimes circumstances make that necessary, but again, those circumstances can never be made into ground for saying it's not preaching or it's not the sacraments that are being administered.
The Reformed doctrine of the sacraments is that the sacraments must be administered in the congregation in connection with the preaching of God's word in the congregation and that uh, an elderly person cannot be present in the congregation to hear the word of God uh, being preached and thus to have the sacrament administered to uh, him or her personally apart from the preaching. The Reformed Doctrine of the Sacraments insists that only the sacraments can only be administered where the Word of God is preached. The circle is now closed in the argument. We're back to where we started. And we can't go around. We, we just can't go around. Right. And Sarah does provide, Ms. Tuzma does provide biblical proof for things. In 1 Corinthians 11 20, she references on page 144 that the Church of Corinth come together into one place. She goes on to quote, Belgian Confession, Article 35, we receive this Holy Sacrament in the assembly of the people of God. We agree with all of those things. And so um, she makes the point that how is that one place or how is that one body? Well, if you read, for example, the Belgian Confession, Article 35, it's peculiar that you would pick out the assembly of the people of God. Now, assembly can be defined whether, would anybody disagree if an assembly is in here, but then there's, that's when we have to start making those laws. But if you read the Belgic Confession, Article 35, the whole thrust of the article is the spiritual nature of the sacrament without denying the fact that we're gathered together and that we're one body. But what does that mean? For the support of the spiritual and heavenly life which believers have, he has sent a living bread who nourishes and strengthens the spiritual life of believers when they eat him, that is to say, when they apply and receive him by faith in the Spirit. Why take this beautiful article and focus on the physical aspect of where the minister's feet are, or are we all in one room, are we all in somehow some physical way together? Let's focus on the spiritual reality and, and partake of the sacrament without denying any of the elements of the sacrament. Right, men, I believe that the debate or deliberation that we're having is illustrates exactly what the ground state. Uh, we are just simply going in circles and we're actually arguing a new case. And so I'm going to draw a debate on this to a close. Um, and if there's nothing new, then I'm going to call for the question. All in favor of the recommendation as presented, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then we move to the appeal of the clients. Any 
pick up who's reporting. Be me. All right, go ahead. Committee triggering the appeal of Cornelius and Rebecca Klein to uphold their protest against the position paper of the Consistory of First RPC. Information. In the summer of 2022, Covenant Christian High School issued interview questionnaires to members of the RPC who in intended to enroll their children at the school. At the time, these members of the RPC included Mr. and Mrs. Klein. On July 27, 2021, the Consistory of First IPC approved and published their congregation to their congregation a position paper on the vows of the RPRC school questionnaires. On August 10, 2021, Reverend Lang gave a lecture explaining the position paper. On August 22, 2021, the clients informed the Consistory of their disagreement with the position paper and with the speech via letter. On September 8, 2021, the consistory met with the clients in person. On September 15, 2021, the council responded via letter. On November 3, 2021, the clients responded with another letter and asked for a meeting with the, a new committee. On December 15, the council responded via letter. On January 17, the clients responded with a letter mistakenly dated October 30, 2021. On April 20, 2022, council responded via letter. June 21, 2021, the clients responded via letter. In July 20, 2021, the council responded via, le via letter. On August 13, 2022, the clients informed the consistory that they would be appealing the coup classes to uphold their protest against the Council of First RPC regarding their position paper. Recommendation one is written that ground that classes declare the appeal to uphold the protest not legally before them. I think that's worded wrong. I think that we could scratch the appeal to uphold. Appeal. That classes declare the protest not legally before them. It would be an appeal. It would be a appeal. Classes declare the appeal not legally before them. Okay. In ground A, the clients have not finished the work with their consistory because they have not officially protested the position paper according to Articles 30 and 31 of the church order. Ground B, it is unclear whether the clients are protesting the position paper or bringing charges of hierarchy. Right. So moved. Uh, so moved. Support it. All right. Uh, recommendation is it's not legally here. As much as I want to give you the right to speak, the Protestant does not have the right to speak on issues, issues of legality. Go to page 90 of the agenda, which is the Klein's first letter to the consistory or the council. That document is in the form of a letter, but the document uses the language of protest. And the language of protest is in that first paragraph, we are grieved. And it becomes evident they don't just mean to express their state of mind, but that this is a formal grievance. The demonstration of our grievance is as follows. And that language of being grieved and having a grievance is language from Article 31, or at least the, the decision that we've lived with for a lot of years in the PRC. It's the language of the formula of subscription with regard to appealing. The language of grievance is, I would say, well-established language of protest. The Kleins did not lay out their letter with uh, the 
the statement, here is ground one, and here is ground two, and here is ground three. But the letter does have specific points it's addressing. So on page 91, that third paragraph, the interpretation of the questions asked of us is subjective in nature. And they argue that point at length. Then page 91, at the bottom, we did not sign a vow conflicting with our baptism vows. And then on page 94, uh, 93 rather, in the second to last paragraph is the charge, the consistory is hierarchical. So that you can find in the letter a certain organization, even though it's not listed ground one of the protest, ground two, ground three. I believe the Kleins understand that letter to be a protest. Whatever the form might look like, the language is language of protest. And if you go to page 94, 95, 96, 97, when the council answered the Kleins, on page 94, we lay out, <coughs> first, you maintain that it's not a vow. So we are answering point by point the major elements of the Kleins letter. Then at the bottom of page 94, second, you maintain that the meaning of the vow is objective. And then on page 96, third, you accuse the council of the sin of hierarchy. So that the council in its answer could just as well have been answering a protest. Uh, this correspondence then went back and forth for many months. But I, I think the clients from the beginning were of the understanding, they're protesting that document. And I would like us to consider whether we can, as a classis, honor the language, even if it's not in the form that we might be used to. And one reason for that is that the bar for making a protest became so high in the PRC that it was impossible could not get a protest legally before the classes or the synod. You could hardly get it before them. You had to spend hours and hours on the form of your protest. Article 31's bar for a protest is not high. It's clear something has to be met. But Article 31 does not specify the whole form. If anyone complained that he has been wronged by the decision of an assembly, and that's the client's whole point, we've been wronged. We've been wronged in the position paper, and they follow through with that in their communications to the council. I would like the classes to consider whether even though the form isn't what we might look at, that the language of it and the intent of it is we've been wrong and that this then could legally be here. Thank you. I, I agree with the former speaker and the recommendation, first ground, is that they have not finished their work with the consistory. The clients would very much disagree with that statement. And they would say that they have exhausted themselves in their work with the consistory. They've written many letters, they've had meetings. They would say our work is finished with the consistory. We do not see things the same. We disagree, we need classes to adjudicate. So I would ask the classes to honor that fact and find a way to, not even find a way, just, just treat it, answer it. In the agenda, did not first, in one of its responses, instruct the clients to protest the position paper. So that is the decision of first. Is that not in the agenda? Mr. Chairman, that is in the agenda. Um, Has I first don't... ever retracted that? Or... Yes, Mr. 
Chairman, first, that is on the agenda, and first has not retracted that. Uh, what partly explains it is how we're looking at form, and I think also the case extended for quite a while. Are we up to a year now that this case has been going on? So that we didn't necessarily go back to document one and say now, is it a protest or isn't it? But I don't, I don't believe that interferes <coughs> with the classes ability to take hold of Article 31 and say they've met the bar of an appeal. Maybe first doesn't think so, or first has a line that says it doesn't meet it, but classes can judge this does meet the bar of an appeal. So here's my problem. The fact that first didn't do what it should have done, which is instead of entering into a series of discussions with them that drug out over a year, to require them to protest the position paper. That was correct. That is the original document. That is the cause of the grievance. And first was right. You, you need to go and deal with that document. So now we have not only a protest of a document, which really isn't a protest of the document at all, we also have a whole series of other things that have been introduced. So we're going to be getting into this mess. And I believe, I believe it is a mess. And I do think that we ought to declare it illegal and first needs to go back and say we, we should have required them to deal with our original position paper. That was proper. That, that was our decision. So that they prove from Scripture and the creeds that that decision was an error. And I understand that this, this has gone on for a year and there's been meetings, and, but that I believe that was the result of the consistory not requiring them to deal with its original position. Classes decide the question on a matter of uh, urgency. All right, let's discuss that. Mr. Chairman, and, and I'm not even sure that it has to be on urgency. Article 31 tells us as a classes how a member may come here. We have a member who is complaining, or members who complain that they've been wronged by the decision of a minor assembly. They have their grounds for why they've been wronged. All right, it's not listed in the form of a protest. And regardless, that first said, you know what, you need to go protest that. Classes can say, all that material is right here. They could take this letter and write at the top protest, and then in a margin write one, two, three, and that's the protest. The content of it is the protest. So it, it's, it's very possible that first drop the ball on instructing them at the beginning, but that doesn't hamper us at this point from saying we have two positions. We have the Protestants' position in their letter on page 90 to 93. We have the Consistory's position in their letter on pages 94 to 98. This, this is, this, my concern isn't for form or anything like that. My concision, position is that this escalated quickly. In a matter of a couple letters, 
the consistory had its judgment and the clients had their judgment and the original decision had never been dealt with or at least dealt with very, very lightly, very superficially. And I believe that's disorderly. And I don't believe that the classes may be a partaker in that disorder. The, the consistory, when it got this letter of grievance, instead of launching into it and saying, well, well really, this is a protest, and we're going to deal with it like a protest, the consistory simply should have said, Cornelius and Rebecca, we understand that you are aggrieved, and you need to demonstrate from scripture and decree why that position paper is wrong. That's our official decision. And then Cornelius and Rebecca could have gone, and they could have said, all right, we've got to use scripture and decree and we're going to prove this thing wrong. But instead, it, boom, there's a decision. I, I, I frankly don't agree with that. It's not that I disagree with first position. I don't. I, I'm speaking, and the clients may, may be saying, oh, we don't want to go back and do this. Just judge it. But I'm saying this for their own benefit. I view this as having ex escalated quickly. I don't, I do not believe that the class is ought to enter into this. There's another part to this, and that is a charge of sin that's been leveled against the consistory. And that charge wouldn't have to come in the way of protest. That charge could be in a letter. And the consistory would have to judge that charge, which it has. And there's disagreement. There's an impasse on that charge. So that if, if there's no protest here, there's still a, an impasse in that charge of sin. So maybe the question has to be divided between protest against the position paper and the charge of hierarchy. I'm talking way too much. Can I at least ask this? Is not the charge of sin, does that not arise up out of paper, it's not two separate things, they're related. They didn't just haul off one day and say, you're, you're being hierarchical. That was the position paper, and that's why that position paper had to be dealt with. Because the charge of sin arose up out of it. Do we? Just to re-echo a former speaker, that if first acted disorderly, because Right from day one, we should have said, no, we're not replying to that because it's not a protest against the position paper. We can grant that. And what we thought would be helpful was man's wisdom, and it turned out like man's wisdom always turns out, not helpful. So, but that, again, doesn't stop this assembly. You, the material is there to judge it. They, they have laid out, the clients have laid out if, if you, I believe, and they can correct me later if I'm wrong, but if you were to, if they were to draft another letter in opposition to the position paper, it would have all the material that they have in their documents today. I don't believe they're, they're not protesting something, some aspect or whatever. It's, it's all there. So I don't know that they could, that they would come up with something different. They've laid out their case, and I believe classes can judge that. Irregardless of First Church's malfeasance. All right, anyone further? Yes. You're muted. You're muted. Uh, yeah. uh, being on the committee, then I asked first why in your last letter from July 20th. They for us to move forward, the path is not to put it back and forth, but for you to protest the position paper. Let's demonstrate. So if all the material was there already before, why did you cancel it like that?
I'll say this in my so the clients can't speak to this matter of legality. No. I'm trying to do that for them. What we've written and whatever I might think about the documents and so on, I'm trying to find a way for us to treat their material. I recognize what first wrote. I, I recognize that the elder delegate from Cornerstone is right to the heart of that matter right there. I, I appreciate that. And he, from a certain perspective, he has me at a loss. So, but I'm, I'm trying to argue that this can be treated even though first wrote those words. I would say what first wrote simply didn't reckon with the language of what the Kleins wrote. So that first in its statement, you need to go back and protest rather than write letters back and forth. First could have been wrong in that. What we should have seen from day one is that this is the language of protest. This is a protest. And it's a charge of sin. We should have dealt with it that way. So the error, there's, there's an error here, but the error does not prevent classes from saying we have to judge this. And I still say, even if the protest, even if there's no protest here, and that work has to be done, the charge of sin is still there. And if I got a, if, if the consistory gets a letter from a member saying we charge you as a consistory with sin, I don't think our response would be, well, you have to go back first and write a protest on that position paper, and then we'll deal with your charge of sin. We would say, we're going to answer your charge of sin. We're going to judge it. That at least has been done throughout the documents. I totally disagree that that's the way you handle it. And I believe there is something important that this class needs to guard. And what it needs to guard is that situations in the church between members of the consistory don't escalate in a matter of a month. I grant somebody comes to the consistory and says, we charge you with the sin of false doctrine. All right. Well, why? Well, it's this sermon over here. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. You need to deal with the sermon. We're going to hold this charge of sin over here. Deal with the sermon. And then we'll take up your charge of sin when we deal with your, your protest of the sermon. You can't just separate that charge of sin from the, the reason that it arises. And that was that's the issue with the clients. They, they, they had a problem with that position paper. And out of that position paper came a speech and then on the basis of that, they charge the consistory with hierarchy. Well, the consistory can't say, all right, you charge us with hierarchy. We're going to answer that and leave out of you fundamentally and formally the cause of it. And yeah, now we've got a whole pile of documents. I grant that. There's a reason for that. Because the reason is that position, they didn't insist on that position paper being protested. And I would say everything you just laid out that should have happened, did happen. It didn't happen in the form. But it happened in that first letter. We charge you with hierarchy. And it's because of your position in that paper. And here's why your position in that paper is wrong. And the consistory's answer was, here's... Here's our explanation of what's in that position paper, and therefore, we can't sustain your charge of hierarchy. The only thing that would be different than what you laid out, or what a former speaker laid out, and what happened, is the titles at the top of the documents. All right, anything further on the or, uh, Albert Burkett? I would be in favor of taking up this work, and I based that partly upon when I first read this, when I first read this and I read that last 
uh, letter that first had sent to the protestants, I agree, they really have to deal with the position paper. Because to me, as I read it, it seems like it's all semantics. What's a vow? What, what does this mean? What does this mean? It's all, uh, it, it's not a, a biblical, it's not a principled disagreement. It was more a semantics type issue. Well, and he told us that, you know, it just, it, it just seemed like a mess. But reading it again and looking at it, Again, I do see where the Protestants have brought the creeds in, they have brought scripture in to substantiate their positions where I don't, I think if all we had to deal with was semantics, I would be very reticent to get into it, but I'm, I feel I would agree with uh, the previous speaker that it's more than just a semantics issue. They've laid out, based on the creeds, their disagreements, and therefore I feel it would be appropriate to take it up. Great. Any more discussion on the matter of legality? Otherwise, we call for the question. All in favor of declaring it not legal, not legal, say aye. All in favor of declaring it opposed to that, say aye. 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 Okay, so the matter is recommitted to the committee. If you would bring back a recommendation that it's legal, and then recommendations on how to handle the protest. It is 1126. I'm going to give the committee time to deal with that, so we will recess.
we uh, open with prayer, which I'm going to ask Elder Baron to do, uh, just two points. Uh, Elder Jeff Andriga left the meeting for pressing personal matters, and he discussed that with me before leaving, and I felt as though it was uh, necessary that he go attend to those personal matters, and so I told him that he could go. If I was wrong in that, then I stand to be rebuked, uh, and we'll, we'll take that. But that was in consultation with me as the chairman. And then secondly, Robert Vanderwall had to leave because he had to catch his plane flight. He changed it once already and needed to go catch that plane, so he will not be with us. And we are planning on proceeding with the work classes as we are currently constituted. I'd like to ask uh, Robert, or, sorry, Elder Baron to open. Shall we pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, with humility again we bow before thee, for thou art the God of our salvation. Thou art the one who hath determined all things from before the foundation of the world. And we stand in that knowledge and that assurance that thou art with us and that thou doest all things for the good of thy people. Now to save thy people to the uttermost. We thank thee, O Lord, for this time that we can have as a classist and as fellow saints in this denomination to deal with the matters that thou hast placed before us. And we pray that thou wilt rule these things, these matters, and these decisions according to thy will, and that thou wilt use us as but weak means to accomplish thy purpose. And we thank thee, O Lord, for thy wisdom, which thou hast given to thy church, and thy salvation, which thou hast given unto us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, our head, our office bearer, and we stand in that knowledge, and that is our comfort, Father, for we have no strength in ourselves. And we pray that all glory and honor might be to thy most holy name, and thou wilt gather thy church as thou hast determined. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Be with those who struggle and those who have distress. Comfort thy people as thou hast, and continue to be with us in the remainder of this meeting, that all the decisions that are made might be for the good of thy church, for thy sheep, and for the glory of thy name. All this we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, we return to the recommitted material, and we are on recommendation one that the class has declared the appeal to be legally before them. Uh, who's presenting? Go ahead. <coughs> recommendation one. The class has declared the appeal to be legally before them. Round A, Article 30 and 31 of the Church Order has been met. Recommendation 2, the class has not sustained the appeal of the clients. There is no disagreement between the clients and the first RPC on the doctrinal substance of the position paper. The clients say the principle of the position paper was correct. Agenda page 120. The client's contention against the consistory was that the position paper was a binding law upon the congregation and the application was hierarchical. Agenda page 120. When the principle of an issue is correct, the binding of the principle upon the congregation cannot be hierarchical, but rather Christ rule in the church through the office of elder by means of the application of the word. Round two. It is, called, it is the calling of the con consistory as watchmen on the wall of Zion to give warning to the congregation of dangers that they see as directed by the word of God. It is the calling of the consistory especially to give instruction to the congregation regarding the use of good Christian schools. Lord's Day 38, Church Order Article 21. Recommendation 3. Three that class is ruled that when the Council of First RPC received the charge of sin from the clients in their protest, <coughs> that before touring the protest, the Council should have required the clients first retract the charge of sin before the consistory dealt with the protest. We believe that the sin committed here is a sin of hierarchical on the part of the 
history and requiring which is that which is not scriptural. Agenda page 93. The believer has the right to protest when he shall believe himself aggrieved by a decision of the church assemblies. However, the spirit that must govern this protest is a spirit of love, brotherly respect, and respect of the office. <coughs> Making charges of sin against the consistory betrays a lack of those things and the protestants and hinders the consistory from educating the, the protest properly. Dealing with? The legality. Okay, thank you. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then recommendation two, do you move that with its grounds? So moved. All right, two is on the floor with its grounds. Discussion. No discussion. So I thought about this um, and heard good discussion about the, the idea of this. Um, and I question, my question is regarding the, the sentence, the spirit that must govern this protest is the spirit of love, brotherly respect, and respect for the office. And I, I'm not convinced or sure that if someone does charge that a sin has been committed, that those three things still couldn't apply. So when the clients bring a charge of sin, I don't believe that that means then that they have a spirit of hate or something other than love, anything other than brotherly respect or anything other than respect for the office. In fact, that could be love to charge sin. Now, does it have to go there? Circumstances can vary, but I'm not certain about that um, argument. Anybody on that recommendation three? Can I make a motion to amend? Sure. I would make a motion to amend the motion by alighting the words betrays a lack of these things in the protestant. Those words. Okay, so motion to be amend by alighting? Yes. Elide the words betrays a lack of these things in the protestant. All right, the motion is to amend by the lighting betrays the lack of these things in the Protestants. Support. All right, so the, the amendment is on the floor, just the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? Things in Protestants, end quote, be alighted, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Those words are elided. The motion, as once amended, is on the floor. And I make a suggestion that the word immediately be added at the beginning of A. Immediately. Was that not the issue that all of a sudden in the first letter you had a charge of sin? Go ahead, Reverend Lane. I don't mean to jump that discussion and could come back to it, but I am not sure about the statement. I'm not sure that what we just changed actually saves the statement. I'm not convinced that if someone makes charges of sin against the consistory immediately or otherwise, that that somehow hinders the consistory from adjudicating the protest properly. And the key word is adjudicating, that when a consistory gets a protest or it gets a charge, they sit as judges. That's their role. That's their role according to the scriptures. Um, and their role then is to judge, make judgments. And how do they make those judgments? They make those judgments from the word of God. Now, just because someone has a charge of sin against the consistory, that doesn't mean the word of God is unclear or that the consistory is hindered from judging the protest yet. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that um, what's listed there as A is correct. All right, anyone else? <clears throat> Discussion against the main motion or is it against specific statements? Do we? I'm against recommendation three um, because if we were to receive a document, any of us, that laid out how a member felt that we were doing something incorrectly, hierarchical or otherwise, if we get that, I can't imagine turning around saying, we'll treat this, but withdraw we'll that charge first. And their response is going to be, but I believe you've done that. And so then now we're distracted from the issue at hand. So I'm not sure three is helpful or even would accurately reflect how we would go about our business. All right. Any other? Uh, I see Cornerstone. I think it's Craig. Yeah, thank you. Um, when we were discussing this matter before the first time the committee brought it forward, um, it's my understanding that the district members from first said that that charge of sin represented that they were at an impasse. Uh, I'm not sure then what to do there. I would actually agree that if you've got charges of sin against you, and they can't be resolved, you're at an impasse, doesn't dealing with the protest first deal with the root issue and then see if that charge still stands? So wouldn't it make sense to say, well, withdraw that charge, let's deal with the issue. And if, if in our responding to your protest, your charge still stands, then your charge still stands. Should that not be a process that takes place in dealing with protests? All right. Further discussion? The issue at hand is recommendation three. Protests and charges of sin do not need to be um, entangled, and now I, I'm not saying it the right way. Church Order Article 31 gives a member the right to protest. Article 74 of the Church Order says if there is a public sin, you lay that before the consistory. 
And so on the very same issue, somebody could have a protest against a decision and a charge that it's sin. Hierarchy, false doctrine, whatever it may be. So I, I think first erred when we got the letter of August 22 on page 90. And our error was to treat that as a letter. I don't know that our error was to judge, though, the matter and to judge the charge. Those are two things that are on our desk that need to be judged. And so I can see instruction that would say, first response on page 94 of September 15 should not have been, we write in response to your letter, but we write in response to your protest and to your charge. But then this matter of that charge is still open. So if classes would pass this rule, or, or this uh, recommendation number four, um, that doesn't say, are the, the clients right in their charge against the consistory, or is the consistory right in its dismissal of those charges? It just says, back at the beginning, you should have done a different. So, this being here, I believe classis needs to rule, judge, are the clients right in their charge of hierarchy, or is the consistory right in its dismissal of the charge? Just have a procedural question. Does it, can a charge of sin come from the protest? So we're adjudicating a protest. We also have this charge of sin. Do you mingle those two? So 74 and 30 get mashed together. And you can bring charges of sin against your consistory via protest. Or is that a matter that has to be adjudicated at the consistent charge of sin? It's got to come here together. So all we're adjudicating is the protest. I'm just asking procedurally. What are we doing? And I think that very question brings up the spirit of this motion right here. The classes needs to decide what it's going to do. Are you ruling on a protest or are you ruling on a charge of sin or are you doing both? you're ruling on a charge of sin, that question has to be answered, can you do that? As to the matter of, is are the Kleins being supported with regards to the charge of hierarchy, or is the consistory being um, supported, or whatever word we would use there, you know, in the rejection of that charge? I believe that was taken care of in recommendation two. That when it states that it cannot be hierarchy to correctly apply the principle of an issue, that answers that charge. I'm satisfied with that. But I, I do believe that three is problematic at best because, again, that sentence, however, the spirit that must govern this protest is a spirit of love, brotherly respect, and, res and respect for the offense. So when a protest is received, a consistory could say, we judge that this protest doesn't exhibit respect for the office. Perhaps, but do we want to do that? I contend that we don't. So you're arguing to vote down three and leave it? Yes. Because two did everything you want to do? I believe that to be the case. All right. Any further discussion? If there 
there isn't, I'm going to call for the question. If you want to pass three, you vote first, yay. If you're opposed to three, you vote second, right? All in favor of three, say aye. Opposed, say aye. 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 Motion fails. All right, um, committee assigned to bring advice regarding agenda items. Recommendation one, regarding the position paper of first, ORPC. Cla that classes instructs the clerk to send an acknowledgement to First, first Orthodox Reformed Protestant Church, Bullet County, that we receive their letter. Ground, their letter requests no action on the part of classes. Recommendation two, regarding a sister church relationship with First Reformed Protestant Church Bulacan, that the Reformed Protestant Churches suspend pursuing a sister church relationship with First Reformed Protestant Church of Bulacan, adopt the proposed letter to FRPCB, and only resume pursuing a sister church relationship when classes is judged that the FRPCB and her office bearers stand upon the Reformed Confessions as authoritative for their faith and life. Grounds? In the course of the split between... Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. To, this is directly from the material and, and the agenda. Do you think it's necessary to read all of that? No, I was going to ask if we read the recommendation and okay. trust that the delegates have read through the letter and ask that that be we probably should have brought that as advice now that I think about yeah, it. Yeah, next time just do that. Um, okay, we can we agree on that by common consent that we're going to read the recommendation without reading all of the material. All right, go ahead then. Are you going to move that? I would like to move that. We you just read your recommendation. Okay. We just read the recommendation. All right, discussion. What is the, what is the motion? Recommendation two, yeah. with all of its grounds, yeah. which is just material from the agenda. And then the whole letter, you should have this all in time. Procedurally, in the recommendation, it says when classes had judged, how, what, did the committee have a recommendation for the mechanism for classes to take this matter up? Are you assuming that this is the continued work of the church relationship committee? 
I'm not on the committee of advice here, but on the committee for contact. And uh, the thinking there is that we are adopting now a letter to send to First Lucan, which means that they will be replying to this classes. And when the classes gets that letter, it can dispose of it all at once. All right, the recommendation is on the floor. Any further discussion on the recommendation with its grounds or the proposed letter? Nothing uh, for the call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And we move to recommendation E. 3 E. Um, 3 A we haven't dealt with. And I think it's just A. The classes received and approved the following finance committee reports for information, statement of financial position and profit and loss. Those were in the agenda. You move that? Yes. Great. Support. Thank you. Discussion? 3A. All in favor then say aye. 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 That classes not form a study committee to investigate the distribution of future subsidy aid. Ground to ensure that no unnecessary precedent is set that would bind a future decision of classes. So moved. Okay, the question is about the propriety of a motion not to do something. Oh. Yes. The committee felt that we should somehow address the recommendation that had been brought by the subcommittee. Okay. That makes sense. So there was. Can we include that as a point of information? If the, if the subcommittee brought a recommendation to form. That, that should, could be information under E. Yes. Yep. I think that would be helpful for future record. Okay. Can we add that by common consent? Just add one point of information. This came from the Classical, classical Finance system. Committee, yeah. Okay, the Classical Finance Committee recommended that a study committee be formed. Okay, so the recommendation E, 3E, with one point of information added, that the Classical Finance Committee recommended the formation of a study committee. Call for the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. 3F. That the classes votes to replace Mr. Matthew Medema, whose term expires in September, and to do so by receiving three names from the floor and voting among the three names. Ground. Mr. Medema's term expires in September. Are you saying that the Classical Finance Committee would have come with recommendations? Yeah. I just remember a few classes ago where we did it by names from the floor, but maybe that was our first meeting. And I think that was. And I'm wondering if this isn't a better motion that classes continue 
the term of office of Mapanema to January and instruct the finance committee to come to recommendations? I, I don't think you supported it. Good with that. We'll grant support. We'll withdraw their motion. Okay. All right, then we have a motion to the effect that classes extend the term of Mr. Max and on the Finance Committee until the January classes <coughs> and instruct the Classical Finance Committee to come with recommendations for replacement. Discussion on that motion? All in favor then say aye. 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 Motion carries and then G. But the classes approves the work of the finance committee. So moved. Support. All in favor say aye. 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 All the same sign. things right now, is it understood that we can uh, work these things among the ministers and churches that are on here as we need, uh, rather than try to write a new schedule right now? If, if there's a date that doesn't work and we need to make a switch or something. All right. Can we have that written motion? Uh, ministers and so what we've been doing so far is assigning a month rather than a specific day, and this and that allows that kind of freedom. Well, we're going to have the understanding that there is certain leeway in this schedule. Motions to adopt. Call for the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposing sign. Motion carries. Then we have the approval of the expenses for the meeting. While we're waiting on that, I just want to publicly thank the ladies of Second for the wonderful food that they gave us over these two days. It's always a nice part of classes that we get good food. Can't do the Lord's work on empty stomach. All right, are you ready? Yep. Ex motion to approve expenses in the amount of $1,510. Supported. Would this report supplemented that we'll send to the clerk? Great. Motion to approve the expenses of the classes in the amount stated. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. We need to discuss the date and place of the meeting. Mr. Chairman, yes. fir first would, li would like to invite classes on January 19, which is the third Thursday in January. First invitation first on January 19th to convene at 9, 9 a.m. Eastern. Okay. Right. Any is that supported by the way? Support. All right. Did any discussion on that? January 19th, is that a Thursday? It is. January 19th, Thursday 
that to convene at first RPC at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say sign. Motion carries. Did I miss anything on the agenda? All right, then we'll have the reading of the script then. Article 1, Reverend Langerak opens by reading Galatians 5 and prayer. Article 2, Reverend Langerak reads the credentials, supplement 1, and roll call reveals the following members present. First RPC, Reverend Landing, Elder Dewey Engelson, Elder Brian DeMere. Second RPC, Reverend Langerak, Elder Andy Burkett, Deacon Lee Wilkins. Sovereign RPC, Elder Jeff Andringa, Elder Daryl DeVries, Deacon Dylan Olsen. Sovereign RPC, second set of credentials for Deacon Dylan Olsen. Zion RPC, Elder Todd Ferguson, Elder Nick Milker, Deacon Clint Milker. Cornerstone RPC, Elder Jim Searsma, Elder Al Kicker, and Deacon Craig Ferguson. Edmonton RPC, Reverend Vanderwall, Elder Fred Tolzma, and Elder Ben Tolzma. Brian RPC, Elder Aaron Lynn, Elder Tian Long, Deacon Felix Chan. Article 3, motion is made to receive and approve the credentials with the exception of sovereign RPC. Motion carries. Article 4, by rotation, Reverend Langerak assumes the chair and declares that classes is now properly constituted. Article 5, all first-time delegates sign the formula of subscription. Article 6, motion is made to reappoint Lee Wilcher as clerk of the meeting. Motion carries. Article 7, motion is made to grant advisory vote to sovereign RPC's delegates as well as Jared Ramirez and James Chance for motion carries. Article 8, the matter of sovereign RPC's credential is treated. Article 9, motion is made to seat the three delegates from sovereign RPC and that classes upon sufficient grounds of suspicion subject Elder Daryl DeVries and Elder Jeff Andrega to a classical examination. Article 10, motion is made to divide the question into whether the whether to seek the three delegates from Sovereign RPC, and then secondly, whether to subject the elders, Gerald Priest and Jeff Andrea, to a classical examination, motion carries. Article 11, motion is made to seek the three delegates from Sovereign RPC, motion carries. Article 12, motion is made to table the matter of whether to give a classical examination to the elders, Gerald Priest and Jeff Andrea, until after the questions of Article 41 are answered, motion carries. Article 13, motion to approve the minutes of the May 13, 2022 minutes of classes. Supplement 2, motion carries. Article 14, the chairman asks the questions of Article 41 of the church order. Article 15, sovereign answers both yes and no of question 3 and 4 of Article 41. Deacon Dillon Altna dissents with the answer no. Article 16, motion to appoint a committee to investigate disagreement on questions 3 and 4 of Article 41 expressed by Sovereign RPC and to bring advice on the table motion in Article 12, motion carries. Article 17, classes recesses for committee work and lunch. Article 18, classes reconvenes and Reverend Langerak opens with prayer. Article 19, motion is made to grant advisory vote to Edmund Dyke, motion carries. Article 20, a report is received from the committee to investigate Sovereign RPC's delegates contradictory answers to questions 3 and 4 of Article 41 of the Church Order, Supplement 3. Article 21, motion is made that the classes conduct a classical examination of Elder Jeff Andringa and Elder Daryl DeVries and adopt the following questions to be asked. One, do you believe that the Good Christian School Institution is a requirement according to Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day 38? Two, what are your convictions about the authority of the Reformed Confessions as binding on the life of the believer? Article 22, motion is made to amend one of the recommendation to change, quote, the good Christian school institution, end quote, to, quote, the maintenance of the schools, end quote. Motion fails. 
Article 23, motion as originally moved is on the floor. Motion carries. Article 24, motion is made that class is declared the set of credentials from the deacon delegate to be out of order. Motion carries. Article 25, classical formula of subscription examination of Elder Daryl DeVries takes place. Elder DeVries answers yes to the first question. Upon further examination, he then qualifies this by saying that a home school is a good Christian school institution. Elder DeVries answers yes to the second question. Motion that Luke Boomers, Garrett Barner, and Tyler Alpoff be allowed to remain in all closed session items. Motion carries. 27, Article 27, closed session is declared. Article 28, open session is declared. Article 29, motion is made that Elder Daryl DeVries did not sustain the formula of subscription examination. Motion carries. Article 30, motion to advise Sovereign RPC to suspend Mr. Daryl DeVries from the Office of Elder in consultation with Second RPC. Ground Mr. DeVries did not sustain his examination. Motion carries. Article 31, classical form of subscription examination of Elder Jeff Andrea takes place. Elder Andrea answers yes to the first question. Elder Andrea answers yes to the second question. Article 32, motion is made that Elder Andrea sustain his formula of subscription examination. Motion carries. Article 33, a committee of Reverend Lanning, Nick Milker, and Lee Wilter are appointed to bring advice regarding the overture from Edmonton on Article 21, Supplement 4. Article 34, a committee of Reverend Vanderwall, Clint Milker, and Andy Bouquet are appointed to bring advice regarding the appeal of Phil Brain in Supplement 5. Article 35, a committee of Jim Sears, Al Kicker, and Dylan Altna are appointed to bring advice regarding the appeal of Cornelis and Rebecca Klein, Supplement 6. Article 36, a committee of Dewey Engelsma, Ben Tulsa, and Todd Ferguson are appointed to bring advice regarding the Finance Committee report, the Sister Church Relationship Committee report, and the position paper of First Orthodox Reformed Protestant Church of Bulletin, Supplement 7. Article 37, a committee of Lee Wiltshire, Ben Tolzma, and Todd Ferguson are appointed to bring advice regarding the protest of Sarah Dusen with Supplement 8. Article 38, classes, recesses for committee work and dinner. Article 39, classes reconvened and Reverend Lanny opens with prayer. Article 40, it is noted that Jeff Andrew has left the meeting to attend to personal matters. Article 41, chairman declares closed session. Skipping down to Article 46, chairman declares open session. Article 47, motion to adopt the recommendation of Sovereign RPC to organize Loveland Reform Protestant Fellowship with the three grounds from Sovereign's letter, Supplement 11, and also the five grounds from the letter from Loveland RP Fellowship, Supplement 12, motion carries. Article 48, motion to appoint second RPC to formally take the oversight on behalf of classes of the Reform Protestant Wisconsin Fellowship, Supplement 13, motion carries. Article 49, report is received for the committee regarding Church Order Article 21, Overture Supplement 14. Motion that the classes declare the overture from First RPC of Edmonton to be legally before it. Ground the requirements of Article 30 and Article 86 of the Church Order have been satisfied. Motion carries. B, motion that classes not sustain the overture. Grounds A, B, and C of the supplement. Motion carries. Article 50, report is received from the committee to bring advice regarding the appeal of Philip Rainey, Supplement 15. Motion to recommend to classes that, it, that the appeal is legally before it. Ground Article 30 and 31 of the church order have been met. Motion carries. Motion that classes declare that the Protestant is not being charged with the sin of legalism by the consistory of First Reformed Protestant Church. Motion fails. Motion that classes does not sustain Philip Rainey's appeal. On the ground, the consistory of First RPC has comprehensively addressed and answered all the contentions that Philip has expressed. Motion to recommit for reformulation. Motion carries. Article 51. A report is received from the committee to bring advice regarding the appeal of William and Sarah Courtney, Supplement 16. Motion to recommend to classes that the appeal is legally here. Ground Article 30 and 31 of the Church Order have been met. Motion carries. Motion to recommend that classes declare that the Protestant Protestant is not being 
charged with the sin of legalism by the consistory of first RPC motion declared out of order. Motion to recommend that class has not sustained the, pro the protest of Wayne and Sarah Courtney. Uh, supplement 10 ground 1 through 4. Motion carries. Article 52. Report is received from the committee to bring advice regarding the protest of Sarah Duzan. Supplement 17. Motion to recommend to classes that the appeal is legally here. Ground Article 30 and 31 of Church Order have been met. Motion carries. Motion to recommend that classes reject the protest of Sarah Duzema. Ground, she brings no new arguments to show or prove that the decision of classes is contrary to the scripture of the creeds. Motion to recommit for formulation. Motion carries. Article 53, Chairman brings classes to a close for the day, announces that we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.45 a.m. and closes in prayer. You don't like that one? <laughs> Article 54, classes reconvenes and Reverend Langerich opens with singing Psalm 262, reading Psalm 98 and prayer. Article 55, it is noted that Elder Jeff Andrew is absent with notice from the meeting. Article 56, report received from the committee regard, recommitted, the, com the committee recommitted regarding Phil Rainey and Wayne and Sarah Courtney appeals, supplement 18. Motion that class is not sustained Philip Green's appeal and that class is adopt the material from the first RPC as its own. Motion carries. Article 57, report received from the committee recommitted regarding the protest of Sarah Duzema. Supplement 19. Motion that class is not sustained Ms. Sarah Duzema's protest grounds. Brown, supplement 12A and B. Motion carries. Article 58, report is received from the committee to treat the appeal of Cornelis and Rebecca Klein's Supplement 20. Motion that classes declare the appeal not legally before them. Ground Supplement 13, 1 and 2. Motion fails. Motion to recommit for reformulation. Motion carries. Article 59, classes recesses for committee work and lunch. Article 60, classes reconvenes and held and barren opens with prayer. Article 61, Report is received from the committee that has been recommitted regarding the appeal of Cornelis and Rebecca Klein, Supplement 21. Motion that the class has declared the appeal to be legally before them. Article 30 and 31 of the church order has been met. Motion carries. Motion that the class has not sustained the appeal of the clients. Ground A and B. Motion carries. Motion that class has rules that when the count so the Council of First RPC received the charge of sin from the clients in their first protest, that before treating the protest, the Council should have dealt with the protest. Quote, we believe that the sin committed here is the sin of hierarchy on the part of our consistory in requiring that which is not scriptural, end quote. Agenda page 93, the believer has the right to protest when he shall believe himself agreed by the decision of the church assemblies. However, the spirit that must govern this protest is a spirit of love brotherly respect and respect for the office, making charges of sin against the consistory betrays a lack of these things in the Protestants and hinders the consistory from adjudicating the protest properly. Motion to amend by a writing, quote, betrays a lack of these things in the Protestants, end quote. Motion carries. Motion as amended is now on the floor. Motion fails. Article 62, report from the Committee for Finances, Sister Church Relationship, and the letter of FOR PCB, Supplement 22. Motion that classes instructs the clerk to send an acknowledgement to first that we have received their letter on the one ground listed in the report. Motion carries. Motion to approve recommendation 2 on grounds A and B. Motion carries. Motion to approve recommendation 3A. On ground one, motion carries. Motion to approve recommendation 3E on ground one. The Classical Finance Committee recommends that a study committee be formed. Motion carries. Motion to extend the term of Matt Medema on the Classical Finance Committee until January and instruct the committee to come with recommendations for a new member. Motion carries. Motion to approve recommendation 3G. Motion carries. Article 63, report received from the Pulpit Supply Committee, Supplement 23. Motion to adopt the schedule, motion carries. Article 64, motion to approve the ex expenses of classes, Supplement 24, motion carries. Article 65, motion to accept the invitation from First RPC to host classes on January 19, 2023 at 9 a.m. 
Eastern Standard Time motion carries. All right, we have the reading of the script minutes. There is one matter that was best in the agenda with my oversight. Uh, it was the matter of the Minister Training Committee. And we have a motion to approve the work of the Minister Training Committee as presented in the agenda, page 40 and 41. So moved. So moved. Any discussion on that? That included a number of items of note. One is that Luke was licensed to preach. The second is that Luke was approved examined at the January classes, um, and there was some other more minor matters for the back of that report. Do you have those? Yep, so the um, students for the year in the seminary will be Luke Boomers, Tyler Opoff, Garrett Varner, uh, Earl Camps. Camps, and then the teachers will be Reverend Langerak, Reverend Vanderwall, and then also note is that we suspended training of the Philippine students officially because of the, the difficulties that were there in the Philippines. All right, motion to approve the work of the Minister of Training Committee presented in the agenda page 4041. Is that moved? It's been moved in support of Dewey. Just to, about the Philippines, that the instructors are allowed to include Philippine students as auditors at their discretion. made to appoint second RPC to formally take the oversight on behalf of classes of the Reform Protestant Wisconsin Fellowship. Something that on behalf of classes was in the motion. You, you said that I could take it out of there if you want to. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You suggested it. Mm -hmm. Classes doesn't have okay. the oversight. It just consisted to okay. classes oh. regularly. Is that on the floor? That well, motion to approve, so we can talk about that articles or? Yeah, no. Go ahead. Article. Article. Well, so moved. Supported. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Article twenty nine. I think that was where we went to closed session and then immediately came out of closed session. Forty. Twenty nine. I thought. Twenty seven and twenty eight. Okay. My only concern there is that it might appear that there was matters dealt with in closed session. There wasn't. It was. We went into closed session, we discussed it, decided that it didn't need to be closed session. I'm afraid that in the future, if somebody looks back on that, they might think that business was transact transacted during that time. That really should just be divided. Okay. There was another closed session in there, too. That was when we treated the matter of first discipline and finances in the Philippines. Yeah, that one was. Yes, was there a note regarding Reverend Vanderwall's departure? No. Nope. There will be now. Can he reread Article 14? The chairman asked the questions of Article 41 of the church order. 
and then right after that it's noted about the different answers from Sovereign. I was thinking that too, maybe there needs to be something in there about how everyone answered. Everyone answered yes. I thought or, so, yeah. The churches. How do you say that? The churches, the churches of second all answered yes, or satisfactorily answered Churches of satisfactory answer the question. The Church of Sovereign, there was a dispute in the answer of the question of disagreement. Is that satisfied if you put it that way? Questions of 41 are satisfactorily answered? With the exception of, With the exception of Sovereign, where there was a disagreement on questions 3 and 4.
binding authority for creeds. It must be done. So that those in creeds settle the issues in the churches. For the good of the church, the flourishing of the gospel. Almighty God and merciful Father, we come to the close of this weighty meeting. We know that thy church is the center of history. So time and space and earthly movements all center around the proceedings of the church. And the spiritual forces that are unseen but present wage war that the kingdom of Jesus Christ, as it always does, emerge victorious. The advance of the gospel, the glory of thy name, the honor, the exaltation of thy Son Jesus Christ, whom we confess as the Lord, the King, the Husband, the Cornerstone. Chief prophet, bishop, high priest, and apostle of the church. We submit ourselves to him. We bow the knee to him, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We do so that we submit to our hurt, sometimes to our shame, Always to our salvation. The word of Jesus Christ, in the gospel, and in his government of the church. We pray, Lord, bless the decisions of the classes. Speed them to the hearts of thy people. For bless they take root as the word of God in the heart of thy people. And they cannot profit. Yes, Lord, thou wilt also pardon our sin. Graciously blotting out our iniquity, imputing to us the righteousness of our Lord, and blessing our fellowship here too together in thy spirit. Yes, Lord, thou wilt also send us away with thy blessing. Turn us home to our families, and our congregations, and our schools. We ask, Lord, that they gather again at thy appointed time, once again, to take up the work of the churches in common. Hear us, Father, in mercy. We ask all these things for Jesus' sake.